Let's do it. <clears throat> Pressing blue light now. Right, let me go to the corner because I'm going to mask up. Right. Hey, hey guys. Over to you. Right, thanks. Hey Peter. Hey guys. So finally we got a Zoom link. Shall we wait for everyone? Hey, Robert. To Chris, welcome. Antonio, Hi. welcome. Hello, hello. Hey Robert, ciao. Patrick, will you join please? You can hang up the phone, can you join? I guess just you sent it in. Yes, just recently. Okay. So um, we are welcome for everyone here for the workshop. It, it finally happened. Later we'll hook up here for the screen. Um, so we're really glad that it's finally happened. Welcome everyone and we can start. So we start from the European presenters because of the time difference. And first, who is first about to start? Is, one second. It should be myself. Right, so, so, so should, should be you, Antonio. <clears throat> okay. Um, right, but hey, hey, would you introduce it, please? Maybe you have some words of introduction. Uh, well, since we have already lost a lot of time, uh, I guess uh, you don't mind we, we skip the, the, all the introductions. Uh, first, Great. welcome everyone to this uh, workshop. We have been doing this for several years at the AGI conference uh, to report uh, the progress uh, of the NARS project as well as to listen to our cooperators and uh, about their related work. Uh, sorry for the delay, and we will try to catch up. Uh, so, Peter, you will just write and with a very brief introduction to who is coming from where. I think that will be enough. Uh, then, right. uh, also, we will have a tutorial for people who never heard about this project. We will talk about that right. uh, in the second session. Right. Let yeah, me just... Peter, is, is yours. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, first, um, uh, okay. First, um, we will start basically with an. Um, well, let me share the screen. Hello. Let me share the screen. Hey, Patrick. Hello. Hello, Patrick. Hello. <laughs> so that's the schedule for the first half of the tour. For the first half, so we will start with Antonio Cello with inner speech for AGI speech or presentation followed by the Johansson from Sweden, Robert Johansson. He's a professor of psychology in Stockholm University. Then the Christian Thurston will present his presentation from the Reykjavik called Iceland. Then we will follow by the US team from the Hugo and Oscon, they're guys from Cisco's. And we will conclude the session with the Thomas Lou, uh, the project we've done with NASA. Um, then we'll have a lunch break and finally, the real workshop tutorial and demonstration will start. So um, at 1.30, roughly, maybe 2 o'clock now, so I will do the tutorial of NARS. Then I will do the open NARS uh, uh, implementation overview. Then Patrick will do his open NARS implementation for application. And then we will have some demo demonstration. So we will close it with another student by Pei, which is Christian Han. He, he is a PhD student. He will present another implementation of NARS or his other works, what he's doing. And then we will have a general discussion at the end when all are welcome to really uh, ask any questions or participate. Shall we start? Yes, of course. All right, Antonio. Okay, so I, I, I will share my screen. Yes, I'll stop it. Okay. Please. Okay. Okay, um, uh, so can you see my screen now? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we um, can. Okay, so uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am Antonio Cairo from the Department of Engineering of the University of Palermo. And today I will briefly talk about inner speech for AGI. I, I apologize for the people who are um, following, uh, attending the um, 
the uh, TRIPS tutorials, the TRIPS uh, uh, series of seminars, because uh, my presentation is, a, is, an, is a, an abridged version, is a shorter version of my, of my talk that I had recently. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so uh, my, uh, my talk is concerned inner speech, concerned the, the, utility, we, the utility of inner speech for AGI. Um, uh, this is um, a, a work that I, uh, I carried out together with my team, with Valeria Sedita, Antonella D'Amico, Arianna Pipitone, and Alessandro Geraci. There are people uh, coming from the uh, psychological, with uh, people from psycho psychological background and people from uh, a robotics background. So it is a mixed, it is a mixed team. Anyway. Uh, very briefly, I have to say that uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, topic uh, received the great attention from the media. So I've been interviewed by uh, the Guardian, Science Daily, Mail Online, uh, New Scientist, and whatever. So it has been uh, that there has been some some interest in the media uh, of uh, uh, related to this uh, to this uh, project. So the idea why inner speech for robot. Um, we know the, from the psychological literature that uh, inner speech uh, may be linked to self-consciousness, at least uh, um, according to Alan Morin in a famous paper, uh, he proposed this, uh, this, this, this tight link between self-consciousness and inner speech. And moreover, inner speech is uh, related to attention and self-attention. Inner speech comes to play an uh, important role for planning and for self-regulation, and it is related to, in general, it is related to high-level cognition. So um, we think that uh, um, um, essentially our uh, idea is that inner speech, uh, if we were able to hear the inner speech of a robot, then the operations of a robot would be more transparent to the humans, more transparent to the user. And uh, um, because, of course, we, we would be able to, uh, to hear what the robot is thinking in some sense. So it would be more natural for, for, a, normal, for a normal people to understand what the robot wants to do and so on and so forth. So it is clear that people, that expert people could look at the log of the robot or could look at the, at the code of the robot, while normal people interacting with a robot, for normal people interacting for, with a robot, will be more natural to uh, hear what the robot is doing by the robot itself. Um, there are, uh, in the psychological literature, there are models of inner speech, uh, as, a, as, I previously, as I previously mentioned, uh, uh, Alan Morin proposed the, the link to self-consciousness, but even badly in these uh, um, in these seminal works on uh, uh, the working memory, um, questioned about inner speech as a component of the phonological loop of the working memory. So, in the sense that we can uh, we can retain in the working memory inner speech. There is the classical work by Vygotsky, according to which inner very briefly Vygotsky wrote a long book on this topic. Anyway, according to Vygotsky, inner speech may be the result of, the develop, of a develop, developmental internalization process in the sense that inner speech is the internalization of the, um, of the direction of the suggestion from our caregivers. So the child receive, uh, receive a suggestion, receive instruction from the caregivers, from the mother, from the father, and then doing complex tasks, uh, typically the child repeats louder the, uh, the, the instruction that he, that he or she received. So, so um, copied the, the instruction received. Uh, this, uh, um, uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, rep repetition uh, is uh, uh, during the during the development of the child is internalized. So, in some sense, uh, inner speech is inter is the internalization of the uh, of the uh, the direction of the instruction that we received from our parents, from our caregivers. And there are many other many other many other uh, possibility many other theories of inner speech. Alan Morin 
um, as I previously as I previously mentioned, uh, consider it, consider some trigger of inner speech. Uh, a trigger for inner speech came from the social world. So if I hear uh, people talking to uh, talking about myself, talking about me, if I hear my my name, then I can start to uh, I can start with some sort of inner speech. Or if I look at myself in the mirror, for example, I can start some inner speech. So uh, trigger for inner speech may be social word, may be uh, some external physical, uh, external physical stimuli and so on. Um, there are, um, or if I read something or whatever. So there may be a several trigger for, uh, several trigger for inner speech. And, uh, um, so we take seriously the uh, we, we consider initially we initially considering the um, a, a version of the um, of the working memory proposed by Alan Badley. Consider we we consider the phonological loop of Alan Badley, which is made up by the articular articulatory um, control system and the, the phonological store in a phonological loop. Um, uh, according to Badri, there is the central executive that control the phonological loop, the episodic buffer, and the uh, visual spatial sketch pad. Um, and so inner speech is related more or less to this uh, phonological loop. Taking into account this, uh, um, uh, this uh, phonological loop from Alan Badley, we proposed a, a cognitive architecture for inner speech. In the cognitive architecture, there are the procedural memory, there is the procedural memory, there is the declarative memory, there is a central executive mapping the uh, proposal by Alan Badley, there is the phonological loop, the phonological store, and so on. So in a sense, this, uh, um, the, our cognitive architecture um, is inspired to the, uh, to the work by Alan Badley. Uh, starting from this architecture, in order to uh, rapid prototype this architecture, we implemented on top of Actar. Um, essentially, there is nothing, uh, nothing um, mysterious in Actar. We use it as a cognitive, as an existing cognitive architecture, and then we downloaded the code and we implemented it on Actar. But of course, there could be other uh, ways to implement this uh, to implement this architecture. Um, Okay, so uh, just to give you a flavor of uh, um, the operation of the architecture, let us consider, for example, the fact that uh, there is an apple and then the perceptual model layer recognizes the apple and it generates the label apple, the label green, and um, the, the, the perceptual motor layer is related, is, uh, is um, uh, connected to the phonological store. So in the phonological store, it's like the, uh, the robot here, the word apple, here the word green, and then it starts the phonological loop. So um, there is a working memory, there is a working memory which is uh, stored in the, the procedural, in, in the declarative memory. And then in, the, in this memory, the apple is a fruit, but even, um, and then uh, the, the, uh, the robot generated the phrase, apple is a fruit, and then he, the robot hear the phrase, apple is a fruit, but in, in the working, in the um, in declarative memory, uh, fruit is also an orange. So uh, the robot generate um, apple, green, fruit, orange, and it also generate the phrase orange is a fruit. So generating the phrases orange is a fruit is uh, similar for the robot to hearing the phrase orange is a fruit is the same for the robot to looking at an orange. So the robot start looking for an orange. In this way, um, this is what we um, call the elaborative rehearsal. So the elaborative rehearsal is the, this sort of rehearsal where the inner speech start by considering some uh, some uh, um, some stimulus, some stimuli from the outside. Then the elaborative rehearsal starts uh, according to the phonological loop. Phrases are generated. 
the generation of the phrases made the robot to hear the phrases generated by itself in the phonological loop. So the robot perform generate phrases during its operation of uh, uh, during its operation of association of uh, looking for association in the declarative memory. Then we implemented this architecture in a, on, a, on a pepper robot. Uh, I don't enter now into the detail. There is a motor that we employed the ROS, the robot operating system. And so there is a motor, a motor part, a perception part, a memory, and uh, the, 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 um, the inner speech then is generated as a part of the perception and memory uh, implementation in, in the paper robot. And uh, then we uh, looked for, we made some empirical experiments. So in um, uh, the typical application of, a typical application of inner speech is of course the transparency. In the sense, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, because the robot tar talks about its inner reasoning process, then the interaction would be uh, would be more transparent. And then um, we think that inner speech. We we tested the fact that inner speech may improve human robot interaction because uh, by inner speech, fact and information are retrieved from the knowledge base. And uh, uh, the partner, the user, uh, is uh, uh, is focused on the problem on the problem of the robot. So there, in this case, uh, the the user may also help may also help the robot. For example, it's more easy for the for the user for the partner help the robot because uh, the robot uh, because the human sorry. The human might by follow might be more um, aware of the uh, processes of the line processes of the of the robot. So um, I will show you some brief. Okay, I will show you some brief movie. Human and robot collaborate to set a table. Human requires to robot to provide him utensils. The goal of this demo is to show the differences in human robot interaction when the robot talks and does not talk to itself. In the first part of experimental session, the robot does not dialogue with itself. The human requires to it to pick the knife. Okay, I'm picking up the glass. Pepper, can you pick up the knife, please? The typical robot's routines run and the knife is provided to the partner. Alexander, here is the knife. Thank you, Pepper. In the second part of experimental session, the robot inner speech starts. The human requires the same okay, object. Can you pick up the knife, please? Inner speech is triggered by the knowledge of a property of the knife. The robot retrieves from its knowledge base that the knife is dangerous and sharp. And, and you know that the knife is dangerous. I'm afraid I will hurt myself. I'm a robot. It can harm me. But the knife may come to be guilty of the human. Do you know you may come to stop? Right? The robot exposes its concerns to human. By hearing the robot inner voice, the human knows in advance what the robot will tell him. The robot and dialogue enable both human and robot to focus attention on a possible problem, and the human trust could grow. Thanks for your attention. Okay. In this uh, um, in this movie. Sorry. Oh, so in this movie, um, this movie shows the main ideas, uh, the main ideas of inner speech. So in the science, uh, the, the, the user is more able to, um, to be aware of the, of the line of thinking, of the line of thinking of the robot. And uh, um, uh, the, the, the problem that we consider is to set up a table, it is a collaborative problem between the user and the, and the, and the robot. 
But it, it is a very simple task. However, um, it is interesting because there, are, there could be some conflict. So a, a typical, one of the typical triggers of, uh, uh, of inner speech is a conflict resolution. So there could be uh, when there is a, a dilemma, even an ethical dilemma. Of course, in setting up the table, uh, there could be very simple dilemma. So there, um, uh, the typical dilemma is when the uh, human asks the robot to break some rule according to the standard etiquette for uh, setting up a table. So, for example, if I ask the robot to put the knife in a position which is not the one which is uh, uh, considered by the, uh, by, the, uh, by the standard etiquette, then there is some kind of very simple conflict. And the robot may start its, its inner speech in order to solve the dilemma. And the, the interesting thing is that the user became aware of the robot dilemma. It became aware of the dilemma of the robot. This is an example. Human and robot are setting the table. Human gives to robot instructions for placing the utensils on the table. The table has to be set according to the etiquette rules. Both human and robot know that the schema to follow for placing utensils on the table is the informal schema. At the start of the interaction, some utensils are already placed on the table. The robot knows the context. Human will require to the robot to place an utensil on a wrong location according to the etiquette schema. Robot detects the conflict situation and it has to solve it in some way. The goal of this demo is to show how inner speech solves a conflict. In this case, the robot preferred to contravene the rule for fulfilling human's wishes. However, human knows the conflict of the robot by hearing its inner voice, and he knows that the robot solved the conflict by preferring the human needs. As a result, the human's trust for robot could grow. Thanks for your attention. Okay, this is a very simple, this is a very simple pro a very simple problem for a robot, of course. Uh, but you can see, even in this simple case, that the robot is able to reason about this, uh, about the, this problem, about this uh, dilemma, and the user is aware of this, uh, is aware of this dilemma. Then, um, after this impl the implementation of this architecture in, um, on a paper, we started some, some uh, more extended experiments. The experiment, we performed the experiment of setting up the table by considering as an interface uh, the, the, a tablet. Uh, on, on the tablet, there is, um, there is an app. Uh, the, the user is able to set up the table by moving object on the tablet, and both the robot and, and both the robot and the user are able to interact with the, ta with the tablet. Then the user may give some uh, hint, may give some uh, may give some suggestion to the robot and so on. So, for example, the user may ask uh, to uh, the robot to infringe the etiquette, or and uh, the, the user, the partner, may drag and drop utensils on incorrect end location. Uh, the partner could make the wrong request to the robot and so on. 
Um, uh, uh, first, we measured the, the capabilities of the robot uh, uh, with inner speech, considering inner speech itself. So, um, so, for example, we measured how many times the robot is able to reach a goal, which is a measure of the uh, robustness of the of the uh, of the implementation. In general, um, the use the, the the robot is more able to reach the, uh, the, the final goal because um, uh, thanks to inner speech the user is more the user is more able to understand what the robot is doing and then it is more able for example to help the robot so um, uh, the robot ach achieve a, a good success rate because uh, of the help of because it is because for the user is more is more easy to help the robot in some sense then we made some uh, uh, some um, some measure considering the threshold time for example um, uh, when the robot reach a decision, if the robot uh, reach a decision within a threshold time, or uh, decides to take the action, decide not to take the action, and so on. Um, of course, the, the the robot is more transparent because the decision process are more traceable because uh, uh, is a, the user uh, is able to, to 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 is able to better understand what the robot is doing. Uh, so in general, as I previously mentioned, the robot with inner speech is more is more able to reach the final goals because it's more able for the because in case of troubles, because in case of, of the robot stuck, for example, because uh, stopped because of some problem, then the user is more able to help is more able to help the robot. Of course, uh, I understand that there are situations where uh, inner speech could be annoying, for example, if in the case, for example, when a robot has to uh, perform a task in a fixed time, then the, the, this inner speech matter could be a waste of a useless waste of time, for example. So inner speech is more useful when there is a sort of collaboration between humans and the robot, and there is no tight time constraints, of course. Okay. Um, then we uh, performed some, so uh, so we performed some experiments of a human-robot interaction by considering uh, the robot aimed with inner speech and with outer speech. The inner speech is typically uh, more uh, informal. It is it more uh, concern personal statements, personal judgment, comments. It is composed of medium short sentences and so on. While the outer speech of the robot is more, uh, I can say, is more robotic in some sense. So it is more uh, based on formal language. It is it deliver it delivers objective feedback. It is composed by short sentences and so. On. So inner speech is more informal, is more human-like in some sense. While I, outer speech is more is more robotic. So in general, people are normally able. To understand when the robot is looking to is uh, talking to itself, and when the robot is talking is uh, is is giving some objective feedback. Then we recruited participant, um, and typically uh, we administer questionnaires. There, there 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 has been a questionnaire which has been administered before doing the interaction. Then there is the interaction. And then there is a second administering of, uh, of questionnaires. So typically, between the first questionnaire and the interaction, there are more or less uh, 15 days. So uh, when the people um, fill the second uh, site of questionnaire, typically they don't remember what they what they wrote in the in the first site of questionnaire. So we wanted we wanted to measure how. Uh, the, the perception of the robot changes before or after the uh, interaction with the robot aimed with aimed with inner speech. Um, very briefly, the materials that we employed in the pretest session are the uh, the trust perception scale, the gold spade scale, which is a very well known questionnaire employed in many. Uh, human robot interaction studies and the self talk scale which is a questionnaire 
uh, that measure um, how the people use inner speech during their life, uh, during these days. While the post-test section, we ask the people to uh, refill, uh, to fill again the trust perception scale and the gospel scale. Just to give you an idea, this is the trust perception scale. Um, uh, we ask people uh, um, uh, what part of the time the robot could be friendly, would be pleasant, would be autonomous, would be responsible, and so on. So, so it is a question that investigates the human perception of trust in robot. The Godspeed scale is a very well known, is a very well known scale that assesses the perception and impression of the robot. So in terms of anthropomorphism, animacy, like liability, perceived intelligence and perceived safety. While the self talk scale is a scale that measures the frequency of self talk in everyday life. So typical questions are, I am really, I talk to myself when I'm really happy or when something bad happened to me and so on. Um, considering data analysis, so far we perform an experiment with us an experimental group of 40 people, which is not so, which is not so big, uh, not so big group, but we consider the fact that uh, uh, we had a strong COVID restriction and then only very recently people uh, were able to come to our laboratory because of the restriction to the University of Palermo and so on. Um, uh, okay. Uh, the result that we obtained so far are the normally the trust perception, the perception of trust before and after the test uh, grows uh, is significantly higher. So it seems that the mean score of trust is higher in the post test compared to the pre test. So it seems that the people um, trust more the robot after the interaction with inner speech. And considering the Godspeed questionnaire, we can see that the normally, in terms of anthropomorphism or animacy or likability or perceived intelligence, there is, um, there is um, typically they, they are seeing the, these items are higher in the post test comparing to the pre test. We can see that the perceived safety is more or less the same. Um, According to our psychologists, um, the, the, uh, they say that uh, this task, uh, the task of setting up the table, is not, uh, the, there are no dangerous in the, it is not a dangerous uh, uh, task, of course. So there is no perception of changing of safety uh, because uh, it, is a, it is a very normal daily, it is a very normal daily task. So there is no safety, there is no changing in the perception of safety in a robot. So I don't see that, I don't think that the robot uh, is more, um, there, is, there is more safety in a robot because we are setting, setting up a table. And we also considering the hypothesis, if the, the, there is some relationship between the employment of inner speech in daily life of the, of the participant with respect to the, uh, with respect to the perception of trust. According to our experiment, there is no uh, real uh, relationship between the use of everyday life in, uh, of inner speech and the perception of trust. So in a sense that um, people trust more the robot with inner speech, irrespective of the fact that they employ, that the people employ or not inner speech during their own life. Okay, so uh, in uh, our analysis is, is very promising because it seems to be that um, there is a growth of, of trust in a robot with inner speech in, all, in, uh, in um, almost all the features of the typical feature of the typical features of the robot. Of course, we need more, uh, or our group is not a big group of people, we have 40 people, we need uh, to consider more people. Um, this this uh, short movie will show you some uh, some parts of the uh, of the uh, experimental session.
The experimental sessions carried out at the Robotics Lab, University of Palermo, involved 30 participants at the first stage. The main clusters of participants' behavior were identified when collaborating with robot which talks to itself. The first cluster regards participants with balanced behavior. In this case, the participants look and listen to the robot moderately, do not always follow the robot's suggestions, and give instructions to the robot in some cases. The second cluster regards participants with collaborative behavior. In this case, the participant often looks a robot and gives feedback when the robot talks. Moreover, the participant follows the robot's suggestions and the interaction results very collaborative. The third cluster regards participants with autonomous behavior. The participants look and listen to the robot a few times, and they prefer to take the task autonomously, without involving the robot. Okay, um, to conclude my presentation, I will show you an application of inner speech in a typical problem, which is the self-recognition of a robot in a mirror. So this is a very, uh, this is a typical problem. There are many people that uh, um, approaches this approach the, 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 the problem of self-recognition of a robot, we employed essentially uh, the same architecture for inner speech. And there is a tight relationship between the self-recognition of a robot, the self-recognition in a mirror, or even a lot more in a study, this, uh, the, this sort of relationship. So we employed the same architecture in order to allow the robot to, to self-recognize itself.
to move the right arm under the position of my mouth and moving my own. I'm seeing my arm in front of the mask in the mirror. The mask I'm seeing is mine. I am a mask. So, people think I'm robots, and I know I'm a robot with a mask. It's the robot I'm seeing in the mirror. This robot is me. There are not very real robots here. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay, so you can see uh, from this short video that, that, that there is a reasoning process uh, for the robot to uh, recognize it, to recognize itself, and uh, uh, these uh, uh, this self recognition process allow the robot to recognize itself. Okay, my time is uh, my time is almost over. So thank you for your attention. If there are any questions. We have a question from the AGI conference. Yeah. I am person. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering about the, the thresholding on time. And and what was the decision in that? Because I was wondering, is this room? Is this this robot get caught ruminating um, when it's talking to itself? How does it break that loop if you don't put a threshold? Yeah, actually, the robot is 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 not ruminated. The robot is performing some sort of um, of. Uh, um, association between concept in order for example to search object in uh, on a table or uh, to um, set up the table or to set up uh, to set up the table and so on and uh, these uh, um, um, so this association between objects and between uh, um, and between uh, uh, concepts essentially it is a um, it is a, the, the 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 reasoning process of of actar so there are it is essentially a rule based system allow the robot to generate this sort of inner speech and then the robot hear the its own voice and it is a sort of i can say it is a sort of focus of attention in a sense that there are many hypotheses many possible rule that rules that that could could fire then uh, one rule emerge among the other one, uh, the robot generate inner speech, and then this inner speech is a sort of uh, um, uh, re-entrant re -entrant loop in the, in the robot itself. So it is a, the, 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 role of, uh, the role of inner speech is a sort of, uh, of a focus of attention, while ruminating typically in inner speech, the rumination is a sort of loop uh, uh, an infinite loop with no sense, in a sense. So, uh, rumination for people studying inner speech is a sort of when when I repeat several times the same the same thing without any real without any real motivation. While the robot has some sort of motivation because it is uh, the role of inner speech is more related to attention. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, if I think if there are no other questions, I think we, that we can move to the other to the other speaker. Uh, I have uh, one question. No, please. Um, uh, currently, uh, you're you're using the the ACT -R, uh, model, uh, where you're also considering using other cognitive architectures or even HAI systems uh, for this. Yeah, app. the ACT -R is not. Uh, it is uh, um, an implementation choice. 
uh, but uh, because we have some uh, we had some uh, experience in actar but it is not uh, a mandatory a mandatory uh, architecture so we can translate we can use any other any other architecture so we are we, we plan to 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 implement this architecture by using nars for example so uh, there are some uh, phd students that are starting this uh, that are starting this uh, uh, the, the, the sort of let's let's say not translation but to avoid uh, uh, actar and use nar so there is nothing that allows us uh, that constrain us to use uh, to use actar of course oh yes sir thank you you're welcome Okay, shall I continue, Peter? Sure, sure, yes, please. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Antonio. Uh, and I share my screen. Uh, can you see my presentation now? Yeah, we can see. We can great, see. thank you. Uh, okay, uh, so my name is Robert Johansson. I'm from Stockholm University in Sweden, and uh, I will describe some of the experiments we have been using uh, NARS to conduct uh, from the perspective of behavioral psychology. And uh, the title of the presentation is AGI as Generalized Relational Operant Behavior. Uh, and the purpose of the talk is to really go through these words. And we have been using the open OpenRs for applications by Patrick Hammer and Tony Lofthaus to carry out this. Uh, and actually, there is a, a, a branch uh, on GitHub uh, it's called the MSC2 branch that doesn't have the semantic inference part of the uh, ONA. Uh, so uh, the, the experiments that I, that I will describe is kind of the animal approach to AGI. And, and this is part of our research strategy to, to really work from the bottom up, so to speak. Um, but as I said, this is really from the perspective of behavioral psychology. Uh, and from that perspective, it's, it's really natural to talk about operant conditioning as one form of uh, uh, intelligence available in the animal kingdom. And two other examples that are harder problems is conditional discrimination and generalized identity matching. And I will go through these. So operant behavior is, um, um, it's really a, an operant can be said to be a relation between the organism and the environment. And this three term relation between stimulus response and consequence can't really be separated. Uh, so, so this is really about studying the interaction between organisms and environment or, or machines and, and environments. And I will try to describe how. So in this particular example, we have used open source for application and uh, the system could only do two things, clapping and, and waving. Uh, and it does motor bubbling that is triggered by some kind of very arbitrary goal, G. Uh, and that can be a light. The, the system can sense a light that could either be on or off. And if the system just runs like this, um, we, we can expect the, the clap and wave to happen with, with a motor babbling with a probability of, of 50% over time. However, given this, if we present the events G and uh, G 
with uh, no frequency uh, as a punisher, so to speak, we can use these two terms to to events to really get control of the probability of north response in relation to the light on and off. Um, so over time, uh, the probability increases. Another way to, to see it is really that the north confidence increases for the for this uh, sensory motor contingency. If the light is on and I clap, that will lead to G. So with more uh, examples and more experiences of G has happened, then the confidence of this contingency will increase. So from the perspective of behavioral psychology, we then say that G acts as a reinforcer because it shifts the probability of response from being constant to increasing. Uh, and another way, another term we use is discriminative stimulus. So the light and on and light off can be say, said to be the discriminative stim stimuli that basically help the system discriminate between clapping and waving. It's like a signal to what behavior leads to the desired consequence. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's one example, very simple example of operant behavior in NARS. So, okay, what is relational operant behavior then? So conditional discriminations. It, it's one step more advanced, so to speak. So let's say that the background color would have been either blue or green. And let's say that that would control if clapping and waving uh, in relation to the light would lead to G. Then we can say that the background color would have a conditional stimulus function. Uh, and this can be said to be a relational operant behavior because the system acts on the relation between the background color and the light. And, and this might sound like uh, very simple examples, but this is really something that is studied in the animal kingdom. So for example, this is a paper from 2015 where this kind of behavior was studied in an octopus. Uh, and in this particular example, the octopus, uh, uh, one group of octopus was trained to uh, act on a stimulus, uh, but only when there were air flowing and the other uh, group was uh, uh, acting only when the air was not flowing. So, the octopus could basically uh, discriminate between when it would get food and not uh, fr from this uh, in this situation. Um, so, so, so it, it is really a form of how to say it. It's a relevant behavior in a sense. Uh, this is something that is not obvious that all uh, animals can do for example. So this is one way to, to study conditional discriminations using a, an experimental task called the match to sample task. Uh, and in this experiment, typically a sample A1 is presented as the sample and there is one correct option B1 and one wrong option, maybe B2. Uh, and if the participant presses left to choose B1, an indication that the response was correct is presented. And of course, uh, in a real example, these are nonsense symbols or, or symbols that are hasn't been seen by the subject. Uh, and the, the symbols by themselves are, are unrelated. So 
let's say for example that someone didn't know the greek symbols this could be an example of a, this kind of task of, of the match to sample task that being shown the big lambda the someone can be taught to select the little lambda uh, by pressing left which would lead to a consequence of correct and if the person has shown some other symbol that would lead to a consequence of wrong for example so this is the typical match to sample uh, experiment that can be used to study this kind of behavior and, and in, in the rest of the presentation I, I will use symbols like a1 and b1 and b2 and, and sometimes it looks like the experiment will be too simple but what I really mean then is that these symbols are totally arbitrary this is once again something that can be studied in in NARS uh, so one more term is needed so so the parameter max sequence len in, in ONA is increased from three to four uh, and something like this is expected to be learned that in the context of a1 being the sample uh, and b1 is on the left and the system presses left or do the left operation then that leads to g so the experimental setup will be something like this uh, sample is a1 left is b1 right is b2 and g exclamation mark invites the system to to do a behavior uh, and over time, th this is uh, formed given multiple examples. So, so let's say these four versions uh, in total. So it can look like this. Um, let's say that uh, initially the system um is presented with the situation and uh, do some motor bubbling which might be correct right uh, which might lead that the system to the system forming a very simple hypothesis that if b2 is to the right then i press right that will lead to g but over time of course when when, when the experiment is uh, balance with uh, b2 being on both uh, left and right this simple hypothesis can't hold so the system needs to find a, a more uh, advanced hypothesis but so, so it, it is the uh, for that reason that the system increased the com complexity uh, of the hypothesis so the time uh, this leads to the system having learned a set of uh, hypotheses that it can use and, and these get increase the confidence of these hypotheses get increased over time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and as I said, this can really be called a relational operant behavior as the system acts on the relationship between, for example, A1 and B1 as the sample and to the left, for example. Uh, and as I said, this is a more advanced behavior though, because not all species can do it. And this is something that can be studied using match to sample experiments. Okay, but what is generalized relational operand behavior then? So this is something we had studied uh, in the form of generalized identity matching. So identity matching can be said to be a special case of conditional discriminations. 
uh, so a subject can learn to match, for example, A1 to A1 rather than A2. And, and please remember, th these symbols may be totally arbitrary. So a subject learns to match some random symbol to the identical symbol rather than something else. And then the test is that after repeated experiences of this, the subject might then in a totally new context match, for example, A3 to A3, which it has never seen, rather than A4. So in a way, this can be, a this can be said to be a task that requires the subject to learn and apply an identical concept. Uh, and this is something, for example, that has been studied in, in several animals. Uh, this is a paper from 94. But they studied this with with the uh, sea lions and there's actually a movie showing this on youtube with there were two sea lions in this paper and this is okay, so I, I think you understand what i'm trying to point at here that this is this situation then can be presented to nars with uh, in the training setup then that the system is trained uh, on on a set of uh, uh, cases uh, and over time the system uh, will generate a more abstract hypothesis that uh, using the variable introduction in, on uh, NARS layer 6 uh, to, to form a more general hypothesis uh, and then in a test the situation with the symbols that it has never seen before, it, it is forced to use the general hypothesis since it don't, don't have any uh, knowledge regarding A3 and A4, for example. Uh, and this is what it would look like in, in NARS. Um, so this is the test testing A3 and A4. So in a situation that it has never seen before, uh, it is using the general hypothesis uh, that it uh, learned over time. So here is the training that it performed. Uh, at first it was uh, uh, incorrect, blah, 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 and uh, learned more, uh, learned hypotheses that were uh, not abstract. But over time, uh, learned to be correct there, and in the testing, uh, oh, sorry, in the final testing. This is uh, symbols that it has never seen before. It is forced to use the more abstract hypothesis. And this is, this is something that uh, we played around me, er, me and Patrick, we, we tested to, to just remove this single line of code in, in OpenR's replication that introduces the variable uh, they introduces the yeah variable uh, and uh, then ona stops to be able to do generalized identity matching so so this is one way to do how to say it experimental nars research on the actual code uh, that it's it's one way of showing that this is necessary for generalized identity matching to take place the variable introduction on NARS layer 6. So maybe one way of saying it is that this can be seen as a minimal example of a transfer learning uh, that requires the variable introduction uh, and this abstract hypothesis is formed. And uh, so, so importantly, this is very important actually that the repeated experiences does not only increase 
confidence in the specific hypothesis it, it increases the confidence value on the identity concept in itself so g has a reinforcing effect on the abstract knowledge so 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 g has an reinforcing effect on the generalized operant rather than the individual examples and this is a key thing in uh, behavioral approaches to to cognition that it is really how events in the environment can have an effect on the generalized concepts so in a way the foundation for general intelligence then from the perspective of behavioral psychology is to to study it as generalized relational operant behavior and the most simple example of this is then generalized identity matching which is then from an arts perspective used using the sensory motor inference and the variable introduction on, on layer six is required uh, but many more advanced tasks can be studied using this method uh, and so this would be three more advanced examples beyond generalized identity matching so symmetry stimulus equivalence and transfer of function so one way to look at this is that the phenomena of stimulus equivalence that we can observe in, in human beings raises some questions on how this works. So, for example, this is, let's say that a human being learns that to match B1 with A1, to, to pick B1 in the context of A1 being the sample. So it learns the relation between A1 and B1. And then between A1 and C1, and then A2 and B2, and A2 and C2. Given those experiences and have it, having learned those four relations, a verbally able human being is predicted to be able to also perform at this task, even if it has never been shown C2 as the sample c1 as the sample it is predicted that a verbally able human being will pick b1 rather than b2 um, which we can look at maybe in a way like this that it, someone learns the relationship between a1 and b1 and between a1 and c1 we seem to be able to also act on the backward relation, the symmetrical relation, and also on transitive relations. So this is the stimulus equivalence phenomenon. Um, and this is something that has been explored also in the animal literature, if, if, if other animals than human beings can do symmetry and equivalence. Uh, so quite recently, for example, there was an update uh, on, on a summary paper on animal experiments that uh, has studied symmetry. And it seems to be observed in about 30% of the subjects, but uh, the, the authors conclude that it's likely more about some experimental setups might lead to this rather than that the animals have this capacity for, for a derived relation. And, and stimulus equivalence is actually something that has only been found in one single sea lion, the, the sea lion that was on the YouTube movie actually, Rio. And she was capable of doing stimulus equivalence after very, very, very much training. Uh, and uh, as I have understood it, it has also been hard to replicate with, with the same sea lion. So it's a bit debated, like, was this really an example of, of 
was this a, a stable example of stimulus equivalence? But except for that sea lion, that there has been no other example of stimulus equivalence in a non-human animal. So it, it might be the case then that stimulus equivalence might depend on something that is only available for human beings, like language. And uh, this is a study from 1986 that gives support to that hypothesis. They tested uh, uh, these kind of experiments in three groups of children. Uh, and uh, one group was normally developing children. One was a group with uh, intellectual disabilities. And one was a group with children with intellectual, intellectual disabilities without language. And the two groups of children with language could develop stimulus equivalence, but not the group of children with uh, uh, without language. So that might give a hint of that language uh, is needed for this to take place. So relational frame theory, a behavioral psychology approach to language and cognition really suggests that this is the case and also uh, suggests that multiple trainings, multiple example training in various scenarios of a relationship and the symmetrical version is it what is needed for these general patterns to develop over time. So RFT relational frame theory really suggests that the equivalence sameness concept is a generalized relational operant behavior that is something that is like the identity concept can be seen as a, how to say it, a generalized operant behavior, uh, an identity concept in the action, so to speak. In the same way, equivalence can be seen as a more advanced form of such uh, behavior. So equivalence then, or, or same in a verbal sense, like the sound of something being similar to the visual looks of something, or how two random things like a word can be similar to a sound of something. Th that kind of sameness in the verbal sense does not mean identical in the physical sense, as in identity matching. So, so stimulus equivalence and this kind of equivalence is really about sameness in the verbal sense. So this is something that we have explored a bit in ours. Uh, and uh, this might then be a case, or highly likely is the case that not only sensory motor inference is needed, but also semantic inference. Uh, and this is one way how we look at it. In the training, is it possible, for example, something like this, that in addition to A1 being the sample and left and right being B1 and B2, let's say that we provide a a, um, a similarity statement of A1 is similar to B1. Is that something that the system then can use to develop something like this? This is not working NARS. This is more like pseudo NARS knowledge. Um, and if the system could generate something like that, could it then given a situation like this with symbols that it has never seen before and the statement x1 is the same as y1 could it then perform in this situation without the similarity statement can it can it learn to from a can it use the similarity statement reversed to 
perform this sensory motor task basically. Uh, and exactly this thing doesn't really work. And this is for various reasons, something that we haven't really got a working model of yet. Uh, but something that we are working on. But obviously it, it is something that highly likely will depend on both semantic and sensory motor reasoning in the end. And highly likely G then will act as a reinforcer, not on, only on the individual cases, but on the abstract knowledge that might then look something like this. Um, and uh, just before finishing, why would this be interesting? Why, why, what is, okay, this is relating, this is relating, connected to operant behavior. This is um, semantic reasoning and, and uh, sensory motor re reasoning together, but what does it mean in practice? And, and maybe, this is one way to answer that, that all of this also depend on something that is in relational frame theory is called transfer or transformation of stimulus function. So it is the, the how to say it, from RFT, we can say that it, it's a key to a lot of derived meaning making that various psychological properties of, of stimuli are transformed. So for example, um, let's say that we have uh, used a match to sample task to establish equivalence between three symbols, A1, B1, and C1. And let's say that uh, we have used B1 as a reinforcer, as, as a G previously. After the equivalence, will then the reinforcing function transfer to another symbol that is equivalent to, to, to B1? So if B1 has been the G in the sensory motor contingency, and we have trained equivalence between A1, B1, and C1, can we then use C1 as the reinforcer? That would be a transfer of reinforcing function. And this is something that has been studied very, very extensively, but one of the first examples was in a paper from 1987, where symbol, uh, where, where individuals, individuals were trained in, in this kind of equivalence and then taught to wave or clap in the context of B1 or B2. Uh, and the question asked then, would the discriminating function of B1 and B2, like in the case of uh, uh, the light on and light, light off example that I had, Let's say that we show symbols that has never been used for discriminating. Would the discriminating function transfer to these symbols after equivalence has been established? It did for in, in the study. And so it does that for human beings. And simply, let's say that we have some kind of sorting task and use um, B1 and B2 to be the reinforcer to help the subject to find the strategy of sorting by showing B1 and B2 at the same time as we say correct and no. Let's say that we then later use C1 and C2 that was equivalent to B1 and B2. Would the reinforcing function transfer to C1 and C2? So these are things you could really study in NARS. And from the perspective of relational frame theory, the, these kind of derived uh, knowledge, not only 
derived relations, but also derived psychological properties of various events needs to be transformed for AGI <laughs> to be able to happen uh, is the thesis from relational frame theory. So uh, the title of a paper that um, came out uh, this year was relating is an operant which is the key insight by the first author here, Steve Hayes, a flyover of 35 years of research. So you can say that this way of talking about relate, relating as, a, as an operant, relating as a sensory motor behavior or relating as a sensory motor behavior in combination with semantic reasoning, that is the cornerstone of the relational frame theory. And uh, the fundamental thesis then in RFT is that cognition is best studied in this form as generali generalized relational operant behavior. And uh, beyond the equivalence, so to speak, there's lots of research on other relations like opposition and more than less than distinction and so on where also not only transferring of various stimulus functions studied, but also transformation. So in summary, this seems to be something that requires both semantic and sensory motor reasoning, and this theoretical framework uh, seems very compatible with NARS, and uh, I really think that these 35 years of RFT research really opens up for many, many exciting AGI research programs. Uh, and uh, with that, I want to say thank you very much for listening. Thank you for mm -hmm. this great talk. Uh, Thank you, Patrick. And uh, I, I have to say, I'm really fascinated by what you were uh, able to, to demonstrate with uh, openness for applications, which goes far beyond what I put into my thesis. <laughs> and uh, and uh, to me, it's, it's interesting that, uh, that the more I think about it, uh, the more uh, it's really relevant to, to study this, uh, this abilities to, to, of relating stimuli with each other and uh, to act on certain observed relationships. And um, the, there, there I have uh, one comment, which is, which is interesting because you mentioned first stimulus equivalence, um, that, it, uh, that it's essentially that language is re required in order to, to have it. And here I, I, I am personally uh, skeptical whether the direction of causality is right. <laughs> because if we look at nature, we will only see systems which either have neither uh, stimulus equivalence nor language, or we will have systems like humans which have both. And um, so the the question then is that maybe stimulus equivalence is needed for language and not language for stimulus equivalence, because it seems that language comes in very different forms. But what all languages seem to have in common is that it's needed to relate stimuli from different modalities with each other. For instance, to put the label on a certain object to say this is a dog or a cat. And without this, this multimodal references, we wouldn't even be able to use language in the first place, which is hence the question to you. Don't you think it's the opposite direction? <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't call it the opposite direction, but uh, it's, it's a very nice question. And, and as I see it, it may be more something like, okay, uh, maybe you could call whatever needed to happen for stimulus equivalence to take place to be some kind of, I don't know, intermediate language. And then when you have a stimulus equivalence, uh, language will for sure develop much more. 
um, and, and for example, there is studies where you, they have followed very, very small children over time. And let's say that they were 12 months and they did some conditional discriminations and they couldn't do symmetry. But then when they were 16 months, uh, the child learned to do symmetry. So it started mm. really to, to derive that. And then I think when it was 18 or 19 months, it, it could do transitivity. And, and, and typically that's where after that, it seems like it, it's really when language capacity in the child, boom, really explodes and it learns to relate everything with everything. Hmm. But, but the key true. really, really, really seems to be this capacity to, to derive uh, things, to, to derive a relationship between one event and the other. And so maybe another way of saying it is that that capability to derive something is what, what seems to be needed both for stimulus equivalence and uh, language. Mm, interesting. Mm -hmm. And so it's also like uh, when we get better in using language, it's also potentially improving our capability of doing stimulus equivalence tasks, right? Yeah, and uh, for example, children you doesn't learn a relationship in an abstract way of more than less than the more than less than relationship to really apply that as a general concept. They are typically learning that when they are about four years of age. Uh, so you could, so that's one way also of saying that the language capabilities increase uh, over time. Um, and uh, and uh, you can really, I think, imagine how much training in, in so many contexts that the child is exposed to for, for, for these advanced general concepts to develop. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, and the story continues like um, to relate the various um, relate relations, uh, for example, on uh, to, to create an uh, some kind of analogy is not possible, I don't know, at least until after, I don't know really, but for sure after five years of age. So obviously it, it's even more language development or whatever you want to call it for that thing to, to take place. Hmm. I see. Hmm. Uh, before I leave uh, the question, uh, questions to the others, uh, I have one more, uh, which is, uh, um, did you face any issues in, in, uh, in the current uh, relational reasoning capabilities of NAS where, where you hit like a war, where you could not explain a certain phenomenon uh, which you found in RFT or which is described or summarized by RFT? Um, it depends on, on how you look at it. It, it. it has been a travel, you know, with, with NARS uh, and uh, uh, like in two years ago, there were some issues with transitive reasoning on uh, null four experience relations, which I think works quite well now. Uh, but the latest, uh, and as long as you do RFT stuff within the semantic reasoning thing. A lot of stuff is working, but the hard task still <laughs> seems to be to really do it in this uh, decision making task, which involves sensory motor reasoning to, to really combine it with semantic reasoning. Mm. Uh, that, that's really, I don't know if you, if you can say to, it is to hit the wall, but um it's something at least to me it's not obvious how it could work exactly right now mm. uh -huh. and uh, sure. yeah mm -hmm. a, a lot of exciting uh, research is ahead uh -huh. <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you very much so any other question 
I think not. I think not. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, Next one, Christian. Would you mind? Hey, folks. So, uh, shall I start? Please, you're welcome okay. to. Um, how are we doing on time? Just so I have some idea. Can you hear me? I destroyed the time schedule with five minutes. I see. <laughs> um, so you're not giving me any hints as to except hurry up or? No, I think we have more time, right, Peter? OK. I think we gained five minutes. OK, wow. Excellent. So, um, yeah, um, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I will be telling you about uh, a hypothesis that I call the explanation hypothesis, and I'm sure has uh, cropped up in various forms throughout the decades and possibly centuries um, when people think about how um, people think about things. Um, and uh, if we look at an overview here of what I'm going to be talking about. So can you see my overview slide? Is that working? Oh, yes. Good. Um, so we'll just uh, go through the, the explanation hypothesis in a nutshell. We'll uh, talk about some definitions. There's a need for that. Because um, if we don't uh, clarify what is meant by the key terms, uh, it's hard to uh, to really see whether this hypothesis is uh, worth anything or not. Um, after we go through some definitions and talk about the context, we'll zoom out and uh, explain the explanation hypothesis uh, in light of those definitions and uh, then draw some conclusions. So, but first, I would like to start by saying that, that um, Essentially, my uh, framework for talking about any of this is the is a uh, is very close to the cybernetic view, which is to view um, an agent, a learning agent in a in a particular world, uh, as a controller. And the basic idea is that this learning controller needs to, um, in order to achieve its goals better, it needs to learn. Uh, so the assumption is um, first uh, that there's an environment. Can you see my cursor? Oh, uh, yes. Good. So we have the environment here, uh, which belongs to some some world from which it inherits rules, but may uh, be a particular domain, i.e., uh, that certain things are more common than other things. And um, but still under the laws of the universe, um, we have an agent which is basically composed of a set of sensors and actuators, and a controller that can take measurements from the sensors and uh, send it to actuators. And, and typically, um, what you have essentially is that. Uh, that sensors are also actuators and all actuators are also sensors, i.e. these are typically unified in some way because you need to know what the sensors are doing. So um, this, this system here in the world implements cumulative learning. That is, over time, as the agent uh, with its controller um, models better the uh, the measurements it makes, i.e. its experiences, the better it gets at achieving goals. Uh, now, so what's on the outside? It, it's very useful to think about the world as being composed of an enormous set of variables, some of which are observable. And uh, I, I use the term variable here fairly loosely, i.e. Uh, you can have sets of variables and you can call that a variable. Um, 
how exactly that is uh, um, well ultimately it, it boils down to how you measure them but um, we don't have to go into that much detail here um, so there are some subset of the environments variables that are observable and there's a subset of these that are manipulatable um, that's just the, the very high level sort of framework. Now we assume a complex task environment. That is, the variables are in a world that is open. Uh, there's a large number of variables, or actually a giant number of variables with a giant number of relations. And there are uh, transformations that these variables can undertake that, are, that have regularity. Otherwise, the learning would be impossible. Um, which produce complex spatial temporal patterns and novel novelty is actually not common but novelty is the rule that is your um, and I like to think of the physical world here the physical world essentially never presents the same thing twice and even if uh, um, an accumulative learner experiences the quote-unquote same environment it's not the same environment because they've learned something since so uh, things are flowing <clears throat> uh, in the same way that the ancient Greek philosophers talked about you never step in the same river twice um, <clears throat> so we're basically saying that uh, we're we're targeting we're interested in complex task environments um, because we're talking about AI, there's a reason for us having built this AI. And uh, the reason for the existence of the AI determines what kinds of tasks and what kinds of environments we want to put that AI into. Um, we don't have to go into a lot of details here, but basically we can say that the, the modeling capacity, uh, if you remember, uh, that the uh, cumulative learning process essentially builds up a, a set of a growing set of models of the world. Um, the uh, this modeling capacity is of course capped. There's it's not infinite, and uh, we generally say that the total number of variables that could be measured and affected in the world is vastly greater than the capacity of the controller. Um, this changes a lot actually uh, in, in, um, in how you would model a cognitive system uh, and it's a largely ignored uh, issue outside of AGI. But um, I don't have to uh, preach to the choir here so let's move on. Um, we're talking about autonomous general learning. Um, after all, the uh, explanation hypothesis is, is essentially relevant only in the context of autonomous general learning in uh, infinite worlds or uh, open worlds. So uh, what do we mean by learning? Well, uh, generally speaking, just knowledge acquisition. I don't think there's anything controversial here. Um, to uh, break that down a little bit, Essentially, uh, learning is a systematic buildup of information structures that allow the controller to do something that falls into one or more of these four categories. Predict, achieve goals, explain, and recreate a target phenomena. So, um, in the same way that, uh, that Kepler essentially recreated the universe, uh, no, sorry, the, the solar system, I was going to say, um, recreated the solar system uh, in a way that uh, where you could explain the movement uh, of the heavenly bodies in uh, rather sim simple terms, or especially compared to what came before. Uh, this is the, this is what is meant by recreating, i.e. you could think of it as, you know, if you, if you can create a computer simulation that behaves accurately uh, like a target phenomenon then you have recreated it. As you know this requires a lot of knowledge about variables. If it's a large system it can get uh, uh, the, the number of, of solutions that don't that look like they might work but don't work is vastly greater than the number of 
solutions that successfully explain a complex phenomenon. All right, um, we're still talking about knowledge acquisition. So, um, what is what is this cumulative learning? It's a it's a buildup of of sets of models that capture uh, the clustering of percepts. Or percepts are basically um, groupings uh, along some dimensions of the experiences of the uh, learner. Now, this is a general learner. So it has to be able to handle all sorts of varieties of things, and it has to be able to um, relate seemingly unrelated things, um, i.e. to be more general means that there are fewer silos in its One of the things that uh, what we represented in order to get anything done are causal relations. Causal relations uh, are necessary for getting anything done effectively and efficiently, especially in complex worlds. So this is a necessary but not sufficient uh, feature of our learner. Um, this systematic buildup of information structures is assisted by attention which highlights what knowledge is salient at any point in time and determines how to use the available computing power for the model building and for getting stuff done, right? Um, but uh, to evaluate a model's usefulness, you know, uh, um, in this case, a model is based on some observations about the, some relations uh, between things. Um, if you're trying to understand something or learn about something new, you um, you don't, by definition, you don't know how things relate. So what happens is that you have to create hypotheses and they have to be falsifiable. This is not anything different than what modern science does when, when it does uh, empirical comparative experiments. Um, and, uh, and of course, the creation of such hypotheses must be bounded by some practical concerns. Um, uh, you're not able to, uh, to, to consider everything and anything. Of course, there are limitations to the capacity of the modeler. So um, that's in a nutshell uh, what we mean by knowledge acquisition here. Now let's talk about autonomy. What do we mean? Well, it means without outside help. <laughs> Essentially, um, outside help from teachers, developers, etc., that uh, provide some information that is specifically dependent on the learning progress of the learner. So that's what uh, we uh, mean by autonomous learning. Um, what do we mean by general? Well, uh, intuitively, a wide range of novelty, essentially. A, a, a wide range of types of novelty, you could say. Um, a learner that's regularly exposed to novelty, uh, it must handle by creating new knowledge through hypothesis making. And, and we can we can imagine that if you're faced with some novelty, um, you're going to have to create some information structure to describe that novelty. Okay. Um, well, some of that uh, that uh, it, those information structures are going to be wrong, and uh, we then the cognitive apparatus needs some way of selecting. And how do we do that? Well, um, or how, and how do we come up with new uh, new ideas for what? We're standing in the forest. Uh, we see something strange. Um, what what is our first thought? How do, how do we uh, come to grips with with that floating blob in the forest that you might see? Um, and uh, you've, you you've not seen anything like it. Well, actually, you have. It reminds you of uh, like a, a cloud of of fog, and uh, it has some pink and purple hues, etc. I'm just making this up. As a, to illustrate the point. Um, you come up with some hypothesis about what it is. How do you do that? 
Well, of course, through similarity. What similarity? It's it's an analogy. Um, what do you have available to do this? You have existing knowledge. You have your existing experience, your, your past experience, essentially. Um, so essentially here we're talking about a wide range of novelty. We're talking about generality, which means that um, it, there, there's a scope of novelty that, um, well, actually I jumped a bit too far fast there. Uh, there's a scope of novelty that uh, may be fairly far from what you've seen before. But if it was completely uh, uh, separated from what you know, then you are by definition incapable of understanding and learning about that new phenomenon without outside help or autonomously. Um, now, uh, what, is it, what does this mean for a newborn? How does a newborn actually start to learn if they don't, by, ex by definition, have any experience so far of the world they're getting born into? Um, well, uh, we assume that there's a seed. We assume that there's a way to bootstrap, that, that the learner needs to be born with something that allows it to bootstrap its initial knowledge acquisition. Um, and we don't have to go into this too, in too much detail. It's, margin, it's only marginally and as a special case related to the explanation hypothesis. But uh, so I will just move along. Let me um, uh, show you an illustration here. Um, here we are basically talking about uh, the oval shape, the egg shape here is um, is a controller and it has a memory uh, um, and um, it is born with a seed so it's born with a little bit of of cognitive programming that allows it to assume some things when it's born let's say for humans this might be the assumption that there are regularities in the world you're born into otherwise you know learning would be pointless and that maybe uh, correlation is a good hint uh, that there might be some causation in the world. So um, you create hypotheses about uh, your mind, creates hypotheses about what it's experiencing, and starts building up um, knowledge from scratch. Not totally from scratch. It's it's not a blank slate. It, it has this this program here that that helps it bootstrap. And as you as your hypotheses get generated and evaluated in light of other experience, um, the amount of of things you know in the world uh, it increases. So you get more and more familiar stuff, essentially. And now you can use the familiar stuff to create the hypotheses as well as your seed. Now there's still a large part of the of your world. Uh, from birth to death, to uh, to the grave, that you don't know. So this is the novel stuff in the world. And as you uh, grow, um, your your knowledge builds up. So so here are some phenomena that you come across, and uh, as you come across more phenomena, uh, the common regularities of those, as well as sp specific regularities of those phenomena, um, uh, become knowledge. Okay. Um, so we're basically saying we're talking about phenomena. This could be anything, really, anything uh, new in your world that you need or want to understand. Um, so that's essentially what we mean by general. Uh, what do we mean by reasoning when we talk about reasoning? Well, it's a systematic application of logic, and we've mentioned a couple of things here. Um, we mentioned hypothesis generation and the selection of hypotheses and evaluation. Of course, if you want to select between hypotheses, you need to be able to evaluate them somehow. Now, if you're if you're right now thinking, okay, let me reflect on how I learn. Is this something that my mind does? Is this something that happens in my brain when I learn? Um, what I want you to do is stop doing that. Uh, you're basically doing uh, introspection and it's a highly uh, unreliable way of doing either psychology or, and especially AI. What I want you to think about is basically that you're asked to build an, uh, an AI and um, 
you have this issue, you have this challenge that you, you need to create a mechanism that allows it to learn on its own highly general stuff uh, with a wide variety of, uh, of things being experienced. And the question is, how can you uh, enable that? Uh, how do you make that system? How can you enable it to bootstrap itself? And how can you enable it to uh, learn new stuff? Okay, because that's what that's going to lead us to the explanation hypothesis very soon, I promise. Okay, so systematic uh, application of logic. Well, um, I already mentioned some of these, but uh, basically you create some hypotheses about how the world works. This, this will inform you whether, whether you know, you're in the forest, you see this very strange blob, you're hesitant to walk towards it. Why? Because you know that you don't know what that is. And then you come up with a, a, a safe experiment. You throw a rock or, or a stick at the thing. Okay, to see what happens. How, what is that based on? Well, it, it's based on, it's an experiment. It's an empir empirical experiment that you're doing to see how similar this thing is to other stuff you know. If the rock bounces off, you know it's hard even though it looks soft. Um, I don't have to belabor those points, I don't think. Um, so you get some evidence from experience. Uh, you're in a situational situation that gives you information and of course it, this depends on your active goals if you're if you're late for work maybe you don't linger around that long uh, there's a hierarchy of goals that you may have and uh, you're gonna have to select between them maybe this is this is so strange and unusual that you uh, you're willing to risk losing your job over it you know it could be but that is something that and and again don't don't introspect just think there, there's got to be something equivalent to goals that are semi-explicit or are completely explicit, and they must be processed somehow, um, uh, uh, not, um, not assuming a divine intervention. Your mind is doing some processing. You're not able to access all of that processing. In fact, probably uh, only a, mi a minor fraction of it. And for some reason, the thought pops in your head, oh, I'm going to be late for work. You lost a little bit track of time, but your mind somehow reminded you of it. And you weren't aware that you were going to be late for work until that suddenly popped into your head. Where did it come from? You know, I'm not going to answer that today, but that, that's the kind of thing that we need to think about and stop introspecting all the time. So, um, the um, the hypotheses that are created, and no matter what their form and where they live, etc., and how they're created, they, they they must be there. There's a reason why you throw that rock rather than dancing. Okay, assuming that you know how to dance. Um, there are some hypotheses, and again, I don't care what form or, or etc. they take, but for the argument of, of this uh, topic that we're talking about here, uh, um, we have to assume that there are some hypotheses. Now, um, they are uh, essentially evaluated based on uh, evidence from experience, but also uh, from some reasoning uh, processes, like, uh, you know, it's more like this than that, and therefore it might be dangerous, etc. cetera. Uh, and those uh, mini experiments that I just mentioned. Um, and then these hypotheses, you know, maybe there's a massive amount of them, or maybe they're just very sparse. Um, that uh, there's a ver variety of them, and some of them um, are discarded immediately because they're just not uh, predicted to be useful. So uh, let's move on here. Now, um, so we're saying basically that the learner applies reasoning. Um, that should uh, go along very smoothly with, with the NARS crowd. Um, and one of the main uh, uh, forms of reasoning here, um, I'm going to argue, is, uh, is abduction. In any case, uh, and you, you may, for those of you who, uh, who are new to reasoning, uh, abduction is essentially what Sherlock Holmes does so extremely well. 
Um, he comes into a, a situation where there's a terrible deed having been done, and he needs to deduce what happened. Sorry, <laughs> abduce. Um, so, so that's that's basically what we mean by systematic application of logic. And now we get to explanation. And what what is explanation? Well, let's let's just talk, take the general case. The, and there's a reason why I mentioned abduction, um, because abduction is often thought of and formulated uh, as a the as the reasoning form that does explanation. In fact. Uh, so, but in the general case, a good explanation is a compact description that allows effective and, effic and efficient prediction, goal achievement, and possibly recreation. So, um, you know, if I ask for an explanation of something, like, uh, why didn't the light come on when I pressed the button? Because it's the other button you have to push. Now, that is a good explanation because a, my goal is to turn on the light, and B, I did not have the information needed to make it happen. So um, there's a lot actually that can be unpacked in that example. Um, I, I, you know, my assistant that gave me that explanation why the light didn't didn't turn on uh, knew that I knew that I already pressed the button and. And at, right after that, I, I asked the question, why it didn't turn on? So the the, the reasoning al allows them to think that, to infer that uh, I thought that was the switch. Okay. So, but anyway, anyway that's uh, kind of besides the point. Now, um, we are very goal-driven, um, but of course we, we also lounge a lot. And, and you might think, you know, why, why do we lounge a lot? Why do we, why do we relax on Fridays? Except today, of course, um, uh, around uh, 6.30 p.m., um, I'm giving this talk. Why, why wouldn't I be lounging in front of the TV? Well, um, I have a goal to give you a presentation. And so there's a lot of goal-drivenness, and they might be trivial goals, and they might be very implicit goals. But by and large, a, lot of, a vast majority of uh, modern human life can be explained in terms of very crisp goals. Now, it, it, this does not mean that um, I, I think that A, that th this is the only way to build AI, or, or B, that uh, this is the only way that I think people operate, or, you know, human psychology works. Uh, that's, that's a topic for another time. But, um, well, let's move on. I'm losing track of the goal here. No pun intended. So <clears throat> the thing is that explanation always has a goal, in fact. The, it's not a single goal, to be, to be fair. Uh, but there is a reason why anyone would give a, an explanation. And there's a reason why we explain things in a different way to a child and to a grown-up. First of all, because they have different goals, but also because they have different background knowledge. So um, any explanation in, in social circles has a heavy dose of taking into consideration who's listening to my explanation and what do they know already. Um, we, in AI, we, we can kind of put that aside because our, our AIs are just not that smart yet to, to, be, able, to be able to consider, you know, oh, this, this uh, agent, whether it's a human or another robot that I'm talking to, a, you know, or explaining things to, you know, doesn't have this or that knowledge. So I'm going to formulate my explanation in a different way. We're we're not quite there yet, so we can put that aside for now. But we'll, we're we're going to have to look at that um, in the near future, probably in the next twenty years. Um, but you know, as I said, um, the goal of an explanation, and, and there is always a goal, and the, and it's it's one of these three here. It's either to allow the recipient of the explanation to predict better or to achieve goals better or to possibly recreate some aspect of a particular phenomenon. Um, so now we're getting to the heart of the matter. So now we can talk about explanation in learning. So uh, the explanation hypothesis in, in autonomous general learning, right? Uh, in the case of an autonomous general learner, 
The goal is to create good models of a novel phenomenon. Okay, this is a, a primary function of an autonomous general learner because they can't, you know, ET can't call home. They can't go back to the lab and get retrained. They are autonomous. They're supposed to do it on their own. So um, the role of the models that that a learner creates of a novel phenomenon are ultimately to allow the learner to predict the phenomenon better, to achieve goals with respect to the phenomenon better. If it's a, if it's a dangerous thing, run away. If it's an edible thing and you're hungry, eat it, etc. cetera. Um, create explanations of it. Now this is more on the human side and uh, possibly recreate it. Um, so, in the case, um, again, we're still talking about autonomous general learners, the verification of a good explanation of why certain hypotheses extracted from these models that it creates by learning should be considered over some other maybe conflicting or competing hypotheses rests on arguments of these hypotheses' ability to, you guessed it, effectively and efficiently enable prediction, goal achievement, explanation, and recreation of a particular phenomenon. So, you know, you create a hypothesis, you know, you're, you're, you're basically uh, um, faced with the novelty. You come up with a bunch of hypotheses about this phenomenon, but ultimately you want, the, you want to retain the hypotheses that are most likely to get you to be able to predict and achieve goals with respect to that phenomenon. Um, the process of looking at these hypotheses requires some sort of evaluation of the set of, of alternative and competing hypotheses. Okay, so you have a set of hypotheses, you need to evaluate their worth. Um, you do that in light of these prediction, goal achievement, explanation, and recreated recreation. Just ignore for a moment that there's explanation in there. It may uh, make it a little bit more complicated, uh, convoluted to think about, but it all results in the end, I promise. So, um, so where were I? Where was I? Um, yeah, so, so there's an evaluation of the sets of hypotheses, right? Now you get a score, and I'm simplifying here. It doesn't really work this way, but ultimately there has to be some evaluation, which means uh, some hypotheses are preferred over some other hypotheses. Okay. Um, now, the ability to evaluate these hypotheses and discard some and retain others is also subject to learning. Okay. Um, but in any case, the process of evaluating these hypotheses calls for abduction. You have to be able to explain to yourself, in this case, or the learning mind must be able to retain the arguments for why certain hypotheses were retained. Okay. Um, and this, and the, there, this is where the argument essentially resides. Um, so there's a process of abduction that is involved, that must be involved in evaluating whether uh, some of your hypotheses are better, better than others. But in a meta learning style, the ability to do that in and of itself is also subject to learning and is also subject to the same uh, process of abduction of picking which methods for evaluating the hypotheses are better than others. All right, so um, I hope you uh, caught that. So essentially, um, what we're saying here is that general autonomous learning requires reflection. That is, the learning system needs to be able to reflect on its own operations over these hypotheses, the, gener the hypothesis generation process, the evaluation process, the selection and retention process. Uh, and um, for that, it needs to be able to observe its own operations and apply in a meta fashion um, 
reasoning over those very processes as well. Um, and this is possibly why um, animals are less general learners than people, but I that this is going a bit too far. That's not what this talk is about. Uh, I'm just trying to present to you the arguments behind um, behind the explanation hypothesis. So um, yeah, I think I have uh, essentially said, told you what's in this slide. Let's move on. So good explanations allow for effective and efficient prediction, goal achievements, and recreation, i.e. modeling, of the usefulness of a set of hypotheses for achieving the same. Plus, of course, uh, explanation. Um, I put that in down here so that you wouldn't uh, get too confused. Um, essentially, the application of these argumentation methods, whatever they are, they're based on abduction, they produce a compact description of the reasons behind the generation and selection of hypotheses about world elements and their relationships over time. And this is essentially one definition of explanation. So now you see where um, explanation fits in general autonomous learning. So if we go back to this picture, essentially, um, this, uh, these arrows here, which, which have to do with how your hypotheses and how your familiar uh, knowledge and unfamiliar novel or novel uh, information, how that interacts in your head, essentially. Here we have um, processes that take some hypotheses, uh, compare them to the novel information, and get some information about that back. We have the same hypotheses or other ones um, uh, compared to what you already know, you, uh, you compare the, uh, the, what you already know, with, you produce some new hypotheses possibly, and, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is just for illustra illustrative purposes, not supposed to be like a complete process image or picture uh, of how this works. So uh, there's several uh, arguments for and against, because uh, I think I'm, I'm getting a bit late on, on time here. I'm gonna go very quickly through these. So my, what, someone might ask, you know, is reasoning strictly necessary? Because if, if, we, if we don't need reasoning, oops, uh, if we don't need reasoning, uh, maybe all of this goes away and the explanation hypothesis, we can throw it out. Well, um, if, if reasoning is, is strictly necessary, then the, um, the argument is pretty heavy for the explanation hypothesis. Now, whether you, call, whether you classify it as an explanation or something else, you know, it really depends on uh, your definition of these processes. And, and that's, uh, that's actually a deeper issue. But um, if you say reasoning is not strictly necessary for, for general autonomous learning, then I ask back, you know, or someone else might ask, uh, what alternatives are there for scaling your learning? If you want to be general enough, how could you possibly, um, uh, what, what possible uh, mechanisms could you come up with for that? Um, another, or, and I think that's going to be a really hard sell. Um, Sub-symbolic learning relies on other kinds of processing than explanation. Um, yeah, you could sort of see that coming, uh, but learning based on correlational data um, is not sufficient for general learning. Uh, however, uh, uh, and this is something I think this audience shares uh, on this opinion on, but uh, maybe we, ha we should uh, also ask for uh, stronger mathematical and or empirical uh, evidence for this claim. Um, one implication of the sub-symbolic learning relies on other kinds of processes than explanation uh, is that, uh, well, then you'd have to be able to, then you'd have to say, well, all learning is sub-symbolic, even, um, even human learning is sub-symbolic. And that's, that's also going to be a hard sell. Um, and I've already mentioned this one here, correlational data. Um, you could say, um, and finally, let's, let's uh, throw this one out, explanation processes are such a small part of all kinds of learning that we shouldn't even bother conceptualizing it in this way. 
well, that might be true, but it would, uh, you would have to provide some evidence for how this could work without abduction. And um, I dare you to come up with a way to do that. Now you can see I'm sort of leaning in the direction of the explanation hypothesis. Um, and, there, and that's actually why I chose to give this talk. But I'm open, open to arguments. So I'd love to hear uh, some counter cases. So in summary, um, the explanation hypothesis claims that processes of self-explanation are central to learning. Um, it rests on the argument that reasoning processes are necessary for open world general learning, autonomous learning, I should put in there, especially abduction. Um, if this is correct, then autonomous general learning requires uh, reflection because the system needs to be able to look at its own processes and improve them. It needs to be able to look at its own hypothesis generation. It needs to be able to reify the hypotheses so that it can, to, to, this, to the level sufficient to be able to compare them and choose between them in some way. And uh, that means that constructionist methodologies like virtually all of AI is using, except uh, some AGI folks, are not going to suffice for general machine intelligence. We are going to have to invent new constructivist methods. So. Thanks for listening. Now, um, if there are any questions, I don't know if we have time for questions, but uh, let's see. who's in charge? Hi, Chris, I had a question. Could you explain a little bit more what you meant about uh, recreating on the slides? Uh, recreation is, is sort of like um, uh, essentially having all of the details of a phenomenon sufficient so that you can basically uh, um, produce uh, minute details of it uh, and uh, um, even numeric data. Like, you know, if, if you really understand um, a system like the solar system, you can predict it many million years into the future. Um, and that's what we mean by recreating. Essentially making a detailed enough model of it that you can write a computer simulation and, uh, and it works just like the, the phenomenon that it describes. Okay, thank you, I agree with that. And uh, I also agree with the idea of sort of selecting the best uh, explanation um, using things like abduction, like the current context of the situation, also um, like the strongest model, um, while at the same time comparing multiple explanations um, so that we don't always um, just select, for example, our strongest explanation. Thank you. There's a reason why we have these in, a, in the order that I showed, you know, so you have, uh, you have uh, prediction and a prediction is the simplest one uh, because you can predict even if you don't know the the true or, or the effective causes of things. Uh, you can predict that if you see that the switch is pressed in, that you can predict that the light is on, even if you're blind. Uh, you know, there's a correlation. Uh, the second one is, is a, a, a goal achievement. And for that, you need directional knowledge of cause and effect. Um, there's no way around that. Um, and uh, then explanation is the next one, which rests on the two before that, and then recreation is like the, you could say, the ultimate kind of highest level of uh, understanding of anything. Okay, Kristen, question for you. That was a good talk, by the way. Um, Thank you. Uh, would, uh, would you say that uh, explanation is the only thing necessary for general autonomous learning? Or would you say no. it's one of the things? It's one of the things, yeah. One of the things. Definitely. Okay, so yeah, I get yeah, the impression. Yeah. It's definitely, yeah. Yeah, I get the impression that your explanation is a causal, uh, temporal relationship. It's an abduction. It's all to do with uh, temporal relationships, but you also have um, spatial relationships, which yeah, I don't think absolutely. you'd c call uh, uh, explanation is required. You still have relationships there. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much for the talk. Thanks. 
Uh, hello. Mm -hmm. uh, can I have a question? That is, yeah, I'm please. I'm a little bit curious that uh, what what is the reason to use the word reflection? Um, uh, basically, reflection implies some sort of reification of information, the the knowledge that you learn, and this. Uh, in uh, in the good old fashioned days in the 70s and uh, 60s 70s and 80s uh, ai was very much based on on axiomatic reasoning methods and you didn't need to think about this because none of those systems really learned and um it it wasn't so you know it's if you uh, have read some of the history of AI, you know, the LISP was invented very early on in the history and you and LISP was structured in such a way, unlike uh, most other programming languages, that you could very fairly easily, I should say, write a program that wrote a program. And you could turn data into code and code into data very easily on the on the fly at runtime. Um, this kind of reflection uh, then became um, standard in many programming languages. But it was, to some extent, actually, it came out of AI. Now, in a in a system that doesn't learn, making a program that may, that writes a program or that that parses a program is is, is trivial. It, it, what's hard is to make a program that makes a sensible program, because otherwise we would have machines do all our programming. Um, so we clearly haven't solved that. Essentially, all programming requires human level intelligence. Um, we have now uh, reached the threshold where people are comfortable saying that machines learn, but all of those machines uh, learn in a very uh, uh, non-transparent way. Uh, well, the ones that learn in a learn so, something complex enough to be practical uh, are uh, is in a way that is very impenetrable, even by the the coders. This is the black box of deep learning, if you will. Uh, or that's a, at least the, the current incarnation. So the hard part here is um, we want machines that learn very complex things but still are capable of doing introspection, i.e. Uh, reflection, such that they can take their knowledge and operate on it as if it was data. They can, it, they can look at their own processes and they have a way of learning about processes so that they, they can turn the learning that they, that they may uh, used to learn complex tasks in the, in the physical world, let's say, they can turn it on their own knowledge processes and improve them. Now, whether that's according to some some uh, innate born uh, roadmap or or something else, uh, you know, we're not really there yet. But this is why uh, reflection is important here. I got it. Uh, so, uh, uh, can I think that the, the but when using word reflection, it's not about just using like intuition, just like an animal without thinking. Um, but it's a kind of, you know, you need to uh, know where I am and what is my purpose, you know, to have a, just like a, how to say it, a global view of yourself. That is really about thinking. It doesn't have to be global, um, but it, it's really about the ability to do meta cognition. Got it. Mm, yeah, that is. I yeah, I I, I completely agree with that. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Mm. Uh, maybe uh, I have a question. Um. Um. Would you say that uh, uh, when we, for instance, compare this uh, cumulative learning systems with something like current deep learning systems, uh, what would you say, for instance, that uh, learning from a few observations is something inherently different than learning patterns in a large corpora or in a, in a large data set? Uh, would you say that the learning principles uh, might need to be different to deal with like uh, learning from a few examples or, or would you say uh, 
um, that uh, how to say it, that essentially if we get the, the learning principle right to deal with uh, learning from few observations that automatically this will also capture the other case. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, it, it is different. In fact, basically, uh, the, it's the difference between uh, um, model-based learning and reinforcement learning. So, of course, in some sense, all learning is reinforcement learning. You can't learn without verifying that you've learned it. You, can, you, you have to verify somehow that, that you're going in the right direction if you want to learn something complex. Uh, and so it is reinforced by the results of what you're doing, right? So in that sense, and that's what people probably mean when they say, you know, all you need is reinforcement learning, but, but they, they interpret that wrong. <laughs> Essentially, uh, the, 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 that sense of the concept of reinforcement learning is inherent in the definition of learning, in fact. Uh, the difference in, in uh, uh, yeah, if you want to, a machine that doesn't have to have that 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 uh, does not need uh, a lot of examples to learn something and we we've all seen this in in fairly simple uh, learning like reinforcement learning when you teach cats and dogs to do things there's a lot of repetition that's needed probably not as much as as these deep neural networks uh, not as much data but then again um there's a very big difference between how people learn by when they read a book, for instance, and how a dog learns um, from uh, from experience how to heed its owner. So, um, so the the learning processes are clearly different, and that's where the need for more data or less data comes from. In fact, if you want to, um, uh, if you want to take something that is extremely hard to do with um, reinforcement learning uh, is, you know, teach, let's take a, a purely reinforcement learning machine that's, or system that's learned a really complex task. Let's say they've learned to bake pizza through reinforcement learning. And then you tell it, uh, okay, now your goal is to not make pizza. And because of the mechanisms, uh, they, they can't they can't reify their learning um, history and say, oh, it's all of that and not that, right? It's not pizza. Mm -hmm. so, so this requires reflection. You, you, you have to be model-based to some extent. You have to be able to package this up. Because you, 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 maybe you, you never thought of, you know, maybe, I bet you at the beginning of this talk, you didn't think I would, I would ask you to not to bake pizza, Patrick. But now I'm, I'm I'm telling you that you know don't make pizza tonight, and uh, so you you couldn't have thought of that beforehand. You know there's no there's no way you can prepare for all of the contingencies. Uh, there's about probably mm -hmm. two hundred sentences that you've heard today here uh, in just my talk that you've never heard before. So the the only way to do that is through models, and 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 grammar, and which is basically just rules. And, um, and and on that subject, in fact, I don't think. Uh, my hypothesis is that you that that human level learning does not need a special language device, um, does not need, in fact, any special learning capacity beyond the the general learning that we do. In fact, I think that that learning uh, that language exists because of the kind of learning we are capable of. That's that's mm. truly my opinion, but it's still a hypothesis to, that remains to be verified. Uh huh. Very interesting. It's also uh, also this reinforcement learning example is, is uh, uh, it, it uh, essentially. Ideally, we would want an agent to learn like different causal relationships about the environment so that it can, as you say, carry out different tasks. And it's almost uh, as the representation, the, almost as if the representations the agents learn are independent from particular gore. So it can then be utilized as components to achieve various different outcomes, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's where the general in, in general learning. Comes from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Can I ask you a question? Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you, Christian, for a very nice uh, and interesting um, presentation. Um, Ted from Norway here. Um, I have been looking into this um, Euclidean space, uh, and with especially with regards to neural representation of such spaces. Have you considered this for sub-symbolic learning? Or would you say this is sub-symbolic? <laughs> okay, um, I still haven't seen, I still haven't found the paper that really in a compact and nice way explains um, the whole scope of symbolic, sub-symbolic, um, model-based, um, implicit, explicit, etc. These concepts that uh, we have made dichotomies out of and basically uh, talk as if there's a system one and a system two and you know there's a lot of terms that by for some very strange reason it are always like there's always pairs um, the um, I would say that, that you know um, the a necessary part of something being a symbol means that it's easily separatable out of um, a lot of noise and that you have to have a lot of very specific noise to destroy its operation as a symbol. Um, it also needs to, um, it, it, it comes with the inherent uh, requirement for the machinery um, to interpret the symbol, essentially. So a it, symbol it has a conditional. Yeah. So it, it has an intention there's an intention behind it and then when it did when it was encoded and then it when it was decoded there's a that intention is extracted somehow and um so it these are clearly not easy things to come to grips with especially um when you're trying to deal with the full spectrum of light hitting the retina and uh you know you got an array of stuff at 20 hertz let's say and uh each of those is multi-dimensional because because it's at least rgb and and you need to you need to bridge from that all the way up to concepts like uh that's a pan not a pot uh so you uh, so so it, it's 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 only natural that that uh, the the world of AI sort of is split into the perception side versus the high high level cognitive side and reasoning side. You know these uh, separations are due to the fact that you have this quite big array, wide array of different types of data, and somehow the somehow intelligence handles it all in a unified way. And we have this really awesome example, well, or so we think, uh, ourselves as an example of an intelligence, uh, intelligence system that we would like to recreate. And there's, uh, there's also the uh, answer to you, Tangri, uh, the, um, we would like to recreate that in a machine in some way. But uh, um, to me, it, it's not really the separation is, is not very useful, actually. This symbolic, sub-symbolic separation, um, it, it's only, you know, it's only, it, its effectiveness at helping us do AI better, and, or especially AGI, is kind of mediocre, in my opinion. I, I know that's not a really good answer, but it's my answer. Uh, it is very interesting, uh, especially with the recent uh, literature in neuroscience with regards to neural representation of Euclidean spaces and uh, the ge geometric or Euclidean conditionals uh, for activating individual play cells, for example. Um, I was just uh, curious whether you had looked into that. Not specifically, no. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, Christian. Hey, Sam Goto here, calling from the from the room, uh, from Christian's laptop. 
Um, wonderful talk, super interesting. I was just uh, wondering, uh, kind of like a little bit trying to think about how uh, children develop or, or adults learn. Um, when you said that um, self-reflection is necessary for, for general learning, are you necessarily trying to also imply that it's something that um, it's innate rather than acquired? Like the, the babies come, is it built in in babies that there's a self-reflection module or is that something that's acquired as they go along? It's not a module. I think it's a function of the system and it's probably innate, but you know, these are empirical questions that I don't have a very strong basis to make any assertions about. Um, and in, in this context, my, um, my thoughts are mostly driven by essentially the question, the engineering question, you know, what do we need to do to have an autonomous general learner? What does it involve? Um, if it turns out that, that all of these assumptions are wrong for some reason, I, I, that's fine by me. It's, I'm just trying to get at it. You know, I'm cr trying to dig deeper and, um, I'm not really sure about the implications of this, uh, except for, for the ones that I mentioned, I'm pretty sure that, that those are kind of obviously uh, side effects if that uh, th hypothesis turns out to be correct. Well, I guess from an engineering perspective, from a system building perspective, the distinction here is whether you codify that into your, your, code, your system or whether that's something you allow it to learn and to develop and to acquire. So architecturally, well, you know, architecturally, um, there, there, we have, we have inherited uh, a lot of methodology from computer science, and we tend to think in those terms because ultimately we want to write a program that does that, and so we think, okay, how do you write a program? Uh, we we don't do it in basic anymore, uh, but it, it's not actually very far from that because essentially the principles uh, of software development um, put always put you in in the frame of mind that you're um, you're writing some code that's going to do x and the x is always formulated in terms of tasks um, so we need to move away from that and start to think uh, about skills. And that's essentially what I'm trying to get at with the autonomous general learning. If, we, if we're not specific about what we mean by autonomy and generality then, or learning, then um, what we get out is essentially um, papers with a lot of fancy words in the titles, but you know, a completely different interpretation between, between authors. You know, and, and, and uh, as a field, that doesn't really sound like a good way to make progress. Uh, there is a huge difference between the, you could say on the one hand, practical AI people who, um, uh, well, actually this is, this is maybe too involved to, to go into right now. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks, good questions. All of those questions, awesome. Um, Peter, do we do we continue or what's the deal? And we can move on. So we already probably. Yeah. But thanks, awesome talk. I liked it. Thank you. One more question then. Yeah, one one more point, Kristen. Uh, on it on your third or fourth slide, uh, you were saying there's an enormous number of variables. Um, I would just. Um, add that that is proportional to the number of sensors and the types of sensors that you have. Yep, yep, okay. absolutely. Yep. That's a key, key point to make. If you only have uh, vision and it only uh, one sensor and it re measures uh, brightness, well, it's a pretty simple set of variable or just one variable. Um, basically every sensor uh, measures the intensity of something based on its type. Uh, time is involved as a second uh, variable with, that, with respect to that sensor. And the third variable response with respect to that sensor is quantity. Whenever things repeat, you have to have a quantity aspect to it. Yeah. All right, yeah. enough said.
All right, folks. Um, I think we'll right. stop there then, right, Peter? Yep. 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 Thanks Hugo. a lot. Sure. Thanks too. Hugo or Oscar? Okay. Yeah. Let me uh, share yeah, my please. screen. Hi, everybody. Can hear me? Okay. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You should see the slide deck. How much time do we have, Peter? Can someone tell me? I, I know we were initially scheduled for 11 a.m. Um, so I'm wondering how much time we have for this. Does anybody know? Patrick? Uh, uh, one moment. Uh, uh, Peter, do you, you don't know? Uh, let me check. Uh, uh, here. Uh, um, Three, four, five, six. So, so I think twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Uh, that would be including questions. Would be pretty quick. Okay. Uh, 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 Peter, uh, do you know? <laughs> uh, I think it's. Five, five minutes, I think in okay. Let's just get started. We'll, we'll try to keep yeah. it to twenty. Uh, Google, you just start. I, I think it's clearly we will give you more than twenty minutes so if oh, <laughs> we okay. have to extend at least thirty. I will say. You just go ahead. We could do 20, 30, it's fine. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I'll, I'll keep a, an eye on the time. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Hugo Latipe. I work with, uh, at Cisco with uh, Oskin, and we're doing some interesting <clears throat> AI projects um, it, that uh, leverage uh, NARS and also ERA and some of the other ideas that, that we're talking about here. Really interesting discussion. Oz, did you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yes. Hi, everyone. My name is o uh, Oz. Uh, I'm working at Cisco uh, together with Hugo on some cool projects. And as Hugo said, we are using uh, good building blocks from the AGI community. And I'm also a, an ex-grad uh, student of Paywon, uh, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> we've, had some, we've had a lot of, we'll show you some of the results that we've had using OpenRs. It's been, uh, it's been phenomenal. We also work closely with Patrick, but uh, uh, so the objective today is to uh, to sell you some networking equipment. No, <laughs> no. Um, so it, it was it was a really cool discussion. I just wanted to kind of chime in on this idea of, you know. Um, so we are doing some papers, and we've done some already uh, with with you, uh, Chris. And uh, I do agree that that um, some of the terminology, sub symbolic, symbolic, is it useful or not? My my journey into AI started in, like in the mid '80s when. I, I couldn't imagine AI without a solid foundation of uh, a model of knowledge that incorporated uh, abstraction. You know, how, does it, how do layers of abstraction work? How do you differentiate between correlation and causality? How do you, uh, you know, dis distinguish between, uh, you know, distinctions and similarities? And this is all structure. I, mean, I thought that knowledge was all about structure. And what is knowledge and what is proto-knowledge or pre, you know, what comes before knowledge? And actually that would be my answer to the question of what is sub-symbolic and symbolic. I would say some sub-symbolic is the stuff that happens before you get knowledge, right? So it's like sensor data, it's, uh, you know, it could be video data, it could be text, right? The text on the page is not knowledge in and of itself until it gets uh, you know, processed. So that's one distinction. And, and as we talk about this, you know, uh, you know running into Korsibsky's work, uh, talking about he he, he approached that he created a, mo a model of um, of knowledge that covered the abstraction and some of these ideas with the intention of um, he was around in, in, through World War One and two and his his observation was how is it that um, humans you know which have all this intelligence uh, keep getting into trouble from a societal perspective right why do we have these world wars why do where, where is it going wrong. And so we try to come up with an engineering description of what man is. Uh, in his uh, time-binding book, uh, Science and Sanity, uh, The Manhood of Humanity, uh, the idea of the manhood of humanity, I know today wouldn't be socially correct, it would be personhood. But the idea there was that, that humanity was in the infancy of being able to understand uh, the power of abstraction that we have, the intelligence that we were gifted, you know, uh, however it came about. So he wasn't looking for a, a spiritual description, but he was trying to say that, uh, under, uh, say that we need, we were kind of in the childhood of, of, uh, of this phase where we have a, a big jump in the ability to deal with abstractions, where humans can deal with infinite levels of abstractions. 
um, animals, you know, tend tend to have a very limited capability. Uh, and anyways, so so uh, if you if you look at it from that perspective, then neurosymbolic correct uh, integration of this information uh, and subsymbolic and symbolic become quite important. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so, as I mentioned, we, we have this neurosymbolic approach, um, which in part, you know, is, is based on uh, some of the things that we're learning from, from the structure of the brain, where you have the cortex and the neocortex, which is more known for the symbolic reasoning or um, the system two, which is an important thing to keep another, I think it's a good, uh, as initially defined by Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman, you know, it makes perfect sense. System one is fast processing from your sensor data, reactions, reflexes, not a lot of reasoning happening. It's kind of more event driven from the sensor data. System two is more coming in from uh, your own reasoning process. What, you know, you know, what you think you want to do, you're thinking about, uh, you know, objectives uh, that's coming from system two, much slower, you know, different things. Another, another good distinction. So we, we started out with this idea that, look, there's a lot of great things with machine learning, deep learning, but we also need to um, uh, see, Kim, how do we use reasoning? You know, how do you have cause, causal models and that sort of thing? So this was our start. We don't believe that the uh, the reptilian brain, the, 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 the fight or flight is particularly useful. We will get into a, a couple of demos real quick, but this is this pyramid here kind of uh, is something we created where L0 is gonna be your sub symbolic information coming in. It could be any kind of data, whether it's textual video or any other sensor data that you can imagine. Um, L1 is where we begin to, to link um, the prior symbols that, are, that exist in the, in the L2 space. Uh, uh, with with the the L zero raw data, so now it's not it's not exactly just raw data. Now you've actually given it a label, and then you have the abstract space of L two, which is, has infinite levels of abstraction, which is one of the distinguishing characteristics. Anytime that a human can, comes up with a, say level five million of abstraction, you can talk about that that level five million. That's five million and one. So you can just keep going up up the stack. Um, so we leverage uh, NARS for uh, in the symbolic space. You know, we we have this meta model uh, that we've implemented in, uh, in various graph databases, and we um, we have had some very interesting results uh, using NARS. And I think that there, there's some papers out there uh, showing how even without much of a meta model, you can uh, combine machine learning, deep learning with NARS, and that's the street scene. You know, a paper that we've done with Patrick and Pei. Uh, and um, it shows that you can, um, you know, you can get some interesting results with a high level rule that says something like, uh, you know, any, I care about safety, by, and the rule says something to the effect that if you, if, for moving objects, if you, if they make contact or they may make contact, any moving object, that's, that's a potential thing of interest, right? Because you could have, you know, people and vehicles and bikes shouldn't be making contact. So you can have a high level way of describing something. Also a high level way of describing functionally what is a road, right? Not just be, not, not just be a basic segmentation. So that, that worked out quite well. Uh, uh, so we have this model of knowledge, like I said, abstraction, distinction, similarity, structure. Um, and we have unsupervised learning. Um, NARS is, does learning by reasoning, which is great in the symbolic space. And it gives you, the creativity of NARS is fascinating to me. You know, I, I don't think we've really tapped into it too much with, I think last I checked, it was doing 20,000 inferences per second, or just a lot of inferences. And when you really look at uh, how it thinks, you know, how it's creative, you know, a lot of those inferences are very plausible, interesting hypotheses about what, what's happening or what could be happening. Um, and then internally, Oz and I have developed at Cisco uh, unsupervised, completely unsupervised sub-symbolic learning uh, techniques. We will we'll give a little bit of highlights on that. Uh, in addition to that, we have this model of attention, right? One model of attention could come from uh, the symbolic space where you're, you know, you're thinking about, uh, you know, whatever it is, you know, your, your conscious thought process is or things you want to do, goals that you may have from a symbolic perspective, um, as well as uh, with our you know, unsupervised learning from the sub-symbolic domain, we can, can uh, find events uh, autonomously. Uh, and so we have an attention mechanism from both the symbolic and sub-symbolic side. Uh, here's a couple of papers uh, that uh, are worth looking at if you're interested in, in some of what we're talking about. Uh, we have a new one coming out, uh, hopefully that will address some of the questions that are coming up. Um, of course, we do realize that 
if we come in and say, okay, here's here's how system one, system two, sub symbolic, symbolic, neuro symbolic, how it works, and you know, etc., that's going to be our, our our thoughts. I mean, we are in line with the original definitions from Daniel Kahneman and whatnot. We don't expect that any person in the in the field can define anything, right? So, so that's just how it is. And no one gets to really define the term. It's just like. Do people like your term? Do they take off? If they do, fantastic. If not, so I don't. I don't expect that we'll be defining terms, but hopefully this will bring some clarity. And a, a couple of high, very high-level words. Since we don't have much time, um, for those of you that are in the field commercially, you know there's a lot of hype around um, the capabilities of machine learning and deep learning. Uh, when you actually try it, um, it's not quite there, but it's a huge opportunity. Most projects are failing out there right now. Um, ML deal by itself with correlations, as you know, correlations, you know, it's it's a nice model, but half of them, you know, you're gonna have a bag of, of correlations and anti-correlations. So knowledge and anti-knowledge, uh, if you will. And it's mixed in a, in a way that sometimes is not that easy to use. So you need a little bit more structure. Um, I think a lot, a lot of us agree on these things, maybe just different implementations. Um, yeah, so we the theory that we have, we're calling this AI 2.0, but uh, let me get into some uh, a little bit more I don't know if you've seen uh, Gian LeCun's uh, comments on uh, GPT-3. I really kind of love the way he said it is, uh, you know, taking this MLDL, you know, uh, and trying to really have language understanding is like uh, trying to take an airplane to the moon, right? It's like you need a different kind of technology. That's where, what we're all talking about. Mars and AGI and ERA, you know, are all trying to address. So with that, um, let's do a little bit of a deep dive into the NLU. Oz, if you want to. Uh, yes, uh, let's move to the uh, yeah, next slide. So I would like to talk about a uh, tiny bit of the work that we are doing internally at, at Cisco. Uh, one of them is an, uh, natural language understanding. Um, so natural language understanding cannot be achieved by statistical approaches, machine learning, deep learning. Why? Because uh, MLDL is about intelligent data compression, but on the contrary, uh, natural language understanding is about data decompression because the the knowledge encoded in the the la linguistic form of communication always lacks uh, some background knowledge because the the parties uh, listening listener and the speaker they have some common background the common knowledge that they bring into it and extend decompress the uh, the, the linguistic data available and enrich it with the common knowledge and then that that uh, enables the the communication uh, let's move to the next slide uh, also uh, machine learning deep learning as you know it has a probably approximately correct assumption meaning that the learner will select the most probable hypotheses among all the other hypotheses but for uh, for a speaker of a sentence, there is no competing hypothesis. There is a unique, just one hypothesis encoded in the uh, linguistic um, data. The, the second example uh, why the MLDL may not be suitable for natural language understanding is that um, uh, one famous example is Winograd schema challenge. Uh, if you give an example sentence like this one, the trophy doesn't fit into the brown suitcase because it's too blank. Um, the statistical models will complete this uh, with uh, big is the right answer, but the small is probably the second best answer because of the high frequency coherence, which is one of the big challenges of uh, ML using the deep learning for natural language understanding, because for statistical uh, approaches, yes, they are equally probable, but for humans, that's not probable. You cannot replace big and with small in such an example. So MLDL is great for, for natural language processing, but not for understanding. Um, so what we do, we use the meta model. Uh, if we move to the second, the next slide. Uh, we, we use the meta model to bring all the building blocks. We're not replacing anything. We are bringing things together. So uh, MLDL, symbolic reasoners, ontologies, concept net, word net, all of them are building blocks uh, brought together in the meta model. And uh, as Hugo briefly mentioned, the knowledge is represented in hier hierarchical meta model and enriched by the external knowledge. Why do we need for such a model? When we first started uh, bringing things together, 
first things uh, strike us was uh, the combinatorial explosion. If you do not have a meta model that hierarchically uh, preserves the knowledge structure, we were prone to combinatorial explosion. Uh, and it, it, it's one of the issues that uh, made us evolve actually, that, that helped us to evolve into the, the, meta, the use of meta model. In the next slide, we have an example uh, of the system usage. Uh, for example, if a user, it says how many routers with Nexus operating system have more than five issues in the network? If, if this sentence is uttered or, or input, uh, the other party must have a lot of background knowledge, such as what is Nexus, what is operating system, the network, which network is being referred. So through set of multiple services, we, uh, we process this language, linguistic uh, information. Of course, we use the deep learning and, and the machine learning models and, and uh, external ontologies. So we get data from ConceptNet, DBpedia, or get the contextual information, which is actually the focus of attention. Um, and also we have uh, modules that represent the, the, the network, uh, uh, the learns from the, uh, the architecture of the network and bringing all these uh, models, the, the building blocks together, the system can able to produce some uh, answers such as, there are seven routers with Nexus operating system that have more than five issues. Uh, this, is a, this is a quick example of how we uh, bring together everything in the meta model. Um, Hugo will, uh, let, let's move to the next slide. So that was your last slide, I think. Oh, okay, thank you. Did you, did you have another one that you, that you were thinking of? Uh, no, no, no. Let's 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 continue. Okay. So um, here's another quick, you know. So that's one applied case. I want to show you a live demo of some uh, of the uh, capabilities that we have, kind of in the video space, and I'll show you something in the uh, dealing with time series. So I'm going to skip this, but we we had a concept here um, about uh, how would you apply this technology for. Uh, identifying and helping find missing people. You can do queries on large numbers of cameras, you know, using the, the knowledge that you, that you have of what's happening in the cameras. You can filter uh, based on a, a natural language query. You can start getting descriptions of the, of the pre-filtered uh, videos, you know, based on what you're searching for here. Here we have a, a woman and a girl wearing white hoodies. Um, we'll also show how um, in the case of that the person changes their clothes that you also can do re-identification. Of course, everything we do, we prioritize privacy, you know. So here, here we wanted to show how the re-identification uh, can do this. And again, we don't have anyone's, you know, personally identifiable information to make any of this happen. Um, another example that we have is, is uh, coming up in one second. This is something, um, you know, showing a kind of traffic situation how you know you've seen the bounding boxes and also tracking you know which is which we have is pretty state of the art tracking but also we have the reasoner here I think we... oh sorry is it not sharing oh it stopped sharing no we, we we've been seeing something oh you were okay uh, so Oz, what were you saying sorry maybe we lost you can you reshare yeah. Boz, are you there? Did we lose you? Maybe uh, Oz. Okay. Um, so what I was showing here was that um, here you have, uh, there's a paper that was written on this one. Let me see if I can play this again. Resume. Okay. Um, and so with NARS, you're able to give it some high level rules and it's able to identify when there's potential dangerous situations, right? So you just, and also it's able to learn where the roads, sidewalks and whatnot are going beyond just the uh, uh, video analytics. It actually does it by looking at functionality of space. Uh, and here you can describe, you know, not only say, hey, there may be a, a situation there, but you can describe and assess if there's a need for emergency uh, personnel uh, to, sh to show up at a particular place. So that's one example of a technology that's powered by 
by NARS and, and this meta model idea that we have. And this is, um, this is not a theory, it's actually out there. Um, it's not perfect, you know, we de definitely have some work to do, but it's been out, um, we first deployed this, I believe it was about uh, two years ago, actually. Um, so the other one I wanted to show you briefly is um, time series analysis, right? So, so we've developed something uh, that allows you to handle hundreds of thousands or millions of time series. You know, on one server, you could do 10 million time series. So this would be things like uh, obviously medical data, telemetry data, you know, you can even get derived uh, parameters from video showing where people are, you know, the behaviors and movements and, 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 and in a un completely unsupervised way, it builds a descriptive model of what's happening. Uh, I'll give you an example here. So imagine that you happen to have a data center, you know, uh, could be on a ship, but it could be any data center. If you, uh, if you have, our, you know, it's, in this case, you can get telemetry from the, from the system. Uh, as your process, as, as this technology processes that and reasons about uh, this unsupervised learning that you're getting, it is, it's able to uh, detect events and then try to reason about what was the, um, the cause of that event. And so you can see that in this case, an event was detected, you got, a, and then it zooms in on the data center. In this case, you're able to, uh, uh, to see messages from the system saying, okay, you know, the CPU two is overheating. It could be a fire situation. It could analyze it. Uh, in this case, it was a uh, uneven tra uh, traffic allocation, you know, that, that happens, you know, on occasion, um, uh, equal cost uh, routing, uh, and then it reconfigures and it takes care of the problem. But it could be medical data, it could be, you know, just any, any data whatsoever. This, the algorithms are completely agnostic um, to, uh, to anything else. So we're about out of time here, but uh, I think, I, I think we basically, that, that's kind of what we want to go. We have some I mean, back. I mean, we have a few minutes here, here so we, we can continue. Okay. Or reserve it for questions, it's up to you. Um, yeah, maybe just say a word about, about the, how this works, you know, because it's kind of a, a crazy claim, right, to say that you can take millions of time series in an unsupervised way to learn. But I just want to give you a, a brief insight into what's happening. So um, what we're doing here, and, and we have some papers that, that kind of describe. So there's a way of, um, of looking at one time series and, and saying, okay, um, in this one time series, the behavior has changed. So for example, if you're looking at accelerometer data from your phone or your gyroscopes that are in your phone, uh, other sensor data, you could detect, for example, that in one, you know, you're walking and then now you're running. And so the time series fundamentally change when you go from a walking mode to a running mode or for, if a power supply you know, is overheating, they behave differently when they're overheated. So all those things are regime changes that can be detected you know, with, with algorithms that we have. Um, and so how do you build, how do you handle millions of these things? It turns out there's a very efficient way to detect when a time series is changing its behavior. No, this is not an anomaly, right? Anomaly is a single point in time. A regime change says that, the, that there was a, a change in the ongoing behavior of the time series. They behave walking in ones, running in the other. It's not an anomaly that's like one, one spike. Okay, once you have that, and we can do it at scale of 10 million, uh, you know, uh, time series at a time on, on, a, on a pretty small server, um, then what you can do is you can begin to correlate <clears throat> across all those time series and say, well, you know, something important seems to have happened because 1000 time series all had a regime change at exactly the same time. And so that's what we do. We kind of just kind of look at these regime changes. We say, well, you know, whether it's financial data, whatever it is, something probably happened there <laughs> because you don't normally see 1000 things have a fundamental change in the way they behave at the same time. Um, and then that's a descriptive model that we build up. Um, and it's a hypothesis, of course, you know, to say that, you know, we don't, when we detect something like that, we say 1000 uh, time series out of, you know, um, 1 million, you know, had all simultaneously did something. Something probably happened, you know, it could, but it could also be a coincidence, right? It's not necessarily something critical, but you can also have semantics about what these time series are. Um, and then you can also build the predictive model that way, right? You can say, well, every time that these, uh, you know, 100 time series have a regime change or this kind of time series have a regime change, then we notice that every five minutes later, this other thing happens, it's even bigger, right? So you can begin to, to have causal hypothesis and uh, we're finding it works quite well. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. So I wanted to say a couple of words about how that works. I don't know, Oz, if you're back yet. Uh, yes, I'm here. Good. So we had a connection problem? Yes, I lost my connection. 
So yeah, I would like to open it up for questions. If not, I mean, we do have some more slides on AI 2.0 and how that works in more detail, but you know, I don't want to bore you. You know, we're gonna we'll make these slides available. The papers are out there if you want to, if you have any questions about it. But yeah, it'd be cool if you have any any questions. If not, uh, thank you for your time. All right. Thank you very much. Tom. Okay. Uh, I can share my screen. Please. Okay. All right. Just a minute. Okay. All right, you guys can see my screen. Okay, let me. Here we can. This way. Okay, great. All right. Thank you, Peter. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Thomas Lu. Uh, with at Chow, we are with uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, and California Institute of Technology. Today, I'd uh, like to talk about a project. Uh, we worked with uh, Temple University together uh, to build a explainable AI for first responder safety. Right, so uh, part of work is uh, in deep learning part that we did. And then part of work is in the NAS part that's a very Nicely, they, they combine together uh, AI and the deep learning. So I'm going to introduce that uh, this project and also talk about the explainability part. Uh, that's kind of a concern about the, the deep learning more than the, the NAS because NAS is a, a easier to explain, but for deep learning, it's not that easy uh, for, for explaining it. All right. So just quickly introduction, and then TruePaw, uh, we call it TruePaw, it's a trusted and explainable AI for saving lives. Uh, we emphasize on trusted and explainability because uh, this is uh, for saving lives. So, so you, you have to be very accurate or very reliable, otherwise people don't want to use it. Uh, so the system architecture part, and then also TruePaw explainability research, we are still working on it. So this is not a done uh, research, but we have seen some uh, good results out of it. And then we'll do some uh, demos uh, from the, this project. Okay, so first I'd like to acknowledge uh, the team. Uh, so this, this is founded by uh, Department of Transportation, uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, okay. Uh, so first acknowledge them for their funding and the support. And then Ed Chow is the program man manager and I'm the PI and tax manager. And at JPL, we have uh, Dr. Yun as algorithm lead and Alex Huyin as a software and system engineering lead. And then at JPL, we have uh, quite a bit, a lot of students working with us for the last year and especially in the summer. Daniel, Jacques, Kevin Yu, Kevin Lee, Jessica, Vicky, Evelyn, Michael, and Aya. I'd like to acknowledge all of their contributions. And also Temple University, uh, Professor Pei Wang is the lead for the NAS team. And then we have Patrick uh, when he was still a PhD student, but now Dr. Patrick Wong, uh, Hammer is here also, Peter, Mina, and the Christian. All right, and also Miami-Dade Police Department, we have the Major uh, George Pereira. He provides a lot of uh, input on the use cases and scenarios and also, also provide a test for us. So this is a really good team uh, together. All right, very quickly, I'd like to talk about the problem. Uh, in United States, uh, it costs us uh, amazingly $35 billion annually for 
for vehicles, emergency vehicle as an accident, you, you don't see this so big. Uh, fatality caused by collision are almost five times higher for emergency responders than the national average. And the police officers have roughly double the rate of motor vehicle crashes than general public. So you can see this kind of thing. Uh, actually, what they found is uh, it's not just uh, when you are rushing to an accident scene, you, you get involved yourself into an accident, but just routine uh, kind of uh, operations like for police, you know, routine surveillance and the driving, a lot of times they, they just run into something, uh, getting to a, a accident. So this is a problem. Uh, we'll talk about why. And then uh, it shows that digital alerting really uh, helps to avoid the, the roadside collisions. All right, so here you can see, you know, in the police vehicle, you get more and more instruments in it. Of course, you know, you, you, you have more uh, instruments in the pilot uh, cockpit in an airplane, but it's ergonomically designed. So it's a lot of automations, a lot of uh, ergonomics considering it, but in police vehicle, you don't have anything like that. They just line up or whatever, wherever they can find a place to, 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 ple uh, to place these type of instruments. And it, uh, amazingly, you know, you still have a, a, a screen and a keyboard and everything for your computer. So when you are going to look for a, a suspect, uh, you have to type and uh, you have to do all these kind of things. So while driving, so this is why they are more and more accident. Uh, plus you have a cell phone. Sometimes the uh, police also check cell phones. Um, so here is, uh, our goal is to develop a AI system that can assist the police vehicles. Of course, it's not uh, uh, limited to police. Uh, our first prototype is towards police. So we get all these type of uh, sensors. It could be data, could be signals from uh, traffic, uh, radars, detectors from uh, onboard sensors and the cameras, and also PSAP is a public safety alert uh, system, and also from com computers and the radio. So the true pole will take all these uh, signals and the data and then make sense out of it. So the deep learning system would try to make the sub-symbolic uh, signals into a symbolic signals and then pass it to the NAS system and NAS reason and make a hypothesis and then provide a 360 degree situational awareness and then risk assessment and then prioritize action items. So we don't want to overwhelm the, the driver with all kinds of recommendations. So we need to prioritize it and then give them some kind of interface so that they can uh, drive while you no know, still communicating with the uh, true pause system uh, to avoid uh, accident. Here is uh, some kind of some use cases that we have developed with uh, the the Miami Dade Police Department. Of course, one is intersection safety. A lot of times they run uh, red light. They have to go through the red light uh, in order to to quickly get to the accident scene. So you can see multiple agencies, you know, uh, like uh, EMS, you know, fire department and the police, uh, they all rushing to the scene at the same time. All right, so they, that creates some kind of chaos. And another thing is the roadside safety. So a lot of times they, they, they have a roadside uh, kind of uh, stop and then someone hit on their rear end, all right? Drunk drivers or someone not paying attention. Uh, another thing is the hazard sign. Once they get to the scene, they want to know exactly what's going on and what kind of chemicals it is there. They, it's not safe for them to go very close. So uh, we can help on that side and then giving them advice what to do with uh, the hazardous material. And the first aid, sometimes uh, when EMS not there, no paramedics not there yet, but there are some uh, injured people, then you may need to have give some guidance. The last one is the, the electrical vehicle guidance because now it, more and more accidents get involved with electrical vehicle with high powered batteries. How do you handle that? So 
So these are the new problems, right? So uh, Trupal can help all these type of things, and then we would try to evaluate it. Um, the first phase is to use a Kala driving simulator instead of driving around the street. Uh, use this uh, simulator is really very good. And then we have a deep learning system that takes all the signals and then convert them into symbols and then give it to the NAS reasoning system to make reasoning and recommendations. And then there's a Trupal app we developed to communicate with uh, the police, with chatbot and all this natural language type of interface. All right. So this is a little bit more detail about the, the system. The Kala provides 360 degree camera, video frames, ranging, ranging data from uh, uh, radar, LIDAR, and then also GPS location. And then it performs object detection and tracking, and then send all these uh, information about the vehicle person, traffic signs, traffic signals, and then their location, speed, acceleration, direction, and all this to NAR system. And then NAR will perform all these reasonings and then uh, also get information from a knowledge database. If you have a also traffic database that you can pull those information in and then give recommendations, the warning uh, to the police and then with this uh, app. All right, I'll quickly go through some of the uh, components. You know, here is a Kala simulator. This is a 3D uh, graphical simulator, which is really good. I just go through very quickly. It can generate different type of uh, traffic uh, scenarios. You see this is also different uh, vehicles in, a, in the same traffic, same, you can generate it. Uh, Christian Ham has, contribute quite a bit on this. And you can have rainy days, sunset, uh, different uh, locations, uh, very nice uh, actually. And then it give you also modeling capabilities. So if you want to customize a certain intersection, so you can do all these customizations with uh, all the libraries that you can use uh, instead of using the, the generic ones. You can also map it to a certain area uh, of your city. So here is uh, some simulations. You can see it's the 3D models that you can set speed, you can direction, and then traffic pattern. Uh, this is uh, to simulate the real environment. So you can see on the left side is the real scenario uh, when a police car turning left, and then there's a, another car is hitting it. So we can recreate this type of uh, scenarios. Uh, here is another one uh, in a, a snowy sea, uh, time and then the, the truck just could not stop and then hit, uh, hit the police car. So this, we have recreated this uh, even with the weather type of, a, uh, and this is again, because of the, uh, the there's a, a lot of uh, cars blocking the view. So you can see that the, the police get hit by the second car turning left, all right. All right, this is uh, simulating uh, roadside driving. You can see this is, uh, uh, the car is hitting from the rear uh, side of a, a police car. All right, quickly go through the, the object detection and the tracking part. We use the AYOLO V4 uh, deep learning model. And then uh, we, we can do some retraining of this because YOLO v4 is trained on uh, some generalized uh, database. So this is for traffic. So we, we perform the automatic training and testing database generation using Kala. And then it can automatically generate all these objects and then put it into different scenarios, you know, day and the night and all this different environment. And then we generated like around 4,400 4, training data and then uh, total around 5,000, 6,000 uh, uh, different objects, and then retrain the network um, through transfer learning. And then it, and this is a 
for drunk drivers, we want to track the car and see if it's kind of wavering. If it's wavering, that means you know, this person is drunk. So we need to pay attention to that. So we have created some algorithm to uh, track the, the vehicle and then see if it's wavering. Uh, if it's wavering, we need to give a warning. And then because the video has a limited uh, distance, uh, so we also employ the, the radar signal on top of the video uh, to detect objects like uh, 300 meters away instead of just a 100 meter if you use only video. All right, uh, the AGI part, the NAS part since you know, uh, Patrick, uh, Peter, uh, Nina and the Christian, they are all here. So I'm not going to talk about this side. If you have any questions, you can ask them. Uh, I'll talk about the explainability of, uh, of the deep learning side. Uh, the reason for that, as I said, you know, we need to build a trust between the driver and the, the AI system. Otherwise, they're going to turn off the, the AI. They, they don't want to use it if they cannot trust it. So the first thing is for deep learning, uh, it becomes so complex that you, you, you can easily get hundreds of layers. Like uh, the YOLO v4 is not a very complex network, but it's already uh, 140 hidden layers in this inside this. So nobody knows what's going on inside. And if you give an input, it just spit out the output and say, I, I see a car with a confidence of 80%. Uh, believe it or not, no, this is basically what they, they, they give you. But you don't know why it gives you the, the, the car and with this confidence. So that's a, a big problem for for us, even for you no, know, for us at the NASA, we cannot accept this type of a, uh, reasoning of, of the, the the results. We need to know why, and we need to uh, verify and validate it. So this is the research that we are we have ongoing. And then what we do here in in this project, we open up the YOLO v4 and then check on each layer and see what happens uh, in each layer why it gives you this kind of output, right? So here's a, a set of test, test data we, we do. We generate a, lot, a number of cars. We have a hundred images of different cars. And then we have this original image. We, then we cut out the wheels and then we also put wheels on. So this is a, like a, each image we separate into three separate images. And then we went, go through the neural network, and then see which one turns on when you have you see a wheel. When it turns off, when you don't have a wheel, that means this particular neuron is responsible for detecting wheels because wheels are a unique feature of a car. So if you see wheels, definitely you you, you are very confident there's a car there. All right, even you see only half of it. So we, what we found is uh, there are a lot of uh, neurons that are responsible for it. So when we run 100 images, you know, they are like a filter number 145. That's in the convolutional neural net layer. 145, 96% of the time, it, it turns on when it sees a wheel. When it, it doesn't see a wheel, it turns off. So that really gives you this particular neuron is responsible for, for for wheels, uh, this no. Th these are the uh, ten different neurons that uh, are very, licks are very high on wheels. So here you can see when you have a car there, it turns on when the wheels showed up, and then if you cut the wheels out, it disappeared. So that means this neuron really gives you the the, the uh, wheels information. All right, here are some other uh, cars you, you put it in. You can see always the red part is uh, the, the uh, uh, activation part and then blue is inhibition. So you can see that these are pretty good. And then we also check on different things like a license plate, uh, front bumpers and you know, headlights and all this. Uh, so we, we found all these neurons responsible for different part of the car. 
So now we can start checking which neuron is which responsible for what. Let's say you have your output says there's a car, 80% of uh, confidence there's a car, then we can check is there a wheel there or if there's a front bumper or a uh, license plate and all these that can support this, uh, uh, this claim, all right? We also can show you know, this neuron is responsible for what type of uh, objects. So here, you know, like uh, this particular neuron, uh, convolution layer 86 and filter three is responsible for giraffe. So you can see always when you have an input of giraffe, it will be activated, all right? And then here is uh, some like windows and the uh, car, this particular one, 86, 335, is responsible for cars, right? So now we can start explaining what's happened inside this black box and then why it gives you the, the output when you show an input in it. Uh, so this is uh, actually a, a kind of a, a generic uh, convolutional neural net. You have convolutional layers and dense layers in the output. So we can start uh, explaining all these you know, with, with this. So with that, actually what we can get is uh, uh, mapping the activation and in inhibition and enhanced prominent neurons. Now you know which neuron is really high in wheels. Now, now we can enhance it. We can also prone neural net work with those dead neurons not responsible for any features. Uh, we can also do self-organizing map. Now you can say, okay, there are wheels, but they, they have uh, something else. Like uh, uh, with, uh, if it's bicycle, it's different. So now you can recombine the, 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 the handlebar with wheels. Now you, you can uh, detect, you can detect uh, bicycles, uh, all these kind of new, uh, combinations of features. Uh, you can also increase the expandability because now you can explain it. Also testability because now every neuron is defined as testable and in increase the trustability in the end. Right. So this is an ongoing project. Uh, we are still working on the research part of it. Uh, here are some results and we're gonna quickly go through. Um, so here is a, the NAS has a, a database about the street uh, accident rate. So you can say, okay, this intersection is very risky. So be careful. So the street is risky. This is from the database uh, of information. And this particular one, uh, thanks to Patrick and uh, Peter, uh, getting all these NAS uh, to be integrated with uh, Chupo. This is a, Again, this is a risky street. Let me see, I need to get to another one. There are two first responders entering the intersection at the same time. So NAS decided you know, to let one first responder to uh, stop, let the other one to pass. So they don't collide each other. Right. So here it says, uh, there's an expected first responder. Here is a, a car, it's driving high speed uh, next to the outer lane. So it gives a, a warning. Uh, the warning is you know, about 2.7 seconds. We, we measured, uh, it gives a, a warning. So we have 2.7 seconds for the first responder to jump out. Uh, this one is a, a drunk driver. You can see the car is weaving. Uh, so it says weaving car. So when it says weaving car, then no, the, it gives the first responder about uh, seven seconds to react to it. All right. So the last one, I like to talk a little, no, very quickly about the chatbot and the, the Chupo app. Uh, so our, our team have developed the very comprehensive uh, the, the app site you know, with multiple NAS agents, multiple vehicles, and multiple people using it. And this is a 
notification or the warning not, uh, messages. And then this is a map. You can see the map where the, the first responders are, the vehicles and the, and the people on foot. Uh, this is uh, integrated with the uh, With the app. Warning, warning. So it provides a voice warning. warning. Also on the map, you can see it. And then you can also see it on this. So it's a multiple different size, different way of warning it. All right. So this one is. Warning, 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 warning. So warning. right now it's very simple. Warning. Just say warning. But warning. The, actually the. The first responders like to, to be more specific, all right? So you can see this is the police car and then you, you see this uh, drunk driver and then it gives a warning when it sees a weavering car, all right? Okay, and then uh, this is the MENAS part, uh, you know, uh, detecting signs and recognizing the the ID, UN ID number, and then pull from uh, uh, the, the database, what is the, the, the guidelines, right? Uh, this is uh, to detect it and then uh, give the numbers. Uh, this is a, a chat bot. Okay, getting the test version of AI chat bot is available on the four-digit UN ID. One zero one six. Searching for the UNID ten sixteen. How can we evaluate? This is for guidance one hundred nineteen category public safety and sub. All right. So it first you know uh, you can tell the the chatbot what is uh, the UNID number. You can also let the chatbot to automatically search and uh, look for the UNID number. And then you can also communicate with the, uh, the chatbot on where you want to look for. Because uh, if sometimes the guideline is very long, so you, you, you want to save time, not to, yeah. Okay, this, uh, this is the first, first uh, aid. Talk to AI chat. Okay, getting the test version of AI chatbot. Please say the four-digit UNID number for hazmat placarded. A man 40 years old on scene appears not to be breathing, not moving, and not responding to any stimulation. For hands-only CPR, place the heel of your hand on the breastbone at the center of the person's chest. Place your other hand on top. All right. So this is a for first aid uh, guidance. Uh, okay, this is a for electric vehicle. Currently, uh, the Department of Transportation has not really made a guidance yet. So we basically make make a kind of placeholder for it. Talk to AI chat. Okay, getting the test version of AI chatbot. Please say the four digit UNID number for hazmat placarded. Okay, getting the test version of AI at the moment, there are no specific procedures for dealing with electric vehicles, but be aware that the batteries contain high voltage and improper handling can be dangerous or lethal. All right. Okay. All right. In summary, um, uh, this Trupal project demonstrates the capabilities to provide a timely crash warning. Uh, current phase is in simulated uh, uh, mode with the CALA simulator, but next step we're going to use the real signals and also on the street. Uh, so it provides a human machine interface and also generate dynamic traffic scenarios. Uh, we can simulate the test to reduce number of physical tests and also explainable deep learning capabilities. All right, thank you so much. And any questions or any uh, discussions?
Mm -hmm. If not, then we can have a lunch or we can have questions for other speakers about that. Because we have still like uh, about 10 minutes remaining. Yeah, we got a question here. The question is, how far do you might think these are the ability to deploy such a thing to help even in very specific situations or locations, how far out in terms of years, for instance, as a measure? Mm. You mean that the maturity of the technology, right? That's the way uh, you say how trend, Another translation of the question. Right, okay, yeah. This, uh, no, we, this is the first phase. So we have developed this system, integrated it, and then tested on the, the simulator. That's the color simulation system. Uh, it's very nice because it can generate all kinds of, uh, all kinds of scenarios without risking the car. Uh, so that is really successful. And we, we let the, the policemen uh, from Miami-Dade to test it. They, they really like it. Of course, this is a very simple version. So it's not a very sophisticated, it's not a product, but they see the potential about, about it. So the next phase will be uh, put it on the vehicle uh, and then get the, the real signals. So that's another test level for it. So I will say like two, two to three years, at least to get in, into a product. Uh, this is a, mostly a technology development at this moment. Okay, good question answered. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? One more. Yeah, hello. All right. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about some uh, the system takes a lot of inputs and then, like I said, processes the lower level features and then the NARS takes the, on a high level reasoning. Mm -hmm. Is the user input uh, uh, then taken as like basically is there a loop going through so that the feedback from the user of the system is then taken as input and then modifies the further behavior? Right. Yeah, I think that that's a very good question. Uh, first, you know, uh, right now we have a we have a chatbot, so it's kind of a uh, it's a it's a both way kind of a communications. Uh, NAS can no once we have this uh, natural language uh, no processing, NAS can understand what it is, and then NAS can start building new rules of it, uh, and also the the deep learning system can also learn new things. Uh, there are a lot of data. No, data is a kind of a, uh, there are quite a lot of different type of data uh, available, but you know, where we are going to start and then what we want to get the, the network to learn. So this is the same as the last uh, uh, speaker you know, talk about, you have to be very specific. That's why like a Google Assistant or, or Siri, they are kind of generally learning everything. So they are not good at everything, but they, they learn everything. So this is a, like a specialized uh, assistant that you teach it on a specific scenario, and then you can you know, modify it, and then you can improve it on this particular scenario or uh, a new scenario. But you know, this is, so we, we have to make it uh, kind of a self-learning uh, kind of capability in it. Okay, yeah, thank you. Because it seems like the feedback of the user is important in building trust uh, in the right. system. And, uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Sometimes, uh, no, like, like we did, sometimes the, the police, you know, they, when they drive 35 miles an hour uh, across the, the, the intersection, uh, we need to give a warning. But let's say if the police doesn't like it, you know, just keep doing it, or say shut up, then you have to shut up. Otherwise, he's going to turn you off, right? So you have to learn to, to react yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's a very good example that summarizes it. And if our goal is to have that system be widely used, it must uh -huh. learn to, in your words, shut up when it's told to. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Thank right. you so much. Okay.
Okay, thank you. Already. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Thomas. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right, I see Christian here. Hi, Christian. So lunchtime, guys. All right, lunchtime. So we have a lunch time and then we will rejoin for the tutorial at 1 30. Sounds good. Okay, bye bye. All right. Thank All you right. very much, everyone.
Hello? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. All right. Sorry, I'm in the mask. So I'm indoor. There are other people here. So I would have better stay in the mask. Um, I think we shall continue. Let me close the door. Right. So the later part today is starting with a, let me share the screen first, with an NARS tutorial and then followed by NARS overview, implementation of NARS overview. Uh, how to present here. <clears throat> Right. Give me one second. All right, so we're here. Shall we start? I mean, if you can hear me well, then I can start. Um, So uh, this is about more conceptual overview of NARS, but the theory of NARS, what it means and how does it function. So first we're starting with defining or talking about the intelligence. So what is intelligence? What's considered to be intelligence? So first, like what is not intelligence? Innate behavior or instinct is not intelligence, right? Exhaustive search when you just try to search an element out of uh, out of the available elements, it's also not an intelligence. Like basic information retrieval, like querying, it's also like uh, not an intelligence. If you have a human who basically creates the query, routines repeated are basically a coded algorithm, which is not intelligence. As as usual, so algorithm following numerical calculations, any sorting, any mapping, any any other types of calculations is also not an intelligence. Basically, algorithms programmed by humans. Now, so how is intelligence interpreted in the communities? So mainstream AI treats intelligence as a collection of problem specific and domain specific parts. So basically they have a set of problem instead of domain and try, try their programs to perform good in those problem and all those domains. And they call those programs intelligence. That's their view of intelligence for, for the mainstream AI. So AGI, however, takes intelligence as a general purpose capability that should be treated as a whole. So I, for AGI, for artificial general intelligence, so intelligence becomes a more broad, more general purpose that can adopt and can incorporate more domains, multi-domains uh, and multi-problem specific things. And however, still AGI research still includes different research objectives and strategies. For us, for NARS team especially, so intelligence is the capability of a system to adapt to environment and to work with insufficient knowledge and resources. So we truly believe that the intelligence system can apply to a wide range of domains. And if it doesn't have knowledge, it has to adapt to something it's never seen encountered before. So, and that's we call assumption of sufficient knowledge and resources. And under that, so we have to understand that uh, we have always finite processing capacity. We're working in real time and the system always have to be open to unexpected tasks and things. That's the main three things for the assumption of sufficient knowledge and resources or IACOR. Later, probably I will refer it as to be an IACOR. So then having that assumption, we have to find out what's the framework for a general reasoning system, for any reasoning system that can perform good using, using that assumption. So first it has to be language for the representation. It has to be semantics of the language. Uh, so it has to be some sets of rules, predefined rules. It has to have some structure to store the information. So in this case, we have a memory structure and we have an overall 
I don't know, not an algorithm, but overall thing to connect and unite it and function the things. So we call it control mechanism. So once we have those points established, so we, we have uh, advantages of the such a system, such basically it's become independent on the domain. It has very rich expressive power. It has a justifiability of the rules, so the rules can be explained, and it has flexibility in combining the rules. Sorry, I will open the door. One second. Right. Um, however, once we establish such a system which can adapt, we have some issues, some very fundamental issues. Um, if you can see this, probably while we're not trying to model humans, but it operates similarly to some of the aspects of human cognition. So under ICAR, the system really cannot guarantee absolute correctness. It also cannot provide a universal optimal solution anymore. Just question yourself, for example, you're playing a goal game and you ask to make a move, you have the short amount of time to think and you will just have a move, right? You, you don't probably, this might be not your best move, or you may be capable of having a better move in terms of the game cell situation, but you get you you actually executing the move because of the time restrictions and your resources. So same here, basically we can no longer guarantee the correctness and optimality of the solution. However, we still provide some solution for the for the problem or for the for the given in the given experience. If, so in the in, in, in the same prospect then what the standard of validity or rationality? Uh, how is, is our decision rational or is our choice valid? So now validity and rationality basically becomes relative to the available knowledge and resources. So it's basically relevant to the knowledge in current systems experience. And the desired features from here becomes general, adaptive, flexible, and robust and scalable. So now we have for the non-axiomatic reasoning system, which is NARSIS. NARSIS actually has a logic part and control part. And the logic means it has the, it has the logic, like uh, all the logic rules to, to really trace and, and make the inference and derivation, produce the derivations. So NAR, NARSIS is fully based on ICAR. And NARS has a designed a meta level and acquired object level. So, um, speaking of NARS, we always have to speak about tasks, terms, and statements. Um, think of the logical statement over here as S looks like implies P, but in NARS we call it inheritance copula. In term logic, actually, uh, it's it called inheritance copula, inheritance. So we have, a, we have a statement, S inherits P over here, right? Oh, sorry. Uh, and the statement has two terms, S and P. And basically it can be the example on the right is water is liquid. So inheritance can be tr translated to English or interpreted in English as an is, is a relational is. So water is liquid, as S is P, so S inherits P. So there are two terms, S, term S and term, term P. In the future, whenever we start to process these things, S and P becomes concepts and they're named by the uh, by the term name. So concept name S, concept name P, right? And then also, as you can see, can uh, represent a relationship, specialization, generalization relationship. Uh, so that that arrow is co called inheritance copulas. Basically, copulas is something that connects terms and uh, statements consist of terms and copulas, right? And in particular, this inheritance copula is a reflective and transitive. What it means? So, for example, if it's transitive, if S S inherits P, and over here it can be and P inherits D, for example, then the system can easily deduce using deduction that S uh, inherits D, right? And then imagine, so for example, we have a bunch of statements like that: S inherits P, for example, W inherits X, whatever, in the system. Right, then transitive closure of that. So we can really compute all the transitions and, and, and closure of that is basically the, 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 the key star. It's all of the knowledge of the system in the given time, right? Um, and then we here uh, can already define the very primitive binary truth value because in ours, truth value is a key 
plays a key role of the of providing derivations and give, giving us the results. So we can define the binary truth value as a statement can be true if either in that transitive closure or it has the form, which is tautology, that is here x inherent x or s inherent s. If it's not either of these two cases, so basically it's not in the trunk in the in the k star, then it's false. Right. So key things to learn here. So we do have a statement, and we also already start uh, talking about the truth value. So we kind of now defining the truth value of the statement. Um, going a little bit further, we have the, an extension, an extension, where we have to define them. So if you if you know that, if you, okay, over, over here. If we can see the term here, S inherent P, right? So there is an extension of a term, which is on the, on the extension of a term. So for the, for the term P, as it is its extension, right? So that's the mathematical definition that's from the set theory. So if term is here, right? It's extension something that uh, before it, I mean, that's, that, that, that's extension. It's intention something after it, after the copula in this case. So in this case, uh, in, this, in this examples, extension for P is S and intention for S is P, right? And that's of course theorem, is, is very easy to prove, but we don't need, even need to prove that here. So now we have to define the, 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 the term and its relation to its extension and its intention. So the term in truth value is defined in terms of those extension and intention. Now, having that intention and extension of the terms, we can, we can define an evidence. What's an evidence? So we can have positive evidence, we can have ne negative evidence, and we can have the total evidence, right? So there is the same S inherent P override, right? And just imagine there are, there are other terms or other statements here, which basically be, be an extension of S, some be an intention of P and vice versa, right? So we can define the positive evidence. It's, it, it's a very conceptual thing. As a set of all terms such that uh, they are extension of S and extension of P union, intention of P uh, and intention of S. So basically that uh, corresponds to that green error. If you can see that something is on the intention of S and intention of P and extension of S and extension of P all together, that's a basically positive evidence, right? So the other, other ways you can say that both the, 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 these are related to both of the terms and very primitive explanations, if you're not familiar with it, right? And the negative evidence is basically the difference. So uh, extension of S minus extension of P, which in this case that uh, red square, right? It can be multiple terms here, but it's just abstraction. And also intention of P minus int intention of S, it becomes only that abstract. Union of those two, that's the negative evidence, right? So we can define the evidence like the positive, negative, and the total evidence can be defined as the negative evidence plus the positive evidence, right? Of course, as a computer programming implementation, there are multiple ways to really implement things, but on a conceptual level, that really helps to understand, and that's really the theory behind the NARS working. Oh uh, yes, you can ask a question. What's your what's the intuition for negative? I think I generally get a sense of the intuition for positive evidence, but what's the intuition for negative evidence? Count uh, first of all, provide the counter evidence, and 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 there define a truth value and see how the truth value really differs because we're coming here to the definition of the truth value, and the truth value has to first of all the degree de degree of belief. And then, uh, how much I can believe to what it's what what's there in the system? Uh, so the basically we can we can start the chain over here. Um, we need the statement and uh, all those things in order to define the truth value, primitive truth value, right? Then we need extension and intention in order to define an evidence. So we need to, we need to define an evidence in order to get finally to get to the truth value, which I'm which I'm getting here, right? So the in traditional system, the truth value of a statement is basically measures its agreement with the reality. So basically how, how close it can represent 
the the fact, the objective fact. How close it close to the reality, right? In ours, the truth really represents has nothing to do with the reality. Well, hopefully it does, but <laughs> technically, uh, in ours, truth value is basically um, it measures the evidential support of the statement. So how the evidence, how how the statement really corresponds to the experience of the system, or to the experience or to the evidence, uh, whichever surrounds the the, the, the relations of the given, given, given statement to the overall system experience. That's the truth value in NARS. Um, and truth value in NARS has basically two things, frequency and confidence, both of them from ranging from zero to one. And again, it measures the evidential support of the statement. It doesn't measure how truth is to, to the reality, but it defined in terms of relation of that statement to the experience of the system or conceptual experience. Um, now, we, we already know that what's positive evidence, what's negative evidence, right? What's total evidence over here? Now we can go here and see. Sorry, sorry. Mm, something. Okay. See that frequency is something that positive evidence we divide by total evidence. And of course, total evidence is always bigger than positive evidence. We get them from zero to one. Um, confidence, on the other hand, is that total evidence divided by the total evidence plus some constant. In, in our case, we have a parameter one. So now to a question, right? So you can say that you can see the ribbon is black, right? So you have the seen at once and you can think of now frequencies probably how many times you've been observing it. So your frequency becomes once, but how confident you are, right? If you, if you can see the ribbon, okay, confidence also becomes once because you have total evidence one. Right now, the second time you see the you see the raven is white, you also have the frequency one, but also confidence. The total evidence become two divided by two plus one, which is already drastically falling. Of course, the, the, the more you're seeing the raven is black, then you have the negative evidence the raven is black, which is raven is white. Then if you have thousands of raven is black, then probably your confidence does not decrease at all. So you, you believe that in most cases, in 99% raven is black. But that's that's the key thing in R, so the, the truth value is a degree to be of belief of the statement, not, not the, its agreement with the reality. And degree of believing comes from experience in the system. That's an important thing. Um, so truth value produced. So experience basically is a stream of statements or events with truth value where the confidence went from zero to one. Yes, every derivation, so we have the truth functions and we have the logical functions, so logical rules to basically produce a derivation and it has to have the truth value attached to it. So it has to be computed, which we'll cover it a little bit later. So, and each inference rule has a truth value functions and the truth value of the conclusion is determined only by the evidence provided by the premises. Um, in other words, basically, so we have n number of inference rules, not much, but we will cover just two of them because of the time. Um, and for each inference rule, we do have a truth, truth functions, which assigns the truth value based on the, based on the experience of the system. And experience on the system is basically uh, that uh, evidence provided by the premises. So, so the truth functions design is as follows. Um, we try to treat all the variables as Boolean. And for each value combination in premises, we decide the value in conclusion. So, so we have the two premises usually, we have two premises and then we, we do some inference on that. And then we treat, treat those variables as a Boolean and apply some Boolean functions among the extended Boolean operators that we'll see. So we can rewrite node as one minus something, my, my, my one minus X, giving the X as an argument. And we basically can multiply, it's very common. Uh, or we can deploy, uh, reply like one minus and then in series like multiply by uh, one minus X, one, by one, one minus Y. And of course that can be have unlimited number of terms over here. So it's going to be a limited series of multiplication. This is how we define the basic operations in the, inside the truth value functions. That's the inspiration for that. 
Now we can think that, think that we have the rule, deduction rule, right? And we can have two statements, for example. Uh, basically, S inherent M, S is an M, and M inherent P. Both of the statements come with a truth value. The truth value can be as a default truth value as a, of an input, or truth value can be derived from the previous cycles of inference, right? Now, the, using the deduction function, we can deduce that if S is inherent M and M inherent P, so we can deduce that S inherent P. And we have to say, what's the truth value of that? And the truth value for that is being computed by the deduction truth function, right? So the example is over here. Bird is an animal, that's confidence uh, frequency one over here and confidence 0 0.9. That's a default values for inputs. That's basically example, real example from the system, a primitive example from the system. And the Robin is bird, two statements are provided. So then the conclusion comes to that, one of the conclusion comes is Robin is, any, Robin is an animal, so Robin inherits animal, and those are truth values attached. Truth value is attached using basically dedu deduction truth function. And this is the uh, formula for that. So this is how we compute the deduction function, multiplying the frequencies for the frequency and multiplying everything else for the confidence altogether. Um, now we have induction and abduction. We will cover the most important ones. So for example, if uh, example over here, swan is a bird and swam is a swimmer, Again, those are default. Then system easily can give me bird is a swimmer as one thing. Of course, using triangularity, if you're familiar with that, you can also get that swimmer as bird. But in this case, let's, let's consider the primitive example, bird is a swimmer. And those are the truth value which are, which are being computed here. Um, again, using that, uh, so we have the induction uh, truth function here which produce us that using this formula produce as a derivation, uh, I'm sorry, that computes the truth value for the following derivation, right? So next we can go, go to the abduction. And abduction is basically, if you know, if for example, uh, P inherits M and S inherits M, also we can deduce easily that S inherits P, right? So if Seabird, for example, is a swimmer and Gould is a swimmer, we, re we really can, uh, easily determined and Google is a seabird. And again, so there is a truth function, the abduction tr function, truth function, which is compute using that formula computes as the truth functions for the derivation. So we have inference rules and we have truth functions will come along with them. Every derivation has to produce the uh, truth value and the truth value based on the whatever previous truth value has been used and the truth, truth function and inference being used in this particular situation. So it's really relative to the experience. That's a that was basic overview, like over the how logically uh, the inference engine is functions. Now, for example, uh, you coming uh, two things, two sentences coming, uh, same sentences coming to the system, right? So we have S inherent P and S inherent P again, but different truth value. Uh, we don't we don't now speak about the different. Uh, how it was produced, but let's say. Uh, so we, we can revise ideally. And in most cases, yes, we are revising it. There are counter cases, but we can revise it. And th there is a, also another function called inference function revision. And we do produce the new frequency and confidence for that. So for example, bird is a swimmer coming with that frequency and bird is a swimmer coming this uh, in, other, in other frequency. So this is can be considered as negative evidence again. So then bird is a swimmer becomes with a revised frequency and confidence, right? That's very important. So um, all of those truth values, so system function, as you probably already understand, system functions in cycles, like most of the computer algorithms and programs, and uh, every cycle uh, participating statements or concepts, so we'll search, I will show you later, um, become changing gradually based on the experience on new systems coming to the uh, new statements coming to the system and the derivation system produces itself. So it's really like a live animal, just changing the truth values, creating new derivations, uh, assigning new truth values, and etc. 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 And these are the only two examples. Now, so types of inference the NARS does is basically local inference, is revision, as we can see over here. 
and the choice rule, which is choosing an answer for a question. So you can uh, basically you can basically ask a question to the system, right? And if there are different answers, so the system has to produce a choice. You give a choice, and there is a choice rule. Forward inference, for example, if we already have some beliefs in the system, you have to produce new beliefs. Again, like we described, using the deduction, induction, abduction, there are other functions like exemplification, for example. This is the forward inference. And there is also the backward inference in the system. Then from existing questions, so you, so you submit the question, for example, to the system, to a goal. And system does not really have the belief to answer your questions, right? So the system has to come up with a derived question from the question. Until that point, it will have the beliefs, or it can infer the beliefs from its knowledge base, from, from its experience. So that's called the backward inference. And all those three types of inference are really supported in ours, and we can easily demonstrate them. But actually, it's already previously today we've been discussing the projects working successfully doing that. Now, as you can see, all of those concepts, right, as is an E, Dork, Swimmer. They have to be somewhere inside, right? Inside the system. So we have to have some structure to store, right? So we can describe that there has to be some memory structure. We're not going to now explain the implementation of memory structure. I mean, if someone would like to implement NARS itself, so probably one can come up with its own memory structure. But the thing is, uh, first of all, memory structure has to compose of task, questions, goals, queries, judgments. So a task, Basically, in NARS, everything is a task. Task can be a question, can be a goal, a piece of new knowledge, a judgment, for example. Uh, there also there is a belief in NARS. What's a belief is already a judgment or a knowledge that has been processed, accepted to the experience. That's a belief. The task and beliefs are clustered inside the memory into the concept. As, as I mentioned earlier, probably S, inherent P, there is a concept for S, concept for P, and those tasks and beliefs are somehow have to be organized inside, inside those concepts to connect to each other, to, 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 to see the relationship with each other. Uh, and concepts basically should have some prioritization in that memory. Uh, also, tasks, beliefs inside the concepts also have to have some prioritizations. You just cannot arbitrarily take one. You just have to follow some mechanism of, of selecting ones. Otherwise, it's, it's not it's not going to work simply. So, given that, this is the very high level overview of memory structure. So, if you can see the goal, swimmer, all of them concepts, and this is inheritance, uh, inheritance copula, the basically connection or relation. This is how the memory looks in very high level overview. So we have the concepts and we have the relationships, basically like a graph, right? And we have, as we can see, we have concepts that have more links coming to it and coming out from it than some other one. And then allows us to produce even more derivations and whenever derivation we produce eventually, if we have the resources, we have to put them in the memory and memory grows this time. Of course, there are some limitations. We will co cover them like in the next, uh, next half hour. But we will see. Um, now, what's the meaning of the concept? So every concept in NARS is fluid. Its meaning is determined neither by reference nor definition, but by experience relation. So as I explained, everything in it defined in terms of its experience of the system and relation with each other. And each relation is a matter of degree, so there is no absolute truth. Relation is it itself defined uh, using the experience of the system. So, and meaning always gradually changing by history and context. And because of the control mechanism features we also cover, also changing. And that's basically that's taken from the old picture. It's no, no longer relevant for the current implementation, but that captures the conceptual overview of how the, how the system should function. So basically, you have the input stream over here. Then you have some buffer because you can process usually less than you can input. Then you have some memory structure over there. From buffer, you just input to the memory. Then you have inference engine. You remove things from memory, you process and produce a derivation, right? Then you put them back to the buffer, either they can be cycles again to the memory or can be output. It really depends how you program, how you, what's, what's the function. 
that's very high level overview of how system NARS, uh, NARS control functions and conceptual overview of that. Um, now the strategy, you want the question? Huh? What changed in the new implementation? You said it's not configured by relevant. Uh, because the implementation is more concrete, it's much more and more detailed yeah. to it. It's, it's, it's not that simple once you start to really, we can cover it in the next hour, half hour, we really go through the schema and cover it. So strategy for the control is that in each step, a task has to interact with a task has to interact with the belief and uh, according to the applicable rules, like inference rules, right? A task and belief are selected probabilistically based on its importance or priority. So from here, for example, that from the memory back to a question, we can select it based on some uh, probability or some importance. Again, that's also some mechanism that selects that. And factors that include the priority of an item, basically it's quality, usefulness in history, in the long range, how urgent in the, in the, in the short range, and its uh, overall relevance to the current context. All of the things has to be considered while you're actually selecting an item from the memory. Otherwise, you can waste the time cycles and you no longer become responsive. Now, that brings us to the attention. What's attention? Attention is basically something that allows you to fruitfully select things and in, in, improve and increase the learning vector. So basically, attention allows you to avoid combinatorial explosion. So if you use attention wisely or attention mechanism is correct, so uh, you, you can avoid combinatorial uh, explosion, allowing to focus on only on the relevant task, on the, on the relevant concepts in the memory. Right, because of course, once you predict the derivation, there are too many, too many things there, not all of them have become relevant, right? Now you always have the finite resources and by selecting important items, you also can manage wisely your resources. Don't remember that system has to function in the real time. And if you probably select the correct items using your attention mechanism, so system can stay responsive. And that's very important. And also you can use your attention by selecting the correct things. So maybe there are some other things in the memory which are not important, but you won't make them important. So you want to spread that activation to them or give them more resources to things to them. So if you select the correct things, you can allow that resources to be, uh, to be spent on other things in the future. Thank you. All right. Whatever we described so far, just covered only the very first, very primitive logic layer. Um, but that's a fundamental for NARS. Everything else is built on top of that. So it's a very conceptual. So we been only covered here atomic terms like S, inference P, only here in L1. We did not even cover all the rules there, all the truth functions, but that's what we covered. So we have now layers in, in NARS, um, eight are fully implemented, and level nine is partially implemented. So we started working on that. Um, level, I can briefly mention them. Level level one is basically whatever we've seen, uh, which has an incurrent and scopular. Level two is, has the property relationship. It has the uh, similarity, scopular. Then level three introduce our set relations, like in which we can compound terms. Level four is basically images and other set operations or regular or uh, other types of relations. Now, level five is basically a uh, statement can become as a term, right? And we introduce new couples uh, as like equivalence, like e equivalence and implication. Level six is a variable. So we introduce the variables. We cannot really get away without having the variables in the system. So we can have the bound, bind to the variables, etc. Now, level seven is very important. So we introduce the time to the system. So now we can reason about time and we have a temporal reasoning. That's level seven. Level eight is a procedural learning, which is basically, we can do goals, we can, we can do planning, we can do sub goaling. And level nine is a self-control. It's how a system can react to itself. So basically how it can modify its state itself and what can it do to improve it or uh, worsen it, depending on what you want to do. Um, I think I just covered that. So these are ideas from set theory, right? Inherent and scopeless similarity, instance properties, which are in, which are, which are in the in the later layers. 
um, compound terms like sets, intersections, differences, products, images. But this is an L4 and 5. Now we have the new inference rules like comparison, analogy, plus compound terms, composition terms, decompositions, those in the level 4 high. Um, now the higher order reasoning we call something starting from level level five. Basically, we have the implication equivalence relationship. We have the negation. We define a negation, conjunction, disjunction. We do some conditional inferences, variables as a terms, and basically NARS now becomes as a universal metalogic. Uh, yes, we can do the procedural learning as a level eight over there. So whenever events are statements with temporal relationship relations, uh, we do have operations with also events as executable events. Uh, we do have goals, we do have sub goals, and we do have mental operations, operations which are integral into the inference process. So this is level seven, eight, and nine. This is very high level logic. So just to little bit have a summer summary. So basically, NARS is fully based on ICOR and unified representational language. So it has really complete inferential power in, in theory and conceptually. It's very difficult, almost impossible, of course, to implement everything. We have implementation of everything, but in theory, it has a really complete inferential power. It can it have reasoning, it has reasoning as a learning, planning, problem solving, and decision making. And it can be integrating with other software and hardware via plug and play. And that's already been done in the, in the future. Um, now, in terms of implementation, so we have two currently used implementation of NARS, which is the open NARS written in Java. It's a very old version, so we've been uh, polishing and modifying it and creating different versions of that. And we have the open NARS for applications. Uh, created by Patrick Hammer. It's a, it's a very efficient C version. It's a little bit simplified in terms of control, but it's produced very good results because it's uh, it, it's more concerned to be a, a true conceptual implementation. So it's more, it's more basically uh, around the applications. And we do have a working example, so we can show them in the demo later. And somehow the system shows the human-like properties, so we never deem to be uh, to be nurse to be a psychological model. These are the resources, um, but I'm sorry, potential applications. So NARS basically is not defined for any specific application, right? It can be considered as a general purpose tool. So a suitable domain, like whenever ICAR is applicable, whenever you truly don't need to get the most optimal solution, most optimal deterministic solution. And the uh, task I express well as reasoning and tools have a compatible interface. That's the, one, that's the suitable domains of NARS. This you can find online publications, source code is open source, and any collaborations are welcome. I think we do have, right, we all, we're already out of time, but we can have like questions now. Any questions, guys, really? No, I'm sorry, hmm? You have uncertainty in the truth values. Yes, yes, that's uh, actually the whole the whole thing to 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 have the truth value is just to handle uncertainty. I'm uh, sorry, not that it's weighted by evidence, but like when you're determining a concept, you're not totally sure it's actually that. Am I determining? No, I do determine the concept. Concept doesn't have a truth value. The statement uh, of the concept has a truth value, and that whenever we have the Der derivation. So basically, we, we, we attach the truth value and truth value being computed uh, based on the system's experience, based on the premises, basically, have been participated in a derivation. Is that your question? Kind of, yeah. I guess I'm saying when you're ingesting the, the statement. Okay, so I'm processing the statement, okay. Uh, right. It depends. So or, uh, if, if it really depends. If the statement is a derivation, so it already has the truth value, right? If it's an input, so for example, we, we, you had here, if you've been in the first session, so we've been working with uh, some connecting, some deep learning YOLO network. Yeah. So it's been giving us the confidence already and truth value basically was, was producing by the deep learning this inputting with that. Yeah. 
Sure. Any other? But but NARS is really about uncertainty. That's that's the real thing. Shall we then continue with an implementation? Please. Um, the last time that I looked into Mars, I, I wasn't able to express things like cardinality of sets of long term, perhaps. Like, for example. Um, can you also maybe come here to ask a question such that other people would hear? Uh, uh, right. You want me to go there? No, you can, you can just either stop here. Well, I was uh, wondering if it's possible to express cardinality in statements, like, for example, four countries signed the Paris Agreement, for example, but you don't enumerate them, but you just say the number, but you don't necessarily have to enumerate them. Is, is, that, is that expressible within Uh Yeah, I mean, is it four becomes a concept or you want just to cardinality in terms of how compound the set is? Uh, I mean, you basically can yes, you, you, you can have the relationship with the with the four, and you can do the primitive uh, kind of you can do the primitive now primitive math with it, with NARS, but you have to really establish those relationships. It, it's doable. Uh, in terms of cardinality, I was thinking, for example, you have that compound term. Can you express how many like subterms are that also doable, or if you, for example, derive have a derivation? The der derivation and there becomes a highly compound term, it's also possible, although we have a limit of how many components can be there for the derivations. But in their case, we also can establish cardinalities there easily. Um, for example, is two species of birds do not fly? Uh, then, you, then you probably can say, you, you, you can say which species are not flying, right? You can, what if I don't? What if I don't know what they are? But, uh, but what do you mean by cardinality? So I, I want to say how many there are, but I don't know which city where they are. Like, for example, states that, states that are two types of birds that cannot fly, but don't want to state which, I don't, I don't want to say penguins cannot fly or, or something, or ostriches cannot fly. I want to say that there are two of them that don't fly. Well, you can say, you basically can say that birds do not fly, but then if something applies, you have the negative evidence, counter evidence. Oh, but I want to present all the numbers. I want to say that there then then you, have to, you have to divide as, 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 as a relation. Yes, it's possible. That's, oh. uh, you have some variable. That's, that's, then, and then, it, then you can define it. Mm, uh, it's also possible to use Patrick, dependent, dependent variables to express cardinality. Sentence variable to express cardinality. Dependent, dependent, dependent variable, right? Uh, well, somehow we, we barely can hear you. Okay, you cannot hear me. One second. Uh, I have to stop sharing for that. Patrick, you want to try again? Oh, yes. No, I just wanted to say uh, there's the idea of dependent variables. And with this, also more abstract ideas like cardinality can be expressed. It's like mentioning a certain thing without being uh, refer referring, like uh, it, it allows the system to, to express something. There is something which has a certain property without having to specify exactly what, what this thing is. Like there like exists quantifier almost. And the same can be used to, to define a concept of cardinality. Sure, but as far as you've enumerated the individual species, you can say like one billion people are Brazilians, 
if it happens to one billion instances, what was that my Oh, uh, pardon, uh, the sound is very bad. Present the set as a variable, and then you can have the set inherit, um, like inherit other properties, like almost set like inherits a property of two things or something like that. Um, so I don't, it's more like more the set itself is related to other concepts. It's not you don't you don't use the set itself in like one statement or with one relationship. It's it's compared to um it's according to all its relationships. So, any other questions? Show me one then to the implementation demo. Oh, not the demo, explanation. Mm, okay, so, so it's meta. No, 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 I will do the GNRs. Oh, okay. Um, one second. So, right, we are, we are like 10 minutes behind. All right, so we are show basically today we will show basic overview of the new release of the OpenRS 3.12, 3.1.2. And we will go in the details, of course, not in very, we will not dive very deep, but we will go to the details uh, with diagrams and we will describe how in overall control works, how do we select all the things, and what is basically implementation of NARS. Um, introduction, right, right. Just a little bit to freak up. So we think that intelligence is the capacity of a system to adapt to its environment, uh, operating under ICOR, insufficient knowledge, assumption of insufficient knowledge and resources. So right, under that assumption, we do know that there are always going to be the finite processing capacity. Uh, they're going to be always, system has to work in the real time and also system always has to be open to the open tasks of any content, right? Um, NARS or comes from non-axiomatic reasoning system has three parts, basically. Uh, language, which, which we call NARSIS, logical parts, which we call now, and the control mechanism. So language, we, we have it's almost perfect. So logical part, we also got it, but the control mechanism is require lots of research. Um, NARS is fully based on ICOR, and NARS is a designed meta level and acquired object level. So right, we covered that in the, just covered. Those are the nine layers again. And those are types of inference fully implemented. So we have local inference, Forward inference and backward inference. Sorry, of course, the backward. But uh, you're not sharing the screen if oh, we're sorry. supposed to see something. Thank you. Screen. Right. I just covered a few slides, which is a backup. Just assumption of intelligence. What is NARS has a three layers. Those are the nine layers we basically, nine logical layers we described previously. Inferences, and I stopped here. So now I do the full screen as it was. Now, uh, basically how the backward inference works is with, it's, it basically works a little bit backward, forward, intermediate, backward, forward again until it reached the solution if, uh, with, the, with, the, with the truth value. 
So it's never just only backward inference or never only forward inference, it's always intertwined together. So truth value, we just explained, but now we're going to introduce, and actually it was there always before, so the truth expectation. At some point, we, we need to sum the truth value into single measurement. Or for example, to do some attention mechanism, we have to choose. And sometimes it's, it's useful to represent a truth value in a single measurement, we call it truth expectation. And that's the estimation of the future frequency. So that's the formula for that. That's basically uh, frequency minus uh, one half or zero five. And if the frequency is the zero half, it basically that's uncertainty. So closer to one is the certain going to happen closer to zero. So there's negative evidence. Zero five is basic uncertainty. That's what it is. Now controlling data structures. So some control criteria. Um, operating on the ICAR, so a new task can can arrive at any given moment, right? That's number one we have to really think about. Now, system should always stay responsive for new inputs and derivations. Even if system working, it still it has to be responsive for the new inputs, right? Uh, the data structures doesn't doesn't matter how big they are, they still bound in size, so it's easily to to reach the maximum capacity of them. And also to, to really operate efficiently, the operation cycle needs to finish roughly in a constant time. So it really has to the system performance has to be measurement into, measured in terms of operation cycles, right? Now tasks, we already defined tasks before. So in NARS, all activities are task driven. Task basically are handled using beliefs, which are statement with truth value and desires. Uh, desires is uh, basically very similar. They have the statement with a desire value, but desire value is very basically the same in terms of implementation, but conceptually different. Can conceptually different, but the same in terms of implementation to the truth value. Uh, also, two components, also from zero to one, the ranging, right? So, a task is is uh, processed in a sequence of inference steps and becomes partially achieved as well as generates other derived tasks. So task may not actually, may never fully be achieved, many solved um, and can be interrupted. It de depends on the other important tasks coming to the systems. And NARS, uh, we repeatedly select tasks and beliefs as premises, apply some inference rules, which decide, uh, and then produce a derivation. And we decide the extent to which the task has been achieved, right? Key thing from here, so task is never be fully achieved because, we, or if you have uh, just very few tasks in the system, you keep achieving them, keep solving and solving them. Inference cycles uh, really continues forever, right? Uh, producing derivations and attaching truth values. So it, it, it never ends. Um, task procedure under the ICAR, okay, task processing. So we have the multitasking. It means that the new tasks are accepted or derived when the old ones are still processing. It's that that's very true. So this, the system has to be open for the event, for the new events and for the new tasks, no matter what. So next thing is the processing of a task may have no available or feasible algorithm to follow. Uh, we do not have any predefined algorithm how we processing the task. It really depends on the uh, what experience currently in the system is. So that's really depends on the experience and the distribution of the priority values in the memory or importance in the memory. Now, few tasks currently can be processed completely by taking all the relevant knowledge into the account under time restriction. Another thing is a concurrency. So the tasks need to be processed in parallel rather than sequentially. And I'm not thinking here of multi-threading. So the one task starts processing, then another task arrives, so the context of being switched or the resources being switched to the task that newly arrived and then do start the processing the newly arrived task and then can switch back if it's important to the previously processed task. Um, and another thing is that processing of a task can also implemented, uh, interrupted after end steps uh, because of the appearing of the more urgent, more important tasks. So these are all important consideration for the creating the control mechanism of NARS, right? Uh, those are the types of tasks. So basically the judgment, question, goal, query. 
So judgment is a belief, it is systems experience, basically most common type of sentence that consists of a statement with a truth value. Question is a sentence without the truth value uh, attached and it actually can, uh, may contain a variable. It asks the system to find or create the judgment as an answer. Now goal uh, is basically, is a sentence with a desire value and the desire value is something to be realized by the system by execution, execution some operation. So this is uh, from the now eight procedural learning, we'll cover it closer to the end. And also another type of task is a query, is similar to the question, very similar. But instead of while, while the question asks for, for the truth value, the quest, uh, the query basically asks for the desired value. That's what, that's what types of tasks, four tasks. <clears throat> and again, inference engine. So basically accepts tasks and belief as a premises. It triggers uh, inference rules and then produces number of derived tasks. So number of rules that can be triggered by each input is a constant. Yes, we do have it defined in parameters, a constant, a constant number of rules for per each cycle. And the execution of each rule costs roughly constant amount of time of that. Um, yes, so each cycle uh, is a constant time. We can really treat it as a constant time, even though it requires some work. And inference always happens in cycle. I think it's better if we go to the cycles now we have that picture in mind, and then we'll go back and forth to the slides to really think, to see how it works. So you, we already know that we have a memory, things where we store all the concepts and, um, and the knowledge for the system, right? So we first adding the results from the buffer into the main memory, that's what we do, right? Here there is a concept already exist, we trigger potential revisions. But if not, we create a new concept and just process it and put it to the memory, right? And I think the next thing is we select the concept from the memory uh, based on its priority distribution. That's why it says sampling, right? And then from the concept, we select its connection to a task. Else also, we also uh, select the term link. Term link is basically, uh, it's basically a link that connects the concept to a term. And in the, inside the term, uh, there is the there is the belief table, the belief table, and we query and, and we get from there the highest confidence uh, belief. So we get the inference here. Yeah, I just go to the. Um, I, I know it's a little bit confusing, so I will go now to the diagram and we will all see. So uh, so in the inference, uh, the participate the task and the belief. Task has been connected to the concept using task link and the belief is connected to the concept using the term link, right? Very, very easy overview. Um, now we apply those inference rule be between the task and belief, uh, right? We produce some derivation. We now apply some truth functions to, 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 get, the to get the truth value for the derivation. We also uh, produce some importance for the derivation, we call it budget value. We'll cover it just in a few seconds. And then we input the conclusion of the derivation into the buffer. So always the inference happens between the task and to the belief, two things, right? And those two things are connected to the concept using the task link and the term link. That's, that's how we do. And the derivation goes back to the buffer. Uh, this is the overall overview of the system. So of current implementation. So we have the memory over here, we have a, inference engine, whenever we see all of the inference rules applied and the cycle happens over here. Now we have the internal experience buffer. So all of the derivations out of the inference goes to the internal experience, right? Um, and we also have the overall experience. So all of the inputs, and we have multiple channels connected to the system of sensory motors, for example, they'll come into the, to the, to the overall experience buffer. From there, they participate for the resources, and based on their, basically the, this is the priority queue, uh, they're being put it and processed to the memory. So the cycle is, is from there, from overall experience to the memory, from memory we go do some selection and do some inferences. From inferences we import it to the internal experience. From internal experience, again, there is some resource allocation procedure here to go to the overall experience. And this is the cycle, right? That's the very high level overview of the cycle. And this is actually exact architecture of what is in R312. There's two buffers. 
Now, a buffer is basically a priority queue containing new or derived tasks, right? So we have overall experience buffer as I just showed. So it's a main buffer where all input tasks from different sources and of different types are mixed along with the outputs of the internal experience buffer. Now internal experience buffer is for input of the derived tasks from the inference engine. So internal experience only for the derivations. Uh, and also for the null seven for the temporal compositions, maybe you know, you not know now, but um, we do have to produce some temporal compositions uh, while we, we trying to process uh, temporal reasoning, right? When we're producing events, basically events that the sentence with the temporal information uh, attached, right? It, 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 it's a task in time, task with, task with, with, with some information about time. Let's we call it events. So in buffers, we also create some of the compositions like the forward implications and sequence as of now. Only two of them we create in those two buffers, in both of them, as an internal experience and overall experience. Because those these are key for the anticipation and the prediction and the relation. Those two things. Um, what's the data structures behind that memory, for example? Or what's the data structure widely used in that architecture? So we do have the beta, data structure called a bag. And the bag is a data structure which is found in many places, which is found in many places in NARS. It's found in memory and found in, within the in concepts. So in concept, there are two bags. We will cover it in a second. So um, bag is basically non-deterministic priority queue where items are prioritized by the priority value of an item. So each item is assigned some priority and based on priority, uh, they're being selected from the bag. And selection happens probabilistically uh, proportional to the priority of the item. Priority is also uh, ranging from zero to one. And there are basically two main operations in that. So we can put the item to the bag, for example, new concept, we can put the memory, right? Uh, and when we're putting the item to the back, if already back contains such an element, so the two elements are merged. There is a revision by the procedures. But if not, basically we create a new concept and put it to the back. If the bag is full, so basically we remove the lowest priority items from the from the bag because we can hold them. And the other operation is take item from the bag. So the 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 take operation it basically select probabilistically, uh, and the chance of each item is positively correlated to its priority value. It happens intentionally. Why, for example, to allow even low priority items to participate for the resources, right? Uh, we don't want to always to allow high priority items to really be selected from the back from the from the sponsored memory, for example. Uh, so we want to really give a chance to the to the low priority items. That's that gives the clarity to the system, and that's the kind of philosophy of NARS. Main memory is basically shares the back data structure, and main memory represents a system's experience that is in the form of the concept network and with the linked tasks. Now, content of memory is constantly changing in a non-repetitive manner. So with the with the cycles. Uh, the new concepts being added to memory, something been forgotten, priority been modified every single cycle. And so the memory really lives with the system. It produces the uh, system's experience and modifies it. M uh, main two functions in the main memory are basically accept the task, accept the task to process uh, all the links and connect all the links to the related tasks and terms. And the consider take a concept and carry out inference from that. Take a concept and take out, apply inference rules and take inference from that. That's a concept uh, which is which is inside the memory. Itself is a data structure. It's like an entity or a bigger object that has multiple fields in it. So concepts are being created during the task processing. Concepts are named by term and concepts are being in turn only inserted into the main memory, right? So concepts here have the term link bags. So here, here are the term links which connect that concepts to the term. 
So if you have, if you remember, if you have Raven is black or S inherent P, uh, so there are concept S has to be somehow connected to other terms, right? So this is where the term links are stored. And that's again, there, this, this is a probabilistic selection based on the priority here. It's a back data structure. Same for the task link. Now, belief tables is where, is where concept has a associated beliefs. In that case, like as, as, as inherent P might be the belief and there might be different, uh, I mean, it, 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 it might be encountered different, same beliefs, but, but with different truth values. So here we might have the table with multiple, multiple same beliefs, but different truth values because of the experience of the system is gradually changing, right? And during time we can add their belief, but the truth value can change. And here we sort them by the highest confidence over there. The same is for the, for the desire table. Also, it sorts for the highest confidence. Desires are made for the procedural learning and for the goal selection, right? It also forms a precondition and the anticipation as for the temporal reasoning to predict and to have the to, to see what's anticipated. Now, uh, probably we'll stop for questions after that slide. Now it will be more, I think, more clear now. So now we have a fragment, a toy example. We have a fragment in the memory, which is Raven is bird, right? The task comes, uh, orange here is a task, Raven is bird. And another task comes, bird is an animal. Now in the memory is being decomposed. So uh, the concept Raven is created, right? Concept bird is created, concept Raven is bird is created, right? Blue here, if you can see, those are the term links. So now, now the idea when you when you processing the task, you really create the term links and connect them like that, right? Also, you connect term links from here. And notice there are bidirectional, so there are two different term links. Why? Because they have a different priority inside of each of the concepts. So each concept, as you can see, have the task. Uh, have a have a bag of term links, right? So then it has a bag of term links in, in, in concept Raven. It also has a bag of term links in concept Raven is bird. And of course they have a different priority and that's why we have two links here. You cannot have the same single link. Also orange, there is the task link to the task link to the to the task which is Raven is bird here. Same as here for the bird, right? For example, in during the inference cycle, when you're selecting the concept, you can select the bird, and then we have the multiple task link there. So you now we can select some of them based on the priority of them. From there, you can select, select the belief, right? And then you can go using the term link, for example, you can go over here to that concept, and here you will have multiple beliefs. And here you will take out the, from the belief table, from the belief table over here, here you take the highest confidence belief, I mean, that's already sorted, it's always sorted. Whenever you add the belief to the concept, it's, it's, it's being sorted right there. So uh, you basically have the inference between the task and belief from, from that concept. That's how the inference works. Then you apply the inference rules to that. Then you do some derivations. Then you giving those truth values of the, of the task and the belief, you just produce another truth value and you then assign them some budget some priority. Um, any questions now? I think that's probably, we can go on. Yeah, I have, I have a question. About, Please. Um, parallel processing, if you are doing, say, two queries at the same time. Okay. And they use some kind of context that they've calculated. Let's say the one input is angry and the other one is, is happy. Um, how, how, do, how, does it, how would they not interfere with each other? Um, first of all, you select one concept, and then uh, whenever you, first of all, you enter them to the system, right? So you pre-process them in the system and they have all the links, all the connection between them, correct? Now you select one, then you only uh, process whatever is connected to the concept you select. That's kind of how, how the system works, right? 
So we say over here, we can, we can go back. So we can, you, you can select any constant from here because all of them in the memory, all of the yellow ones in the memory, right? And then you basically, um, you saying, you, you're selecting the hungry, for example, hungry, right? Yeah, maybe I didn't explain uh, correctly my example. I'm talking more about context. I mean, if you have an isolated sentence, um, maybe you don't have context, but I'm talking about the, the idea of short term memory or you know, context. So you may have one conversation. Basically, could you be having two conversations at the same time? Would, would I assume they would interfere with each other? But yeah, yeah but you will, you will be modifying your evidence. So you will be modifying the truth value or whatever is there. Right. And you will be constantly doing the revision. If, if, for example, the derivation comes from the different sources, if the sources it comes from are not basically intertwined and we have certain like time limit, for example, uh, if they, 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 they're not coming from the same sources, then you do the revision and the truth value changed gradually for that. If it's not, you're having both there. And, and, and that's, that's how gradually you really transform the, your experience. If that answer your question. I mean, you, I think you're confirming that they will, will be. Yes, yeah, 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 of course. It, it really depends on how they come from. Because basically, in order to in order to make a revision to them, or like saying like uh, contradiction or something, you have to subtract what is coming from one, but not is from there. But it's difficult to do. So, so it's it, easy to say. For example, I had like ten in the parallel process. Right. is not isolated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, any other questions? That's. Okay, we can go on. So, like important things is now forgetting. Um, forgetting is very important thing in terms of resource allocation. So, data structures are always uh, always become full pretty fast. Doesn't matter how long how how big they are. So, forgetting is a necessary procedure to control the load of of data structure used in NARS. Um, and obviously, then having less only is sufficient. Data in memory allows for faster, efficient processing. So there are multiple ways to forget in NARS. There is a hard forgetting, there is soft forgetting. Uh, easily explained. So hard forgetting is something you just forget because of that memory is full. You, you just, just you cannot feed it. Soft forgetting is then you have some apply some mechanism of forgetting it uh, artificially. So you want to let it to forget such that it reaches its minimum. It can be really hard be, be for hard forgetting. I mean, that brings us to the conversation about attention because uh, control mechanism is extremely important, but control mechanism also incorporates some attention mechanism there that constantly picks up the correct or uh, required tasks from the concepts from the memory or tasks. Otherwise, you cannot proceed. And of course, the required here or important here it defines in terms of the experience of the system. That's, that's what it is. So data structures are always both in size and system should always stay responsive. That's one criteria for the attentional control mechanism. So cycle also has to be finished in the constant time, right? And single inference step also never can be interrupted. So it's atomic, cycle is atomic in this case. However, single cycle does not really uh, complete the, as I say, query or does not really uh, answer to the question. It, it might be it, it's multiple cycle necessary to really answer for the question. However, the task can be really interrupted, even if it was working for a long time, if uh, if the more important task has going to come. And that's basically a role of attention to to change the to switch the contents from one task to another task, and vice versa. Um, uh, attention also features the short and long term importance. So basically, uh, whenever you select the concept from the memory, you selecting it using the urgency or priority in this case. And when you try to forget the element from the memory, basically you you so you forget it based on the quality, right? Uh, in this case, uh, priority basically can function as the short importance and uh, forget it, and the quality is like a long term importance. Two two things. Um, now. After derivation, the budget value obtained by budget inference is changed based on basically how much of related task is being fulfilled. 
right? So every time we take out the concept from the from the memory, for example, right? We have to put it back, right? We don't forget it, we just put it back. But we have to put it back with adjusted importance of budget. And that allows us for other concepts in the memory to really be participated for the resources. Otherwise, we, if we don't adjust budget, so we always will be pro pro processing the same and same knowledge, same and same amount of uh, information all over the place until we have something which is more important. And uh, related forgetting is very important here. So basically after item is being participated in inference, its priority is being decreased and in order to allow fair competition for resources. And of course, once the memory is full, there is no more no place to, to put the concept, the lowest priority items are being removed from the memory. That's how the basic attention criteria and how basic attention works here. Now, in NARS, so in many systems, basically attention can be implemented just basically as a filtering. It can be just a threshold. I can accept the task if, for example, uh, that's, that's important to me to be bigger than 0 0.7. And I just can, can define what's important to me or some other things. Uh, in NARS, we have attention, I think, on the three levels. So on the logical levels, level, when, when actually conceptually, premises only share the same term, right? We, we have, we, we, as well over here, we can see where is, the mem where is the memory. When we do the inferences, if it's not temporal, so we require the premises to share the same term. That's, or, 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 that's already reduces us the search. But basically you already know which, which premise we have to take. It's, that's why it allows to, uh, to make our cycle as a, as a constant time. Otherwise we have to search entire system for that, which is not, a, not is nearly constant time, right? Another thing is a data structure. So budget is being computed, initialized first, then selections performed using priority queue sampling. So uh, the back data structure allows us to prioritize that or the even priority queue, the items in that. So we don't waste time on the, on the taking out them, right? So there are two like already for granted things of attention because of the conceptual thing. And on top of that, basically NARS has a budget inference mechanism. We should call it a real attention mechanism. That's extensive and complex attention control that evaluates budget in real time for each data, depending on the system experience and context. We define the truth value, which has two components, right? Frequency and confidence, right? Here we define the budget value. So each, uh, each, each, each task not only comes with the truth value, but also comes with the budget value. It's basically how important that task to the system and how much resources the task is, ne is necessary to spend for, for to process that task, right? And those three components are the following, priority, durability, and quality. So priority is basically the short-term importance, as I said. So in the memory, I select using the priority. Now, the quality is a long-term importance. So I forget using the quality. If my quality is very low, I don't probably need that. And I can forget it, remove it from the memory, right? And the durability is the, is a, is a decay rate. It basically shows us how fast I can uh, decrease the priority or how fast the priority should decrease. We can go over here to, the, to that slide, for example. This is the priority decay and total budget. So basically the, 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 the priority is, is, always, is always higher than the, than the quality and the priority is being decreased uh, exponentially using the durability, right? Uh, priority is updated by durability factor. That's the formula that's from the code, basically, where C is forget cycles. So with, with many cycles, we try to forget the things such as allow other, people, other items to participate for the resources. And that's, the, that's, the, that's how it's being forgotten. Now, quality is the base priority. So quality is the threshold below which the priority cannot drop. So from here to there, that's, that's going with time. So basically priority decreasing, decreasing and decreasing. And uh, it, it, that gives us that priority value is basically a function of time that decreases with derivative or determined by the durability, right? 
and it derive in the in the in decreases until it reaches the quality, which is the minimum value of a priority. That's how it is. And the total budget is basically the integral, basically the uh, the area under that curve. That gives us a total budget, right? That sounds very like conceptual, but that, that's what it is. So to adjust that budget for each of the tasks after each of the inference. First thing, we have the set of budget functions. Uh, budget functions are essential part of attention and resource allocation openers. So the key role, so derive and assign budget value to concepts, tasks, term links, and task links. So all of those basically concepts, tasks, term links, and task links are comes with budget. So every time we do the uh, inference, uh, or we produce a derivation, we have, to ask, we have to do two things. First, assign the budget to the derivation, Right, how important the derivation is, and that based on on what it was produced from. So it is really based on the budget and truth value of the premises. And there are many budget functions associated with: is it a is it an event? Is it an is is it an, a goal? Is it an a, like what, what, what? How many derivations it it, it came from, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's a complex procedure. Um, it is, so one thing is assign the budget to the to the derivation. And the other thing is basically to uh, uh, recompute the budget or adjust the budget for the premises that have been participating in the, in the duration. Why? Because we don't want them always to be processing all over again. So we, if, for example, if the budget was high enough, even if we're going to penalize it using the durability, so next cycle is also going to be selected for inference. And that really indicates how, how important the item is. So if the item, for example, if, if, the, if the premises, for example, can provide a fruitful derivation, the also their budget can be activated and can be even, uh, the, the new budget value can be derived higher for, for the premises than it was before. Also, also that, uh, that would happen, but it's, it's, it's really dynamic and process in the real time. Um, and design idea here is basically designed according to the basic principles of ICOR, with the objective of achieving all tasks as much as possible, right? In ours, basically, we have an objective to achieve all tasks. We never selecting separate tasks and achieve it to the to its full completeness. So we have the slice of resources. So and we try to apply the resource we have to as much task as we can. So achieve all tasks as much as we can. That's what we do in ours. And yes, budget functions are not learned, they're predefined. So if, as you can see, budget value is learned. Many things are learned in NERS, but the budget functions are predefined. predefined. Uh, and the budget, uh, it basically, they are calculated during each inference during runtime, and there are very, very huge research on them, how to really make them work, because they're very, very important in attention mechanism. Um, I can we say no. We can say about the procedural learning. Um, so procedural learning in three one two, it's basically almost same as in the, the previous version three or four, which we know, which which we might know. So basically, procedural learning is the type of learning which is concerned with the representation of precondition, postcondition of an action. Uh, where action is a basically an operation, right? Uh, in NARS, operation is an event that is a knowledge with temporal information, right? Occurrence time, creation time. And the procedural learning in NARS is basically represented as a conditional operation uh, and a consequence. That's like, that's like there, or simply like condition, that there's a precondition, we have operation, and we have postcondition, which is a consequence over there. We have predefined the operations which are atomic, and we can add them, uh, and and they have the predefined uh, like functions or procedures. Well, what to happen to execute them? However, the learning aspects of the operations is that the operations can be combined multiple ways, and they can be like multiple operations. Learned behavior to selecting and combining the operations to really achieve goals. Now, goals. From one perspective, is it fair to that's not a, at least a 
Um, yes, that comes from that. Uh, that, that, that that's imp implies that's that's from temporal. Oh, okay. Uh, right, so that because if there's an event that comes from that, that's why I have it over here from null seven. From here, it's already so. Is you remember right? In fairness, wasn't wasn't over here, right? Then we define the similarity when we define variables, statements, sets, and compounds and variables. That's with, we finish on with the null six. Then we have like the temporal compositions. Yeah. What does it mean? Uh, there, there, there mean temporal implications. So it can be, for example, it can be doing as an as an anticipation. If one event comes. There is some time space between the second event come to the system, right? Whenever we're processing, like before, like uh, now, now one to six, right? Like inheritance, we have to have the term, which is uh, which is shared between two premises, right? We cannot require the same for the events, because because there is time difference. So then we have to create some temporal compositions with them. In this case, for example, if event A comes and the next event B comes, right? So, and then this, the same situation really uh, repeats. So we can anticipate event B coming after A. Right, happened before, happened after, happened at the same time. We also can be done like that. Oh, okay. so, so the one right, you right. So is it fair to read how a condition and operation happened before consequence? Uh, exactly, exactly. So uh, over here, let me go back. So basically the precondition have an operation and then we have the consequence or the post condition of that. So that's very related to the procedure. It, it, this is a procedure learning related to goal handling. So the goal is also an event. Whenever we talk to procedural learning that everything is an event, operation is always event itself because it happens in time, right? So goal is an event the system desires to achieve, right? And to achieve a goal basically means to execute an operation. So, for example, I want to, you know, grab, uh, I, I, I want to just turn the light off, right? So, but I have to first get to the light so that get maybe a walk, walk, walk in front will be the operation, right? And how I'm doing that is basically I'm doing that by forming procedural hypothesis. Um, basically, giving the stream of events to the system like A, B, A1, A2, A, N, right? Uh, I just uh, create the procedural hypothesis in the form like A implies B, etc., cetera, uh, or C, and that becomes like that form, A, B, C, where A is precondition, as you said, B is operation, and C is a postcondition, right? And when goal, com when goal G comes, basically satisfaction happens by hypothesis formation through the forward inference using system knowledge or backward inference by derivation and using sub -walling from existing knowledge. Right. Can you explain more about satisfaction? Huh? Uh, satis satisfaction is basically over here. It's, it's basically how we choose them. Um, we create a hypothesis, right? Uh, just trying to explain it easy. Um, so we do have multiple events already defined in the system, right? So we select that, that event that, is, that was recently used for an operation. Uh, I'm sorry, we select the opera operation that was recently used and we try to build a precondition. So all the events that happened before, we have that in the buffer. And we, in, so they happened before, right? So we, 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 we create that uh, precondition, we, we create that temporal sequence from all the events from before with an operation. And that becomes our precondition, like over here, right? Over here. Uh, when the new event comes the way, right? So we also uh, sample all the event previously and create that temporal implication with them, right? And then sample preconditions, uh, EOP, whichever, whatever it was from the event and create the hypothesis. Right. So now, when we sample this from the from the hypothesis, right, they put it in the concept 
there's a table of preconditions and anticipation inside the concept, right? Oh, sorry. We put it to the to the to the event to the concept which was created for the new event, right? And that continues for the n number of times, right? Um, whenever time comes, uh, and time comes when, for example, the new goal comes to the system, right? And new go goal comes to the system in the in the form of the new event. Again, sorry, in the new event, right? Uh, so we also we, we, we query the memory, we select the concept, and then we follow and select the using the basically we select from the precondition tables, we select the preconditions. Here preconditions are sorted by the truth expectations. That's when that's what it means when we satisfy the goal, right? In this case. So we select the highest truth expectation. If we don't sort them, they, they've been sorted, we, we just linearly go over them. In code is implemented like that. After that, we do the detachment route twice. So we first select the event and then it detach the operation over here. And highest truth expectation we try to uh, execute, right? So this is I explain the hypothesis selection over there. Now, the important thing, if it runs for many events, right? So imagine just we have multiple combinations to have like temporal composition, temporal sequencing, really, uh, lots of combinatorial combination to create those events in the memory, right? So this will be a very long list, too many hypotheses, right? We have to prune them, but how do we going to prune them efficiently, really? We cannot do it during each, each very thing. So, we, we, and also remember that all of the events, but this also events become compound events. They have the budget value assigned to them, and we are pruning them in terms of modifying the budget value such that they will not be selected. This, this is the introduction of the negative evidence to them, such that they try not to be selected at any further being forgotten. That's how we, how event pruning is working. Please. What oh, baby, baby, can you come here? Such everyone, listen. Yeah, please, don't hesitate. What does it mean to execute an operation? Um, basically, you have the, uh, anything, you have the procedure defined in a code Whenever you execute the operation, you execute the code inside that procedure, inside the method. And it can be whatever it is. Uh, it, it can be the robot can really go to the door and open the door. That, that can be like that. So, but I guess... so once you execute, if you execute the operation, there's already you, you, you really invoke some sensory motor action. It can be like that. But, but I guess, in, is it the reason that you said that? Huh? The reason the language that you use express the, the things, right? I'm, I'm guessing in that language, you, how do you express operation? That thing? I guess you can't. Write um, for example, for example, example, we have an operation fire, or we have an operation left, right? Sure. Left. Right, and then I have the procedure. What you do if you if you basically if you try to execute the operation left, you invoke the procedure. It call it can call also like method left. And what do you do by that? You define there. So when you're executing, you basically call that method left. This is hard coded thing. Also, also the operations are hard coded. Oh, well, basic operations, yes, they are predefined in front of the system. However, the combination of those operations are being learned. But I cannot define new operations. No, you can. It's just you, 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 you can, but you have to do it like in the in the before, uh, before runtime. Well, so I cannot like or define the operation. As I go along, right, it's, it's like, right, right. You just do babble. Huh? You know, babble. What? You babble it, motor babble. Yeah, you can do the well, uh, model babbling is if you forget them. You, you you mean that? Yeah, he says, can you add a new operation at runtime? You can with motor babble. So like move move the robot left and then. But you but you but, but, but you should know but you should know what exactly you have to invoke. How to, which leg you have to invoke in order to move. That has to be predefined. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. I guess what I'm asking, like, I'm guessing- you, you say, You're saying because more about, I mean, the operation themselves can be forgotten from the memory, right? Because the priority is very often actually to be forgotten. And that you're bubbling them along such that they were never forgotten. But you can't add that Yes, but if, the, if, they have the, if they have the predefined procedure already, so, for example, you have 10, 10 procedure and you can run, you can start with the two operation, right? 
so you know how your robot can kick the door, for example, close the door, uh, I don't know, go left, go right, go top button, but you can start with two operations, then you, of course, you can end them. But if you don't have the predefined procedure what to do, yes, probably you can, you can input them, but there is no effect for that. Same as you, you are given basically all of the movements with your fingers, all the possible directions, that's your part of the procedures. So you could teach it something like jump? But it wouldn't execute like a jump thing, it would just like print I've executed jump. Right. All right. And in, in, uh, what he's saying is you can actually include code predefined to know what you want the operation to do. And so it won't just print jump, it'll execute code to actually make the whole guy jump. That code is what? Is it like, is it Java code that you write? Is it, is it any language? Uh, we can. Currently, it's in Java or C for two things. But I think we, we, we see it, it can be doable for any language. It's just, it, probably sure. operation just has a subprocess can call the uh, another file also. That's that bigger possibilities. Technical implementation is like there is no reach. The conceptual thing, basically, you're starting to you invoke that operation. What it does, of course, you have to define what it does. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that, that that schema really allows us to do the planning and sub goaling which is very important so if you have a goal then if you you can create a sub goal then you can create a planning i mean we are out of time but i i know that's kind of it's really difficult to explain especially if you if you know if you're just seeing it the first time to be honest so maybe we can draw other questions so we can really start uh, implementation for the, for the open source application, and then we can see the demonstration of that in action. Can I ask one question? Please. On the forgetting, what about like abstraction? So, you want to summarize information? Is that like soft forgetting? Or summarize information? Uh, there is not nothing like summarize information. Only can revise. Summarize, like for example, you have two things. Instead of forgetting one, you're going to focus them together. So now it's one. If you if 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 you have two things, uh, again, if, if they produce some if they produce some derivation, right, uh, and then uh, the, the the time between the derivation is like long. There is a threshold how many derivations you can do. Then you can summarize them as a revision if they have the common evidence, right? But there is not there is no procedure of that in each cycle you go through entire concept in the memory right and still in summarizing them or like making making summary because you cannot really do that you cannot really accomplish that in a constant time okay so you only on so, so when you're deciding like the priority of the quality yes those engineering decisions are just to maintain the constant time operations as far as the theory goes you could define them a lot of different ways uh, we have the true we have the budget function that determines that Right. And, and and that budget function is a resource. So based on ICAR assumptions, sufficient knowledge, we decided to do design it like that. Otherwise, we cannot really complete it in the constant time. Okay, I think that makes I think I think right because there's no way you can really go after each cycle and. Uh, really revise all of the knowledge you have in the system. You can have like end up with the thousands, hundreds of thousands of concepts there interconnecting with each other, right? Right, so yeah, so right. For like form abstraction. Right, like right, right. If, 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 if whatever you're currently operating on, selecting is very, have a high priority, right? So there is a very big chance. So next time you also select it, because even if you forget it a little bit, it's still going to be very high. In relevance to other things, right? And then and that's the idea of priority. If it's very high, so you can process this multiple times. So you always select that. And this this is comes at your revision. So if you produce the same derivation, if for example we have something we call evidential base, evidential base is the uh, trail of the derivations it made from. So like like how how many generations it come from. So we have a certain limit, like you, for example, can forget from where we remember things, right? Like, like we can forget. So if there is limit, it's like bigger than the limit, then we can, we can revise the knowledge.
but but we cannot go like off the cycle to linearly scan all the system experience and then modify it. I'm it's not just, going that far. I was just saying, could you design a mechanism for forgetting the specific about abstraction? You're basically saying it's better to let abstraction happen as part of derivations. Right, <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. Um, I have a question going back to the the, the quality and okay. uh, how it decays. Um, if you have some facts in the system that are like, let's say from a practical point of view, business rules, let's say Amazon, if you're a prime customer, you don't pay for shipping. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it could be some logic rule. And you want that never to be forgotten. I assume you could set the quality to one and it will never forget it. It is lock it in um, probably. Uh, I, I, it, it's still going to be forgo forgotten. Very good question, actually. Same as the operation, it's still going to be forgotten. Depends on how long it's not being processed, because eventually, uh, basically, it's, there will be something will be with, with higher thing. But you can repeatedly put it to the memory, such as you can uh, such things with operations, so which you repeatedly like bubble them to the memory to such thing. Okay, so there really is no thing. There's really no such thing as long-term memory. Or, uh, there is, there is, there is. There is. Rely on the fact, like, uh, but but uh, there is, but there's nothing like that holds this forever there. Most likely, it will not be forgotten if that quality is very high. Most likely, yes, you can set it like that way. But you are not guaranteed that there is another thing will be more uh, have have bigger quality than that. Yeah, I think for uh, business applications, that's going to be a problem. Uh, if you have to design it, that it has to remind itself of, you know, a whole bunch of things uh, in case that particular piece of information is not required for, you know, a fairly long time. But if, you know, it could be something that is a very rare business rule, but an important business rule, and you wouldn't want it to be forgotten. Um, so I think that you really need a mechanism to be able to lock in certain facts um like even an upper ontology or something well, um, right but if uh, right that, 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 that's the thing right but even if you yeah that, 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 but that's uh, but then a question for you want what if you want probably then you introduce to the system even yourself you can introduce something with a higher quality as an input so you say like, like amazon has to ship for free right so always there but then you say FedEx always also has to ship for free. Then everyone has to ship for free. Eventually, you will you will you will basically uh, put all the memory put all the memory for the for your rules, right? And you have to have balance in, among them. Well, yes. I mean, that's just, uh, I'm assuming here that the number of uh, these absolute facts right, right. Uh, would always be less. It would be a small percentage right. of your overall memory capacity so that you could afford to always keep them um, you know in memory you could force them in memory right right in in, in this case so we probably yes we can set it high for very long for very long term memory very long term memory mm -hmm. but in the case it's forgotten maybe n number of cycles we only can rebubble them so something like that okay. But, but, but you're right, there are some flaws there. Yeah. Things. Uh, yeah, I think for our purposes, the system will need to, need to be changed. Uh, Patrick, can you comment on that? So that you can be guaranteed that certain knowledge will always be there. Patrick? Uh, uh, yes. From, from, from application standpoint, open for application. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are in openness for applications there's or uh, there's actually a way to to specify Patrick, that second, some please. input should have a very can you hear me yeah go ahead oh, okay uh, in openness for applications there's actually a way to to specify at input uh, that something should have a very high quality but this essentially means uh, like in this case we just mentioned that there is enough space then it it will also not not forget uh, the the knowledge. So because for application purposes, it's often good if one can like uh, equip the system with some kind of background knowledge which it needs for the task. And th th this one would be good if it would be would be kept right. And 
so so, so in openness for applications there is a way to, to do this but but i think also in openness uh, isn't there a uh, beta isn't there a, a way to to have a uh, to pass the, the quality value uh in the old version uh you only uh, uh kind of assign a default or initial uh, priority oh. on the durability. Uh, but uh, to assign quality, I have no problem, no technical problem. I just, we haven't found a situation where that become necessary. So I, I don't think that's a problem. Mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, when was showing uh, NARS was integrated with a uh, largest system, right? So it was taken input from machine learning models, so that's not part of NARS itself. And then it was also, if I remember the diagram right, it was consulting a database of facts, like a knowledge base, that also wasn't technically part of NARS. Is, is that kind of what you're talking about? Like where the, it needs to be able to consult a set of business rules that you mentioned. Does it actually have to be internalized to NARS or is it done through an interface similar to operations? Or, or, or am I completely off base? No, uh, uh, actually, both is is, uh, is a fan. Uh, there can be like an external uh, knowledge source, which the system can make use of. Um, but uh, it also has its own memory structure, which has a fixed capacity. And uh, so, so uh, once you have a fixed capacity, it means uh, if you have sufficient pieces of information, at some point you will run out of capacity, meaning at some point you have to decide what to keep and what to forget. And w once this happens, it essentially means uh, there has to be a way to decide what is more important than, than other knowledge. And for humans, this happens all the time. And uh, for and uh, of course, in a computer system, we could argue, couldn't we simply make the database larger? But then there is also a resource uh, issue. Even if we have a, a larger database, so somehow we need to make sure that the processing that the system performs is, uh, is essentially priming for the relevant information. And, uh, and the larger the memory gets, uh, the harder this is to do. And so, so from a resource perspective, uh, in a computer system, if you want the system to, to have like a real-time responsibility, there will always be a limit on, on how, how, how large this, this database can be. But of course, it's, it's valid to have like an external knowledge, but then, then even remembering what to look for and where to look for is itself something which can for, be forgotten. And we humans have the same issue all the time when we search for information on Wikipedia. We have this knowledge base which we can extend and extend. But we also need to, to have some way to reference uh, and uh, like the, by, by the words we are using in our language, it allows us to search Wikipedia pages. And sometimes we for, forget where at Wikipedia we found a certain piece of information. And so we have to search again and it is very natural. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jeff, you have your hand a rough idea of uh, the size you are currently, um, you know, how many elements, memory elements, or whatever you measure is, you know, is it millions, tens of millions, or hundreds of thousands, or what it is? Sorry, you guys, you guys aren't here. Huh? Uh, that's great, then. Right. <laughs> that, that is Peter, wow. Well. So nice to see you again, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> uh, to your question, uh, uh, essentially, uh, currently we have some limitations in terms of uh, memory size, but uh, but a few uh, million nodes. Uh, we have implementations which uh, support like ten million nodes without an issue, but but. Uh, to, to make it even larger, that there are some implementation challenges, and uh, but but, uh, but I think it's a solvable problem largely because we, we did not really spend too much time yet on scaling the system. 
uh, Tony Loft has uh, spent most of the time uh, trying to work out uh, 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 how to scale the system up. Um, but uh, but uh, uh, I personally, for instance, was more focused at uh, at, uh, at uh, sensory motor aspects and, uh, and not at scaling in terms of amount of concepts the system can store. But but in, in principle, I expect that uh, that, that uh, if some effort is invested into into looking at how to scale the data structures and so on, it it would also scale to a hundred million or so. Okay, so seven million is that the number? Oh yes, I think the largest uh, largest was uh, ten million. Okay. Well, for language, that's quite a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so, so, uh, I, I like your example of uh, Wikipedia, where even humans have a, right, like we have this vast store that we can tap on demand. However, even remembering what to search for like keywords, how to search for it, that's important. Um, I guess, is there a way to express uh, so assuming that you have an R system and you give it an interface to check an external database, right? Keeping the resource constraint in mind, is there a way to express the, the importance of set a goal? Like, right? Like if I'm talking about an expert, I'm okay for them to take a few extra minutes to consult a certain system, like a medical dictionary of some sort, right? To get me a more correct answer. So it's okay if it takes a few cycles, and I like here. Like, a, can I communicate that kind of a concept to it uh, in the present state, or have we considered that? Uh -huh. uh, this essentially then becomes a, a sensor remote a problem because uh, essentially what we want is the system to actively query a database in order to search for certain information, and uh, it, uh, we we have been exploring this, uh, but. Uh, but it's uh, of course a challenge <laughs> because sensor remoter is even a challenge for much simpler things like Pong and uh, and reinforcement learning typical problems. Uh, so it's uh, uh, to, to some degree we have this ability of let letting the NAS query uh, external uh, database that's possible. But so far there there, there are some limitations in, in how it can can do this. Mentioned that it's sensory motor problem. I wouldn't have thought of it this way, but okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, is it my turn now, or Peter? <laughs> Shall we start with here? Let's go have like one hour and the demonstration. Uh huh. Okay. It can it can be mixed, I believe now because of time. Mm -hmm. uh, let me share my screen. So uh, <laughs> what I will present is essentially what's what is this openness for application system and uh, also my work on it. Um, uh, <laughs> maybe I should explain the broader picture here because uh, even as a child, I was always fascinated uh, about uh, robots and I always imagined that at some point in the future, we could have a robot which is able to, to learn new tricks at random. and. Uh, this was always fascinating to me, and uh, maybe my subconsciousness led me to this to this uh, to this topic for my dissertation, which I completed in July. And uh, what I investigated was essentially uh, something which led me to a journey towards data-efficient, open-ended learning of sensory motor contingencies, as found in nature. What I mean by this is, uh, for instance, if we look in psychology literature, we will find uh, notions like classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and so on. And what's fascinating about these notions is that when we look at the, at the experimental results is that, that animals uh, are able to learn from few observations very, very uh, 
very relevant or uh, often survival relevant uh, um, uh, facts about the environment. And this is often not even tied to some kind of external reward like explored in reinforcement learning, but it can simply be from observation. Like uh, if, if we have a cat and we have a, a, a water hose, and uh, I, I remember my cat, uh, <laughs> I, had to, I had to water the plants and I used the water hose. I did not even hit the cat, but the cat was since this day always, always uh, in alarmed when I, when I even went close to the water hose, even though I did not even hit it. It saw from observation what happened, that water was spilling out of this thing. And this is something it somehow didn't like. <laughs> And so how is this intrinsic what uh, reward generated and how, what is happening there? Uh, how is this possible that such an animal is able to learn such complex causal relationships ships, uh, from, from just one observation? And this led me to this journey of open-ended learning of sensory motor contingencies, which I find is heavily underexplored in current machine learning, if explored at all. But there are some AGI systems which try to address this challenge. And one of them is the one I built. And another one is maybe the, the one, uh, uh, of course, uh, of course, NAS in general is supposed to be able to do this. But NAS is it, it's coming from a slightly different direction, which is it, it's coming from this investigation of what, uh, what rules of thought might look like, what are, what are valid structures of thought which humans apply in everyday reasoning and what I did is to, to turn this around and to look from sensory motor perspective to essentially take NAS principles which are which are more coming from the investigation of human thought and then to see how they apply to sensory motor world how to how to get to a system which can make use of these principles in order to operate in the real world in order to, to learn at random and in order to learn to reach scores during operation. And so this get, gets us to this key notion of real-time learning or may, maybe even better said learning at random simply. It's what gives many species key advantages over others in a way that they can outsmart them from 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 facts they have learned about uh, learned from from a few observations, and it's something which can which highly distinguishes uh, the general purpose intelligent systems we find in nature over, for instance, the special purpose solutions we build today, which are not able to learn at random. And uh, of course, for many AI systems, it's fine. You can train them as long as you want. You can put them into a simulation. And then when you put them in the real world, they fail because the real world does not behave the same way like, like the, the simulation. There are factors which the sim simulation did not include or the data set was too small or whatever. And uh, so it would be good if, if, the, if there could be ad adaptation happening at, the, at random of while, while the system is operating. And not having it trained before and then applied and then it's fixed. No, to have to have it learn during its lifetime. And uh, this, uh, of course, uh, here, maybe this I don't need to explain. Uh, so, so I have taken this non-axiomatic reasoning system by by Wang and tried to build uh, to to focus more on sensory motors, sensory motor aspects using this system, and. Uh, some properties of this system come in very handy. It's uh, by design, uh, uh, it's working under the assumption of insufficient knowledge and resources, meaning that the processing demands it has are finite. And so it cannot get stuck in some kind of reasoning loop. It's, uh, it's, always, it's always open to receive new information at random uh, and, uh, and to operate in real time. And uh, what it shares, what, what this uh, implementation, OpenNAS for Applications implementation does, uh, uh, does of course use is also this non-axiomatic logic of NAS, since it is essentially a non-axiomatic reasoning system implementation focused on sensory model. And if we look at the non-axiomatic logic, it has some, some uh, it has, clearly it has high expressive power. It can, it can, uh, 
express uh, relationships like general uh, special uh, special case general case relationships or that something is an instance of something or has certain properties we can express temporal relationship like lightning leads to thunder can build sequences of stimuli and and so on and uh, one distinguishing feature which <laughs> actually uh, for many newcomers who look at NAS they think it's just another symbolic system well in reality if we compare it with with uh, with uh, reasoning systems which have proposed have been proposed in the last decades it's completely different it's for instance uh, the truth value is not binary it's not like there's some kind of facts which we enter which are true or false instead the this, uh, as Peter already mentioned, it's evidence values which are associated to each statement. It's a simple idea to have a positive and a negative evidence counter which can speak for and against a certain hypothesis. And with this, you, uh, you, one can then define like this frequency value, which is the, the positive evidence over the total evidence, or the confidence value, which is essentially the total evidence mapped to a value between zero and one. To, to have a way to measure how many samples we have already seen. So, the, so NAS is essentially able to distinguish, like uh, if it has to decide is the coin fair, there's a difference if it, if it did 10 coin flips, if it, uh, if it got five hats compared to it did 100 coin flips and got 50 hats. In both cases, the empirical frequency is the same frequency 0.5. But the confidence value in the second case is significantly higher. And this is something which uh, this goes so far that there's a, you should really read uh, Dr. Bai Wang's paper about comparison with probability theory, because there's very strong argument in there that it's not sufficient to use a probability value, but to have two values, one which allows you to, to have this kind of empirical frequency and the other which essentially in probabilistic terms allow you to keep track of the size of the sample space you have collected so far. It's not simply sufficient to have the frequency value. This is why they run into the issues with, with, the, with, the, uh, with the prior probabilities and so on. It's, it's, it's a big issue of, of making, making open-ended inference work with a Bayesian approach. I'm not saying it cannot be done, but but this is way more natural and uh, and way more easy to implement as well. And I don't see a limitation in this. So one key, in the, we, we talked about this example with the water hose. And this is really an example where an animal is able to learn a temporal relationship from one observation, often even. And how, how is this? Uh, how is this represented in NAS? So, so, so for this implementation of, of NAS, which I focused on for my dissertation, I really made sure that learning temporal relationships would be rock solid. So this is really where I spent a lot of time in. And uh, the idea is, for instance, if there is an event sequence A, B, C, it would be in, in NAS truth value term, it would mean that there is positive evidence attributed to the hypothesis that A leads to B, and that there is positive evidence attributed to the, to the hypothesis that A and B together leads to C, so separate hypothesis, and also hypothesis that A leads to C. And now the interesting thing is, what if A happens, but B does not? So suddenly, in this case, we, we get negative evidence for, for A leads to B, right? Because A happened, we predicted B, but B did not happen. Prediction did not meet reality. It's essentially a form of predictive coding, which is not to confuse with reinforcement learning, which is very different. Because in this case, we are not even talking about reward. We are simply talking about which event will cause another to occur. And in this case, we can interpret the truth value of non-axiomatic logic in a very specific way. We can say that the frequency mostly corresponds to the success of a temporal implication to predict the outcome. And the confidence is simply how many samples have we seen so far, according to the data the system has seen so far. So 
And I, I, I tried to, to make this as, as effective as possible. And uh, one, of the, one of the biggest issues we often faced in previous implementations or still do is how to control the inference process. And there, uh, a colleague of mine uh, and friend, Tony Lofthouse, has spent a lot of time to, to find uh, uh, control models which work better. And, and the work I did was highly inspired by his work. And he also helped me to, to design this system, which led to openness for applications. It's a also general purpose uh, reasoning system, but with a strong focus on sensory motor aspects. And, um, and uh, I did not intend to, to cover all regularities of thought or inference rules, which non-axiomatic logic supports. Instead, I took a more engineering-based approach, which is to only include what, I've, what turns out to be necessary for the, for the experiments I want to be able to show. So the desired capabilities of this system is uh, to learn from event streams in real time without interruption. So there is no separation between training and and uh, and and runtime. Uh, so of course one can still test the performance of the system, but it it will keep learning and based on the new observations it it makes. Um, should extract sensory motor contingencies on this way. And this sensory, con uh, sensory motor contingencies are essentially temporal patterns like this one, where B happens to be an operation, like Peter showed before. These are central to this system because if the system is able to effectively learn sensory motor contingencies, meaning, uh, meaning, uh, <laughs> um, if it's effective to learn sensory motor contingencies, it means the system is able to learn which operation causes which outcomes under which circumstances. And if it's able to do this, it's able to use the sensory motor contingencies to plan ahead and to reach different outcomes. The interesting thing is the sensory motor contingency itself does not talk about reward. It's simply talking about, uh, 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 about under this context, if I do this, then that will happen. And so, so it's core independent. So if we think about like, how can we do transfer learning? There's not even a need to transfer anything to, to a new task because these representations are not limited to a specific task. So when the core changes, it will simply use different sensory, content, sensory motor contingencies, but they are, they, are, they are not limited to a certain outcome. Uh, but I will show, show in more detail how, how this looks like. Essentially, the idea is to, to make it uh, learn a more causal representation of the world, which can then be used in various ways to, to reach different goals. So there's nothing to transfer in that sense. Um, yes, and I, I, I put a strong focus on, on using this system for robotic solutions because I think it's this system is the key of reaching truly autonomous systems, not in the autonomous driving sense, like we, have, we learn one behavior, which is good enough and every car can be shipped with it and it will be fine. No, I'm talking about systems which can really learn new sensory contingencies from a handful of observations at random. That's a, that's a very different thing. Of course, the, of course, what this will be used for is a different thing, but this is a property which animals have and which is poorly understood and which I want to replicate. And uh, this owner architecture openness for applications is, is a quite simple, simple design. It's, uh, the idea is to have different sensory channels and they can use state-of-the-art deep learning technology, for instance, for vision, like to adapt a YOLO, like, like we did in several applications, and to have like a different channel for sound and maybe, maybe touch and different kinds of sensory channels which produce, uh, which, which turn signals, physical signals into a representation NAS can work with. And this, so, so each of these uh, sensory channels uh, puts information out into this FIFO sequencer. This is very simple at current stage. It's simply a large array, which, which uh, takes the information from the sensory channels and build sequences in the order 
they appear. So when a certain information, we get a piece A from the vision channel, piece B from the auditory channel, then this FIFO, FIFO sequence will build A, B sequence, which is like a, a compound, a, a, comp a compositional event, which has both the vision information and the sound information. So it's, it's, and and uh, of course, all the memory structures here are fixed. So the FIFO sequence what the name suggests, it simply shifts out all the events. So it's a, a, bit, a bit like transformer models, it has a fixed, uh, a fixed, uh, fixed horizon essentially. And, uh, but it's much, it's, it is very simple. It essentially means if, if an event is too hard, it will, it will make place for new events. So this is some design limitation. It means that the temporal relationships, it can form uh, like in the, 10 to 20, maybe 10 seconds scale, because, but it, of course it depends on the configuration. But, but if, a, if a system can learn sensory motor contingencies across a 10 to 20 uh, second scale, that's already extremely useful. Um, and uh, from here, it goes into the, uh, into the uh, attention uh, buffer of the system. Uh, cycling events queue is a correlate. What this one essentially is, is it's the central attentional control point of the system. It's where events, both derived ones and input events, compete for attention. And in each moment or in each inference cycle, one piece of information is taken out here. And a, a second element is a relevant item is searched from, uh, or is taken from concept memory. So if we have like an event, um, something like, uh, um, uh, pattern one is uh, pattern one is yellow, and then you have in concept memory something like ducks are yellow. Then it will derive something like uh, pattern one is a duck, for instance, with a certain truth value. Of course, there can be many different uh, competing hypotheses. Many things which are yellow, many things which have been observed to be yellow, and build this. So there, there can be many categories which have this property. So it's not a one, to one. So it's not a classification problem. It's not like we search for the, for the most uh, likely class this belongs to. To know if there can be multiple competing interpretations in the system. It's just that in every moment it just selects one piece here, and if there are multiple one, ones, it means the other ones won't be used in this right moment. So so that's uh, so there is a central attention buffer, and this is really the overall diagram where, where I distinguish sensory motor inference and sem semantic inference based on what Peter said, which is uh, in, in one case, uh, there's always a semantic relationship between the premises. In this case, it was the, it was the yellow property, which might be detected by a vision channel. Like if there's a color detection associated. Um, so it can, uh, can do this kind of inference, but it can also do the temporal one, uh, where, for instance, there is already a relationship. Lightning leads to thunder, and now the system observed lightning. So what we wanted to derive is thunder. So we got a thunder event in here. It was not observed, but it was predicted. Um, it's quite simple design, but actually turned out to be very, uh, very, uh, um, very useful and in a sense also the simplicity of the design also makes it easy to study what the limitations of such a simple structure for real-time learning are. If we look at the real-time data mining or data stream uh, literature, it's act actually quite common to use some kind of FIFO or sliding window approach. So this is, this, uh, this is uh, not uncommon for such architectures because uh, in data stream mining, even though they are not about learning sensory motor contingencies or even using them for decision making, but they have a similar problem, which is to extract like uh, frequent patterns out of the uh, out of the event stream. So this is uh, something which is shared in some sense. Well, this is more like the classical inference engine uh, inference loop. Uh, memory structure wise, uh, it's a bit simpler than the than the uh, openness uh, implementation um, because here uh, uh, 
it creates essentially only nodes for for entire statements like an event which have a event associated like door one is closed and there, there can be an implication link uh, like open uh, with a with an operation attached which leads to something like an, another event like door one is open so it can represent effectively uh, sensory motor contingencies. The debris condition in this case is door one is closed. The operation in this case is open. And the consequence in this case is door one is open. And for semantic inference, in order for these nodes to be, to be uh, used in semantic inference, there's, it's also using the, this common structure that door one is, is a pattern or a term which both, both uh, concepts share. Yes, uh, the inference words were already covered a lot, so I will not go there. Maybe for sensory motor, uh, um, it's important to, to have uh, this kind of induction word uh, so that when we get an event A and event B, that it can form this relationship A leads to B. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, this, this, will, this will strengthen the relationship. So essentially, it's not true or false. It's the, the more often this occurs, the more stronger this hypothesis will be. And prediction-wise, it makes sense if we have this hypothesis to be able to predict the, the thing we, which is suggested by the hypothesis, right? And then the question is, does the thing we, we predict really happen or does it not happen? If it happens, fine. If it does not happen, the, predict, the hypothesis was not successful in predicting the outcome. So it receives negative evidence. Uh, additionally, uh, sensory motor inference um, is, uh, <laughs> that is also covering a uh, uh, core derivation, which Peter also uh, mentioned. And there are two key principles in, in this, uh, in, in how this, uh, core derivation takes place in openness for applications. Um, one is if there is a sensory motor contingency, meaning some precondition, uh, if a certain precondition happens and there's some, some operation executed, then a certain outcome will appear. Then, then uh, and if, if the precondition is currently fulfilled and the outcome is wanted, then we want to execute the operation, right? But it's not easy like that. There can be multiple candidate hypotheses how to get G from current circumstances. So as Peter mentioned, we essentially want to, want to execute the operation which, which uh, has the highest proof expectation and saying, yes, if we do this, then the outcome will happen. So essentially we sell, select the highest proof expectation operation, which applies to this context. And also applying how much the context uh, is true is also a matter of degree because C itself is an event with a certain truth value. So it can be, can be, can be of low truth value or high truth value. So whether it will use a certain operation depends both on the, on the amount uh, or on the strength of the sensory motor contingency or the truth expectation of the sensory motor contingency. It will also depend on the, on the truth value of the, of the precondition. And also how much we want G to happen. But if we, if we say, yes, this one is fixed, then essentially we simply want, we want the, the operation which has a hypothesis where the precondition is most fulfilled and also the, also the implication is, is, is very strong so that this one ends up as the winner. And so this is re relevant, but sometimes it can happen that there that, that there is no such, uh, that, that essentially it's not possible to get to the, to the desired outcome with a single decision step. So in this case, what it means is that it, it has to derive the, 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 the precondition, preconditions of this uh, hypothesis as a, as, as a subcore. And, I, and a part of this, uh, a very important part of this openness for applications is how to do this exactly. And I'm very sure that, that over the last year, I had I thought a lot about this, and 
the more I think about it, I think it's very close to what it needs to be. And I will show an example of, of how, how this is working. Um, this is the algorithm, algorithmic form of the principle I just described. Maybe this one is, <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll, we'll just dive into an example for this. So let's say there are, there is, uh, there are certain, certain sensory motor contingencies the system has observed through motor bubbling. Motor bubbling is the idea that sometimes it just tries a random operation at the beginning in order to learn some temporal relationships or sensory motor contingencies. So let's say it, it has three sensory motor contingencies. One says, if operation one is executed under circumstance A, then B will happen. If operation two is executed under circumstance B, then G will happen. If operation three is executed under circumstance C, then G will happen. And this is the graph which corresponds to this three sensory motor contingencies. Now let's say uh, the system wants to to, to make G happen. So G is a gore. But what we see here different than in reinforcement learning, there's not like one gore we want to achieve. No, gores can, can change. Something which is desired in this moment can be undesired in the next moment. I like pizza, but if I had too much of it, I don't want to continue the pizza eating behavior anymore, for instance. And um, so, so gores are inherently, they are also events, so to speak. They can change in any moment. But, and let's say G is now, now the, the gore the system has. It wants to achieve G. And this is the, this is the graph it has. And uh, so what it can now do, uh, let's say it has seen A, not B, because if it would have seen B, it would make sense to execute operation two, but it has not seen B. So we are talking now really about the scenario we had no precondition is fulfilled. So it's, so it's looking at the incoming links for G. It's really only doing local memory lookup. It's looking at the incoming links of G. It notices, okay, there's, there's not even the, the, any, any event associated with, with B and C. So there's nothing it can do other than to derive B and C as a subcore. So this is what it does now. It has derived B and C as a subcore. Let's say next time it takes C from the cycling events Q. There's nothing it can do here. There's no incoming link. So this event, so the score event will simply die. Next, next thing which will be taken off from the, from the priority Q will be B. B has incoming links, namely one incoming link in this case. And this incoming link happens to have its precondition fulfilled. And so the operation, uh, uh, it, has, it has an event which was recently observed. And so what it does now is to execute the operation which is associated with the sensory motor contingency with the expectation for B to happen. Let's say it was lucky and it really got B to happen. So what will happen now is this relationship will be strengthened because the sensory motor contingency was just reobserved. A happened with executed operation one and B happened, as, ha happened then thereafter. So we now we, we strengthen this relationship. So now G event comes again. Uh, G gore comes comes again. It still wants to wants to realize G. Now there are again two incoming links to compete. This one again has not even its precondition fulfilled, and so it's no wonder that this combination, the, the truth value of this link plus the truth value of this event, happens to be so strong that operation two will be the winner here. This one will have the highest trough expectation, so operation two will be executed. Now, let's say it was unlucky. Ideally, if this would have happened, it would have succeeded and she would have happened and it would have reached its score. But let's say it was unlucky. It wanted to achieve, it wanted to, to get to G, but it also executed operation two because it has already seen B but it did not happen. She did not happen differently than it ex 
expected. So this link received negative evidence. So this is what we, what we end up with. This just illustrates how credit is assigned in this, in such sensory contingency networks as Ono is supposed to build from experience. Um, yes, uh, for my thesis, I also did some some comparison with reinforcement learning because, of course, if you can do this, like uh, having a gore, then then you simply need to assume, okay, we always input the same core, like for reinforcement learning examples, there's simply always the same core. So we can also simulate the case of having a, a fixed utility function, that's fine. So and I needed to do this because it makes sense if we have some new kind of uh, method to be able to compare it with what's out there. And uh, we started with a simple comparison with uh, Q-learning, uh, which is also able to deal with this temporal credit assignment problem for behavior learning, but it only does for one signal, which is the reward signal. It does not learn a causal, a causal understanding of the environment. It only learns which, which action to take in which state, namely the action which leads to the highest expected reward. And so, but there's, there's enough over, overlap because if we take this reward as a gore, and we assume, simply assume that it's always there, then we can try similar experiments, right? And, but before we dive there, there's a, an issue with Q-learning uh, is learning rate. Learning rate is often decayed manually, uh, sometimes dependent on the, uh, like dependent on the time which has passed, which is very unnatural. It's like an assumption that, that over the passing of time, more evidence would be collected. In NAS, it's, it's, it's exactly the evidence. The more, the, more, the more evidence has been collected about a certain sensory contingency, the more stable it will be. So there's no need to do any kind of hack decay of learning rate. And this is also relevant because what happens if you decay this learning rate more and more over time? It means in the future it cannot really on it will not it will not be able to deal with non stationary stationary environments where some relationships simply change. It will be stuck. So it's not a good principle. And uh, but for the, for the experiments, uh, I had at least the goal to reach similar outcomes like a well like Q learning with well chosen hyperparameters, and I was able to do this in in space invaders and uh, also in in bong i got similar scores but in bong actually before i get i got there i had this interesting phenomenon because my, my particular simulation of bong did not uh, did not uh, have an implicit stop in the right or left action there was a third action stop and this essentially meant that the environment became non Markovian in the sense that that what the system will see next will depend on whether it caught the stop operation or not. So it, it was already a, a very simple example, which turned out to be non Markovian. In, uh, and this led to very bad performance of the Q learner compared to owner, which does not, which does not depend on this assumption of of a Markov property. My trick, sorry to interrupt. Can we speed up a little bit? Or oh, yes. Or... Oh, yes, uh, I'm almost done. Uh, there, I also have uh, on, on YouTube, you can watch my presentation. I think I also got the comparison with, with Q-learning in case someone is interested. But there, are, but it's very different, uh, but I had to compare with something because if it's something new, and I want to put it in my dissertation. I had to compare with some existing techniques. I also compared with BDI models, and but uh, this would go too far now. Uh, this this owner thing uh, project uh, goes on since uh, the, the first release I put on GitHub on February 2020 or so, and uh, so it's more than one year. And interestingly, there were many contributors who were interested and contributed code. And of course, also the, the core open NAS team, so to speak, uh, Tony Lofthouse and Robert Venture have made significant contributions. And uh, yes, of course, Rob, Robert Johansson here. Uh, 
and Francesco uh, Lanza from Pardemos team. Uh, they have or, or made very good additions also in terms of adding sensory channels to interface like with convolutional and convolutional neural networks. So to, to be able to utilize object detection models and so on. Um, yes, that's about the open source repository. Um, and what else? Yes, there were some, some projects which we did uh, generally with NAS implementations. Um, that, that, uh, all, of the, all of them here were also done with owner, but the one here at the, at the uh, right lower corner was was actually uh, started with openness. It was later also to read with honor. It was essentially traffic surveillance to, 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 de to detect certain kinds of anomalies like pedestrians walking over, over, uh, over a road to detect jaywalking. And then th this project, which, uh, which Dr. Thomas Law mentioned uh, previously, which is uh, this uh, driving uh, not driving assistance, more like mission assistance for first responders to detect them of potential, uh, to warn them of potential dangers. And also in my PhD thesis, I moved more to robotic control experiments where, where I used this real-time learning capability and, and reasoning capability to control robots, because this is something which deep learning still does not do, even though there are some academics who work on like end-to-end -end trained uh, solutions it's hardly in use at all roboticists use planning algorithms in order to make the the, the robots operate and planning is essentially the utilization of sensory motor contingencies the idea to reach certain outcomes by using some kind of almost causal representations um but yes i will stop here <laughs> Um, but uh, what I only want to show additionally is maybe to get a, a very short hands-on on how to start up this system and to get started with it. Um, uh, when one can directly clone uh, the repository. Um, it's here. There's a open NAS, open NAS fabrications repository where one can simply clone the newest source code. Then there is a build script included. Um, let's go there. The build script included, and it will compile the system within a few seconds. And uh, and if everything went went well, one can simply run it with with this uh, by executing the binary this way, and then it will tell you whether whether the test cases passed. It looks good. RC tests run successfully. And then it also will show you some experiments which are done in this shell version. Like uh, maybe let's start one like Bong2, which is Bong with three operations. Let's see if we are lucky, it quickly learns the red contingencies. Usually it's just a matter of seconds. Here we go. So this is like the bong with three actions, left, right, and stop. Yes. And uh, there are some other examples like uh, like this, where where it's in a bird view environment, and it has it it's essentially like a labyrinth, <laughs> or like 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 simulation of rooms with obstacles, and it has to collect food well, uh, food objects while avoiding the war, so it has to learn to to navigate in this environment while collecting objects, but this also just usually takes some, doesn't take long for it to learn valuable sensory motor contingencies to get this task done. Um, what else? Uh, there is evaluation uh, scripts included. So if one makes changes to the, to the code, one can directly look at the 
with various metrics like uh, how long does it does it take for it to answer questions how long does it uh, did, how long does it take to to get certain goals achieved how many of the goals which were entered was it able to achieve and so on so there are certain success measures which can be used in order to evaluate the performance of the system on various tasks um it's like an automatic evaluation suit. Um, what else? Um, maybe a very brief uh, mentioning of the Python interface, which is quite useful. There is a Python interface for the system, uh, which can simply be invoked with input now. And then when one can input uh, things into it. The first thing we see here is simply to make it not print derivations to the console. This is just a command. But other, other than that, we can simply input some information. Like we can, let's say we start with a simple example where we don't even want to learn sensory motor contingencies, but simply want to see whether it can plan, let's say. To, to, like we say, if, if there is a B and, and left is executed, A will happen, or if B, like the letter of the alphabet, if we have B and we move to the left, we get A. If we have B and we move to the right, we get C. If we have C and we move to the right, we get D. And um, let's say we are currently at B and we want to go to D. So it's already a two-step decision-making process. And we also expected the system to, to do this. And so it will suggest to move to the right side. And since it has, so it has essentially, it's like a form of planning, just that there is no explicit planning algorithm, but it's more like a planning process where, where goals are selected from this priority queue and lead to additional sub until eventually one of them meets a reality in a sense that precondition is fulfilled and the next step can be initiated with the execution of an operation. So it's a, uh, so it's essentially a planning process, which is realized through this real re, uh, reasoning process. Uh, reasoning process. It's, it's not an algorithm per se, which says, now I need to search a space till I find a sequence of operation to, to reach a certain outcome. It's not like that. It's really the mechanism I have shown you in the slides. Um, Yes, uh, so one, one can do this. So like for planning tasks would be an example. Another would be like uh, more classical NAS style question answering, like what if Garfield is the cat and the cat is an animal, then who is an animal? So we, we can also try this. Oh. So question answering would be one application of the system that it gives you the, the instance which best fits to this description uh, according to the evidence the system has. Well, another more interesting uh, one, which I find personally interesting is, uh, what if we have a sequence ABC, 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 and uh, then we get Bs and Bs and Bs, but no C, and As and As and As, but no C. So it should really learn that need the B alone nor A alone can predict C, but both together, if both of them together appear, then C will happen. So it's essentially learning, learning that a certain composition of events is necessary in order to predict another event. And it's able to do exactly this and very effectively. So it's like compound conditioning. And the answer it gives us is that A and B together is necessary in order to, to get C. So it really learned that neither A nor B alone is sufficient. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's all. I guess I'm out of time anyway, right, Peter? <laughs> Or not? Do I still have them? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, Surprisingly, you still have a few minutes and then we can open for questions. If you have questions, right? Uh, 
or, or, you, or you can demo the Janers, or you can continue demoing your thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you think the demo is sufficient for Janers? Uh, yep. Okay. We have like 12 more minutes. Mm -hmm. So oh, five yeah. more minutes, for five more minutes for Janers, then we can go to question session, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but maybe before I move there, uh, I just wanted to mention, I hope I, I was able to fascinate, fascinate you about the world of sensory motor contingencies and of finding ways to learning and utilizing them at random, because this is something I think is highly underexplored. And it's most likely what, what makes our pets learn tricks and learn observation and so on. So if this, if we cannot replicate this well in machines, then we are solving the wrong problems. Okay, then, <laughs> then now I will move to the previous implementation of uh, OpenNAS, which uh, or previous is the wrong, but it's more like uh, the one which is more centered, uh, centered at uh, less at sensory motor and more about uh, making sure that our, our valid regularities of thought are captured. Um, but maybe that this is better if you present this version better because you, you have more experience with this with this NAS implementation. No, you can you, you can just run a few examples with NLP probably. Uh, oh. that would Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's really important going over the call. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but then maybe let's start the goal because the goal is so. So if if one wants to get a first uh, experience with with NAS, uh, it's maybe good to to use the the graphical user interface. Um, this one is not available for Open NAS for applications, but it's available for for Open NAS. And uh, for instance, one could do question answering experiments like uh, instance one is is yellow and uh, ducks are yellow. I'm not, I'm not sure how, how well you can see my screen because the, the text is, the font is really small. Um, just yes, say, so let's say Raven instance, uh, different types of animals with different properties, uh, for instance. And we could ask, what is instance one? Um, or is instance one a duck, or is it but compare what, what are the, the answers? Is um, let's simply com compare what it will give. It, it will give us different answers. So, hmm, how does this look? I think I'm already too far. Um, let's try this again. So we had this for inputs. So uh, there's a way to, to to make the silence level higher, so that it uh, essentially does not show us ever, every inference because we are only interested in the answers it makes. So okay, it worked. 
So it knows that instance one is a duck. So in principle, it can also be used for classification, like uh, problems where like instances have different properties and based on the on which prop, which uh, category has the highest match overlap with the with the properties of the instance is most likely the category the instance belongs to, for instance. So it can also be used for such kind of uh, kind of uh, question answering experiments. Um, more recently, we have also added a, a natural language interface. Um, maybe I can. Where is it? Um, oh, actually, it's here. Looks good. Let's see. Um, One can also use it in the in the command line. In the command line, it's easier to to combine it with other doors, like with simply piping the output of one door into into the reasoner. And then one can also apply additional things like syntax highlighting for the output. And uh, so this is now NLP interface. It's very simple at current stage, but it makes it easier for beginners to interact with the system. For instance, for instance, we could say Garfield is a cat. Um, just one moment. Um, so we could say something like Garfield is a cat. Oh, here, here we go. Okay. <laughs> or we could say cats are animals. Uh, oh, it was red. Uh, animals. We could ask. Uh, animal. Instance. Uh, should give me an answer here. I'm not sure why. Ah, actually it gave, okay. Garfield is an animal, okay. That's fun. Oh yes, so we also have a preliminary NLP interface and also a preliminary integration with ConceptNet. Maybe I can show this one with owner. Um, Look into so here. Um, so we could, for instance, ask for what what is a car made of? And then the query is concept net essentially, uh, which is like a case where it uses external knowledge base, and it will give us answer the car is made of metal, for instance. Um, but I'm personally not too interested in this kind of interaction with a fixed knowledge base, because this is pretty much what expert systems try to do. And that's not how I see how we learn and how we organize our knowledge. But it's, but it's a way to, to have it, to have a, a richer understanding of the world, a kind of a cheated way to to make it access information about the world it has not directly experienced by itself, so to speak. Um, 
So what is our car made of? We could also ask the same question for a cat, would be interesting. Hmm, cat is made of fur, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> but uh, you get the idea here is, the idea is to use uh, background knowledge base. But of course it's, it can be combined like, like, uh, like uh, if we have some knowledge from concept net like uh, like this this piece of information was coming from concept net and then we can say garfield is a cat which is something we put in and then we could ask is garfield made of fur let's give it some inference that garfield is made of what Garfield is made of fur, which is not something which is in concept net, but something which was derived from the knowledge we gave it and some information it has gotten from concept net. That this is already more interesting to use a, a external knowledge base, not just as a database, but to combine it with own inference results, which it gained from combining the knowledge and applying it to own experience. Um, yes, there are, there are a lot of possibilities <laughs> and uh, that's essentially it. And so you're right on time. Uh -huh. Right on time. Do we have any answer, questions? No, no, no. Okay. Christian, your turn. It'll be just a minute. Oh, I just noticed there are some questions in the chat, I think. Uh, let me see. Yeah, go ahead and answer uh, one or two, then I'll start. Hmm, okay. Let me see. Oh, that there's one, uh, there was some general discussion in there, but also a question uh, whether I have thought about creating multiple NAS instances to run in parallel, focusing on the tasks individually. Um, oh yes, uh, that, that's also possible. We, uh, we were also thinking about using the system for multi-agent scenarios, also in a robotics uh, context. Um, uh, because we are now, now also working more with robots, we were thinking about inspection and maintenance operations where robots essentially collaborate. And, uh, and this is something which, which we did not explore much yet, but in principle, it's possible to use it in a multi-agent scenario.
uh, one more question, uh, uh, question, have you considered rather than these tokens to use a normal planning representation like Murray Shannon's? Um, Murray Shannon's or Eric Mueller's, you know, one of the two, uh, because it is, ours is really good at planning. That's, it's, uh, Mm -hmm. I, I guess the, the issue, I, uh, because I, I also I wanted to create a practical system and then I noticed uh, that there are many very effective planning algorithms clearly in the literature. But what's quite interesting is that, uh, that uh, for instance, um, if, if, the, if one really wants to, to go in the real-time response of the system, then it's not that straightforward anymore because uh, if we if we start a planning algorithm to, to plan for a specific core, what's the dominating criteria? Dominating criteria is usually to find the, the solution to the core. But what if the space is so large that the compute, computational resources do not uh, do not uh, suffice in this case to find the solution? Or maybe the solution is not even there because the knowledge which would lead to it is not there. It's so when when to terminate this process and then of course we can take uh, some some simple solutions like having fixed planning depths and uh, or, or, or ways to, to to limit the amount of parallel options explored in parallel but this resource allocation issue is really at the heart and additionally what, what if the system has found a plan and one moment later the situation has changed entirely how to make sure the system can utilize a reasoning results it has just arrived a moment ago and adjust them to the new situation. So it's still an active uh, problem for which is highly studied in the planning literature. And my, my approach is make planning a process uh, like in any time algorithm sense, which uh, doesn't, doesn't need to have a, 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 a stopping criteria. It's simply something which goes on and is is constrained by the by the size of the of the attention buffer of the system, which is uh, of course uh, for, for many practical applications where you're interested to find to finding a, a complex solution, then this clearly will not work. But it we'll will, but it has other benefits, which is it guaranteed real time response, which is found in animals. Well, secretly, we're trying to actually ask NARS to emerge what a planning system would would do, right? Um, anyway, I mean, it's like by net by. Yeah, that, okay, that, that's actually my the statement I was going to make. And is is in in a way, whatever planning things that we see work in the in the great planner, we actually want to see that happen in NARS. We don't care if it looks like the same planning or anything, but we want effectively that behavior. And so I, uh, where was I going with that? If what the things that we do as far as giving it the environmental input, uh, do, we do, do we do anything in NARS that accidentally makes that a little bit more computationally difficult? That's what I wonder. Like by making the problem a little bit more complex and then expecting stuff to emerge sometimes when oh. there might be a cheat to get there quicker. If those mm -hmm. cheats are not really cheating because we, we're going for a simpler universe for the moment. That's kind of the question. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 yes, uh, to, to some degree it can happen that uh, when one enters some information to us that it will even make it more difficult to find a certain a certain plan or a, a certain a certain way to realize a goal, essentially. And uh, the, the, the question is, of course, uh, it's always a question of how, how many resources can the system invest in a certain amount, in a certain time frame, like what we expect the system to be able to adapt to potential issues which need a very timely response, like a like a, a rock uh, rolling into the direction of the system, or is it stuck in a planning process? It cannot interrupt and gets hit by the rock. And ideally, of course, we, we would want to have this ability to interrupt uh, to, for the system to, to, to be able to learn to avoid the rock. 
at the same time, as you mentioned, we would also want it to, to exhibit this ability to plan more far into the distance and to, 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 to like think more about a certain solution and to, to work out a more complex plan. And I, I think uh, both is actually possible with having this kind of pro planning as a process based approach rather than algorithm where it's stuck to react to new stimuli. Yeah, I think the NARS approach is superior, you know, in, in this kind of like example that we set up. Um, but one thing we don't, I, sometimes I wonder is if we have made our data, like, you know, we have this uh, AIKR, but have we do, how do we know when we actually should have had sufficient resources, but our knowledge representation was just too crazy and it had to, too many steps to get to the same thing that we could have represented in a smaller way. What I mean is like we could actually accidentally set up our sensory system to make this thing work harder than, than maybe something than it should have. Mm -hmm. uh, so to tell the difference between where we flooded it in a way with, with the wrong uh, representation. We just never know that. I mean, we can't know. <laughs> but it would be nice to evaluate the difference, you know. Mm -hmm. I fully agree. This is tricky because it's, uh, I think there is no general solution, but but I think there will be certain, uh, certain things to look for, uh, or at least, uh, uh, how to say, it's, it's heavily underexplored because this way of performing planning is so different to, to what is largely studied in the literature. And so uh, I think if, if more focus would be put on this kind of real-time real -time operation ability and more planning as a process, besides other inference activity happening at the same time, then, then I think, uh, how to say? <laughs> It, it will be it will become more useful for certain pr practical purposes and uh, once once the limitations are better understood and l like knowing how, how does the size of the attention buffer affect the planning performance for instance for certain kind of problems that's still heavily underexplored because it's it's such a different approach definitely you know, you mentioned predictive coding for a second. Um, a lot of times, predictive coding, their entire task is to try. Oh, is Sorry, to try gonna, to. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm um, going to give my presentation, and then we'll have a uh, a discussion afterward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you, and I'll start. <laughs> Excuse me. And of course, it gave me the presenter view, but I don't really want that. <clears throat> okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna make this quick, because uh, I know it's been a pretty long day. Uh, my name is Christian Hom. I'm a second year PhD student under pay. And today I'm gonna be presenting NARS Python. Uh, there was a cool animation to go with this, but I guess, the um, presentation is completely unresponsive. So, um, this is called NARS Python. Um, it is an open source NARS project. Uh, it's not called open NARS Python because it's, it is my personal NARS system. Um, so I'm constantly pushing changes that break everything. Um, and so it's probably not very uh, stable or um, not a very mature system yet, um, but maybe in the future um, we could change the naming. And you're probably wondering, oh, uh, I just saw a couple of NAR systems. Do we really need another one? Um, the answer is uh, sure, because uh, I think it's probably useful. I think Patrick actually showed this with his um, PhD dissertation to um, explore different architectures and control mechanisms um, for NAR systems and not to... Um, just stick to one one methodology and um, then we can sort of um, explore um, different future NARS architectures um, and controls um, in parallel. 
Uh, so just a quick rundown. This project was started one year ago uh, after I read um, Happy Birthday, because it is October now. Um, it's programmed in Python for uh, readability and conciseness. Um, that means compared to the other languages, it's uh, poor um, uh, performance in relative speed and space efficiency, um, but it hasn't actually been our, uh, a pragmatic issue uh, thus far. And this project was very inspired by um, Dr. Wang's Now book, which I read over the summer. Um, it's a fantastic book and I highly recommend you read it. Um, so um, the, the beginning development of that is um, primarily based on this book. Um, but then as I became a part of the team and learned more about OpenNARS and ONA, um, I, uh, I started taking more inspiration from those, those systems. And currently the system implements the basic elements of now one to eight, except variables. Um, and it does lack some critical features. It's certainly not a mature system uh, and not something you'd want to use in a real application at the moment, but uh, it does lack procedure learning uh, variables and uh, some inference rules. It comes with a GUI for um, visualizing your NARS and analyzing. Uh, the latest release was back in June. This was four months ago, uh, version 0 0.3. You can see this on the website. There's a report. Um, the next version is coming out soon. Uh, this is what I'm working on right now. Um, and it'll be coming with improvements in goal-driven autonomy. And if you are interested in this, you can see my AGI 21 um, presentation, which will either be on Sunday or Monday. Uh, the Python code contains very modular NARS building blocks written in basically written as Python libraries. Um, so we have you know, separate libraries for uh, NARS's grammar, separate library for all the inference rules, a separate library for all the data structures, et cetera. And it only, it's only all brought together with a very simple control mechanism. So I encourage anybody who's interested uh, in this to clone the repo. It's on uh, GitHub. And uh, you can find the link on the title slide. Um, and experiment with building your own control mechanisms and uh, architectures. So this is the um, current system architecture. Um, there's four components to it. There's a temporal module. This is where events flow to. Um, and we'll have, I'll show this a little bit in detail later. Uh, and then a global buffer, a, a memory, and an inference engine. So um, pretty standard NARS components. Um, won't go too deeply into um, all the specific data structures because we, um, Patrick and Peter uh, covered them pretty well. Um, but one important difference here is, so we do have belief tables in every concept, a desire table. Uh, the belief holds beliefs, desires holds desires. Um, and then you have predictions. So implication links uh, that point to other concepts or explanations, other concepts that um, imply this concept and then also term links. And importantly, these um, are bags, which means that we can probabilistically select from them as opposed to um, just peaking the, the highest confidence. And here's another view of uh, NARS memory. Yeah, it's basically the same thing here, except instead of um, the view of one concept, we're pulled out a little bit and we're viewing the entire NARS memory. So here are these blue things are the term links, they're bi-directional links. And then the prediction and uh, explanation links are uh, one direction only. And you'll see here that the prediction links, for example, um, from here uh, does not actually point to the post condition of the implication, but it actually points to the, the concept of the implication uh, statement itself. So there's two ways to interact with the system. There's the GUI and the shell. So just like Java's JSwing, which some of you may have heard of, you can make simple GUI in Python using something called tkinter. Um, and so you can launch NARS Python either as a shell. This is just a configuration, uh, configurable variable. Uh, and you use the shell to interface with different applications. So if you have like a simulated environment or a GUI, and this is for debugging and visualization. And over here we have the IO GUI for version 0 0.3. Um, the GUI in NARS Python is kind of special because we have both this IO and also um, a detailed internal data GUI. And just like the name suggests, it's very useful for debugging the internal contents of the system. So it shows the contents of every data structure, which means the, the buffers in the memory. And then you can interact with the GUI and just click on either the task or the concept or the sentence, whatever it is that you want to look more closely into. 
and you can click and it will uh, open another window for you. So here's a small animation of this. Here we're clicking on the concept for, for Raven is Bird. And we'll open this up and you'll see it has the concept name, statement term has expectation for the top uh, judgment and if it's positive and then the actual beliefs in the beliefs table and all the other data structures that you saw earlier. And then if you want, you can click on a belief or a desire, whatever term link, and then it'll open another window. And this, this, can, um, this is infinitely recursive. So this sentence has uh, evidential base. You can click to dig into that sentence and so on. At least until you run out of sentences. Um, one really interesting and experimental um, feature of the system is the visual inputs. So something I'm really interested in is um, NARD's visual perception, um, doing that natively. And so to help kind of, you know, kickstart research into this, um, I implemented um, a way to, to accept visual images as inputs into NARS Python. And you can read um, Dr. Wang and Patrick's paper on perception in uh, AGI systems. I think that was, that was published in AGI 18 um, to learn a little bit more about that because uh, it uses the same technique. So basically what happens here is each pixel of the image is converted into a Narcisse event. Um, and we, I, I just call this atomic sensation. And then the spatial layout of the sensations are, you keep track of them in a NARS array. Um, it's not really explicit, it's more implicitly tracked within this, this array data object. Um, so here uh, is an image that we might want uh, NARS to see. This is in a simulated environment. It's just a blue cube and a little torch. Um, and so if you paste the, the raw pixel data into here, uh, the system will accept it as, as an array. which you can dig into. And on the left here, you'll see all the atomic sensations and their, um, their spatial position. And um, as well as the um, uh, visualization of, of the image. And you can interact with this image in various ways, scroll on and out, um, visualize confidence of the individual um, sensations and so on. Um, so a working cycle, um, but it's sort of a hybrid. Uh, you, you could argue the system is sort of a hybrid between ONA and OpenNARS. Um, it processes tasks and concepts during the working cycle. And the cycles are, are just used for internal timing. Um, so cycle one happens, cycle two, and so on. And then in a NARS processing phase, um, in NARS Python, the system takes one of two actions, which is either to observe a task from the buffer. And when this happens, the task is consumed from the buffer, so it disappears. Um, essentially what the system wants to do is try and clear the buffer. And um, it does a sentence initial processing, which very simply is just taking the content of the sentence in the task and inserting it into the concept and nothing more, um, except perhaps raising the concept's priority. And, uh, or instead of observing a task, it can probabilistically select to consider a concept. And when it does this, it, it selects the concept from the bag, um, just like in a standard NARS, and um, it selects a, uh, either a goal or a, a belief or both, and it does the sentence continue processing. So if you don't know, there are two processing phases for sentences in NARS, there's the initial and the continued. And the initial, um, in my opinion, is um, should be pretty fast, and then the continued um, can take a little bit more time. And the probability ratio of how often NARS observes versus considers and does these two actions is determined by a system parameter called M, or it stands for mindfulness. And this, mechan this mechanism is not like set in stone. It might change in future versions because I've noticed things um, that, for example, it's better to constantly observe tasks from the buffer until it's clear and then begin considering concepts and so on. Um, but this is just how it works right now. So for version 0 0.3, um, I did find a lot of issues. So version 0 0.3 was, um, basically had all the things I wanted, all the basic NARS features I wanted to implement up to goals. Um, and, and then I started um, evaluating the system on a real-time application, and in this case, it's just Pong. And, um, and the system was not able to play even if it was taught directly some, some good background knowledge. And so I dug into the system and identified some issues with version 0 0.3, the first being buffer flooding, which was that uh, in real-time applications, you're sending 
um, set basically sensory events to the system. And if the system is not consuming these events fast enough, uh, if it's not consuming the events faster than they're flowing in, then you'll get this phenomenon called buffer flooding, which is where your buffer just completely fills up with events. And then you could lose some very um, useful information, like when the system um, infers a new piece of information and that goes into the buffer, yet it's being flooded with events, you might lose um, that, that inference. So you don't want that. Um, it also only did very simple temporal inference. Um, didn't create any compound events, no special regard for operations. It's just it's a simple implication. If A, then B. And it was doing too much conditional inference and unrestricted inference. And so what this means was that in a real-time application, the system was deriving more and more syntactically complex um, sentences or statements um, or doing inference that was not necessarily useful for the task at hand. And so this is sort of a, a special purpose um, application. This is Pong. Um, and so the, these really complex compounds were taking up valuable system resources. Um, so for now they're taken out, but they'll, they'll probably be re-added later um, when it's actually necessary. And then finally, um, another interesting topic is variable working cycle duration. So because the working cycle um, in version 0 0.3 was not enforced to be constant, and I don't mean constant time when you talk about like computational complexity, I mean constant as in it takes 50 milliseconds this time, it takes 50 milliseconds the next time and so on. Um, these working cycles were not constant, they were only bounded. And so they tended to vary a lot. So some working cycles would take zero milliseconds, some would take up to 24, um, especially um, when my data structures were poorly programmed. And this caused um, the events that the system was getting to de decay unpredictably. So if you don't know when a NAR system <clears throat> that receives an event, the confidence of the event can decay over time. So you might get something <clears throat> like in Pong, the ball is, to, is in the center of the paddle. And you want this event actually to decay very, very quickly, probably within uh, like less than half of a second because that ball is moving around. And once it's not in the center anymore, you don't want the system thinking it's still in the center. So events um, should decay probably very quickly, but when the working cycle duration is variable, the events will decay unpredictably. So in some cases, They'll, they'll decay after the same amount of working cycles, but they'll decay in a different amount of real world time, which is bad for real applications. So here's an attempt if, um, of a version 0 0.3 Pong attempt with background knowledge. It was a fail. Uh, the system basically just wasn't responding to the environment because the buffers were uh, completely flooded. And by the time the events were even put into the system, they were already completely decayed. So here I can't even I can't even begin to try to analyze um, what the system is doing because I, I think it, the buffers were just completely flooded. Um, so in version 0 0.3, there were a couple of temporal chaining updates. So or in version 0 0.4, in version 0 0.3, um, the there is a temporal buffer which buffers two events only and then creates a simple implication. I think I, I touched on this. And then after that, it flushes the buffer. So the implication comes out with the atomic events, A and B, and also no compound events um, were being created. But, and so that's on the left here. You can see um, it creates E0 to E1 and then E2 to E3. So it's only creating two implication statements and then four atomic events. Whereas now in 0 0.4, um, we're doing something a little bit better, which is that every time an event enters, the, the temporal module, it'll do temporal chaining um, for all the other events up to the final event. So here, when event three enters the buffer, it'll create E0 leads to E3, E1 leads to E3, E2 leads to E3, and so on, as well as um, some more useful compound events. So um, I think the other pre presentations talked about this, which is um, like a conditional event A with an operation event op leads to a post-condition event B. And, and this is very useful in real-time applications because um, pairing conditions with operations is useful. Uh, so here's just a, an example workflow of how temporal chaining works now um, and the working cycle. So the system receives an event zero through its sensory input channel, which is converted into NARS tasks. This enters a temporal module and it's recorded for temporal reasoning, but then it flows immediately into the global buffer so that NARS can immediately try to pick it up. Then another event comes, we'll call this event one. 
same thing happens. But now when this event enters the temporal module, and temporal chaining occurs. And so uh, we create this implication here and we throw them both into the buffer. Then during a given working cycle, the system will either observe from the buffer or consider from the memory. And so here we'll say it observes and integrates this sentence, this is a judgment here directly into the memory. And then when it considers this same judgment later, it will find a semantically related concept. So for example, let's say E1 led to E2, and then runs both of these sentences through the inference engine where the results are put into the global buffer. So pretty standard. Uh, a couple of other new updates, uh, new for me, not new for anyone else since no one's heard of this. Um, in each working cycle, observe a set number of tasks from the buffer or consider a concept. This was in version 0 0.3. Um, the concept priority increases when you do initial processing. So every time there's a new task, we increase the priority and then decays on continued processing. And we selected only the most confident explanation for goals. But now in 0 0.4, um, importantly, probably the most important thing is enforcing the constant working cycle um, because this standardizes the event decay as well as intervals. So if you're trying to time your operation, um, you also need working cycles to be constant with each other. And the system will try to process as many tasks and concepts as possible as it can within a single working cycle before time runs out, then it'll move on to the next working cycle. Um, I don't know if that's a good idea, but that's just how, how it is right now. And we'll see how that works. Um, version 0.4 also has anticipations, which I think everyone knows about, just um, creating negative evidence whenever there's a failed prediction. And instead of selecting the most confident explanation, the system, when it processes a goal, um, just uses the standard bag selection. So it'll select any, um, potentially any explanation out of the bag for the goal, although one uh, explanations that are have a higher expectation will be more likely to be selected. So that's how they're weighted is by their, um, not their confidence, like it says here, but by their expectation. And so um, this, when it does this, the system might derive a lot of compound goals. So like A and B leads to C. Well, I want C, so I want A and B, and I want A and D, and I want A and E. They'll get many of these compound goals, um, and it'll simplify these um, whenever an event is received using abduction. And sort of experimental, I'm still um, trying this out, is um, to make concept priority and top-down selections more goal-driven. Um, so maybe to base priority based on um, desire value uh, more strongly and um, things like that, just to make the system um, more goal-driven and focusing on, on goal-driven actions. So this compound goal handling and explanation selection mechanism plus the constant working cycle leads to actual responsive real-time interaction in Pong. Uh, now, again, I want to note that the, the system is not very mature. So this, this behavior is not taught. It doesn't, uh, or is, it's not learned. It doesn't learn these procedural hypotheses by itself. So it's taught by me, but it uh, can execute them properly. Here on the right, you'll see um, the specific parameters for um, this NARS run. But you'll see here that, uh, or maybe you won't. You'll see here that the when I teach the, the system how to play Pong, aka when the ball's to the right, move right, when the ball's left, go left, it actually does it now uh, in a timely fashion because events are decaying properly and it's um, it's it's deriving many, many potential explanations um, for how to uh, get the to touch the ball. And when the event comes, um, it's able to properly um, simplify uh, the compound goal that will lead to, to this operation. So you're gonna notice the, the um, little Pong guy here is, is actually missing some of the balls. Um, that's actually just due to the limitation of its sensor. You'll see it has three sensors here, left, middle, and right. <clears throat> and so um, here when it misses the ball, it's, it's usually because the ball um, just was too low um, for, the, for the paddle to respond properly. But if you look over time, um, the paddle pretty consistently hits the ball uh, over and over and over. And that's the end. So I think now we can open the question, answer, and NARS discussion. Where do they get more? Oh, thanks. No, I put it down here. For sure. I can put it down.
Yeah, let's see. Yeah, I think I think this is um, the fact that you can write it out into the system means that you oh, yeah. At least, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fact that you can write it out by hand, I won't repeat what I type, but is shows that um, you know what things need to look like. So you know what you if you could make something evolve to that, I mean, like NARS its way into that, then you know you're all set. Uh, I don't not not every system has that uh, or non NARS. Anyway, that's all I was going to say. Not, some people might consider a Pong example to be really. Uh, very simple like why would you evaluate ai on, on pong um <clears throat> but again i think it kind of goes along with the the sensory motor learning that that patrick was talking about which is actually probably very important for for real-time systems and it's a very simple example we basically have three events ball left center or right we have three operations move left stay in the center or move right um so you have a very very restricted environment um uh, and things that can happen and so it's a really useful uh, testing environment for sure. Mm -hmm. What's the goal with that environment? Oh, sure. Um, so in Pong, uh, it has one goal, which is to be good, uh, which is a little abstract, but uh, none of the words uh, when you name terms in NARS really mean, um, mean anything. And so when we say self is good, it's just going to base it on other relations. So when I say when the ball is left and then you move left, you will be good then it can derive, oh, I want the ball to be left and for me to move left. Sorry, what? The main problem here is probably procedural learning. Yeah, yes. Yeah. We have other bricks over there. If you wouldn't that you wouldn't want that to be the goal. If you have other, sorry. Oh, I know you you're talking like, about the brick game. The one that we can break the brakes, like break you, you wouldn't want oh, yeah. the thing to move according to where the ball is because it has to make the trajectory. Yeah, well that would that would be different. So in that case, in that case, I would probably say you know, good is, is like hitting the block, not the, the paddle hitting the ball. So then the system would learn, oh, I receive a good event whenever a block breaks, you know, or something like that. Um, so yeah, it, it is a different game. Can you talk a little bit about that visual input? Yeah. Yeah, what is that? So is the NARS array then, Said it's like a, it, it's not actual entity of its own, or it's just a virtual entity that you know, which is your layer, or is it is, is it analogous to a concept, a term, or like a, a what level is it then in so the I, system, I guess, once you inputted it as an array? As I can tell you what it is in the system. I can't tell you what is actually the right approach. Um, I, I believe you should not have explicit arrays um, in the system. Um, as in, as in, like you take an array and then you do some sort of processing, an image, and do some sort of processing on it. Um, but I do think you have to implicitly represent the spatial layout of of the sensations. So the later when it participates in, like I guess, is it treated as a single entity? Yeah. Yeah. So in this case, for um, even though it's a collection of little things, it's internally as you do inference and you're combining so for so yes for inference i think you want to use the atomic sensation so here it's the pixel level actually i don't know uh, if you want to encode pixels directly um, you might want to encode like the difference between pixels and things like that but that's a separate discussion but you would want to do inference i believe on these atomic sensations these these lowest level um yeah atomic sensations i guess that I, i've never seen that this yet so what is, what is the intention here? Uh, is there some other examples uh, of people doing visual inputs? Um, for, so for vision in ours, we have usually done um, like a plug-in. Yeah, yeah. another deep learning thing, processing this, and then you convert the output. 
Mm -hmm. So you're trying to. So uh, yeah. So here we're trying to do a different approach, which is uh, native NARS perception, which is basically okay. Here's all the pixels. You know, figure it out. Which um, there's not really a straightforward like way to, to do this except for um you know studying human um sensation and perception and uh, experimenting so then uh, if, if you mentioned the human or any other visual system then i guess this image is not static. You know, then you be part of the series right and then you're you're right because you're going to get image after image after image right after. and then you look in the filters and the changes and uh, I guess at that point it made sense that you want to proxy with your pixels, kind of like ML you know, pixel going back to the machine learning and intuition that each one is then proxying and then looking at certain pieces like the luminosity or whatever. Something like that. That, 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 <laughs> that measures the amount of light and then color and then edge detection. Is, is that kind of the idea that, that you're thinking that it will learn by giving it inputs like this, it can then figure out things that we just yeah so i think it, i think it really depends on the inputs that you have to give it uh inputs that are useful so uh, like like here it says the pixels are encoded um that, i don't think it's actually very useful either the human eye does pick up what you can consider pixels in each photoreceptor you know it's red green or blue which is you know very close to what a, what a computer has but then what the human eye does is actually it does uh, edge detection um, and so it, can, it basically finds little tiny edges across your entire visual field and then brings those together. Um, so I think the input that you're giving it actually does need some sort of pre-computation or some sort of pre-processing, but then you can just let an arsenal go to those. Is that what the case that you would have to describe the internal data in ours itself, the kind of the layers of the network? When you wouldn't find your network, you wouldn't have find like finding zero in large statements, I guess, right? So that you could that or what, what we were talking about planning, but right, it's a process it, instead of defining that or so you know, define the process and allow it to learn somehow, right? But, but I, I don't know, that seems like a very ambitious role to have it just look at raw input and then derive some meaning because it seems like, yeah, human. Our biology has some layers pre processing that information before it reaches the. I think, yes, I think it does, yeah. Yes. But the problem is, where do you draw that line between pre processing the image and then, you know, your actual perception? Um, so, so, like, you, you know, you're, you're dealing with it already gives you, like, this is a car and this is a bounding box. You want to move it, like, move the gates a little bit lower. It's mm -hmm. like, okay. Well, let's say detect the edges and uh, where something. I'll figure out if it's a car or not. Yes. Based on. And I, and I think I think giving it something like this is a blue car to the right. I think that's perfectly valid. The, those become your atomic sensations, though, and it's it's kind of hard to build any anything higher from that. Um, whereas if you start with something very very simple, like there's an edge on the top left of your visual field over here, and you have like millions of them. Then maybe you can start productively building something. Or, or um, maybe maybe it would make sense to start at a bit higher level, like uh, instead of simply having uh, this is a cat, this is a dog, like ha having at least some semantic uh, information extracted. Could even be using convolutional neural nets to, to extract certain semantic information, which NAS can then utilize in order to to build uh, build categories using compos compositional structure are you saying combine them for learning oh yes well or like uh, to combine uh, semantic information to build categories out of uh, of a combination of various uh, attributes so to speak which would be extracted instead of <laughs> instead of simply giving a label to the to the object so having the pixels, you require yourself to have at least seven pixels would be required to be a single NARS token object in a way. Um, I, I guess, I'm sorry, I was still on vision. Okay, sorry. So what, what is the NARS array? Is that uh, two-dimensional structure? Is that <laughs> an influence on that or? Well, uh, like I said, I want to say this is very experimental stuff. Um, we haven't even really um, done too much on our own team with this. Um, this is just sort of the initial conceptualization. But um, 
well, what we're thinking is the, the array is sort of just a way to implicitly store um, the spatial structure of, of the sensations. And, and you don't actually probably do reasoning with the array. It's just a useful way to store them. Um, although you want to take into account you know, their spatial position somehow. Um, so I don't think you do processing on the array, but you can maybe take the sensations out of specific parts of the array um, and things like like compare things uh, edges that are close to each other to make inferences like uh, there's Does a bigger one. Be used in the demo in the day? No, but uh, wait, so repeat it. If that array structure is not currently used. Oh yes, it is. It's in. Okay. Oh. It is. Um, it, it's essentially um, it's a special kind of sentence, Narcissus sentence. Um, that stores other narcissist sentences. <clears throat> Solving that problem with without it, if they were just isolated pixels, yes, would be a lot harder. I, I think so. Yeah. <clears throat> You want to change as you go how you access that array anyway right now. So by keeping the array around, you can decide how you're going to consume it differently in different way at different times. Yeah, you definitely need the spatial information that that's absolutely certain. Uh, how it's actually encoded and used is a different question. Yeah, I, I think like as you're going, you want to change how you're how you're using it, you know, what parts you're looking at, how, at what size fragments you're looking at and so forth, um, probably. Yeah, and then he, uh, he made another good point, one of the audience members, which was um, that you're receiving frames, frame after frame after frame after frame, and basically the, the one that happened a second ago, um, I mean, it's not completely useless, but, you know, over in a couple of seconds, it's just, it's not as relevant anymore. Um, and so there's a question of how, how would you handle uh, all these things. This is sort of getting off the topic of, uh, of the Python, but actually we can have a, a general discussion. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to doing inference on the atomic sensations, it, it might be something um, similar to like what we see with the Gestalt rules of psychology, uh, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which is like when, when two lines are like, you know, straight and together that they, they tend to continue like um, rule of good continuity or rule of similarity, things that look similar are probably part of the same group and so on. Um, and, and those might be able to be seen as um, as uh, infer inference conclusions, uh, as well as um, when making categorizations. Uh, I wonder how you handle anticipation because this is something where <laughs> where I needed a lot of time to get it right, and it would be interesting to to hear what your approach is, uh, like anticipation deadline. If if it predicts if it predicts a stimuli to happen, but the stimuli does not happen, how, how, how do you how do you deal with like a difference in, in in timing? Like the stimuli appears. 10 milliseconds later than it was expected, but the pr prediction is still not completely off. It's uh, how, how do you deal with this kind of timing variations, which uh, appear naturally? Easy, I don't. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, it, it does, it does um, basically wait for the working cycle and then check, and then if it's not, or you know, the, the interval and then check, and then give, it, if it's not there, it fails, but you, you brought up the issue with that. Um, which is that well, it might occur a little bit earlier and, and things like that. So maybe you could maybe you could check like up to and through the interval um, and things like that. I guess it really depends on what an interval is supposed to represent. Does it represent like an exact amount of time? Does it represent like the, the maximum amount of time you want to wait or the minimum? Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think I have the solution. I will. Uh, we can discuss it. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe well, not now because it's <laughs> a lot of data to. to which goes under. Well, not everything has to decay. Some things can be consumed, you know, from, I mean, some things are used at the time that the rule can, you can buffer an event and wait for a rule to snatch it out of there. I mean, I'm, I guess the difference is forward and backwards. I mean, ours is going in one direction where it's, it's, but I mean, usually it's uh, something, an event happens and then the attention uh, dictates whether or not it'll even see the event, right? Or and the event may decay before an attention system actually consumes it. Is that 
true. Mm -hmm. That this can happen. It can happen that uh, like a certain input stimuli is uh, is uh, is ignored because maybe there's just uh, some more important information currently. Like, like if it uh, like if it has a uh, receives information for multiple modalities, say like uh, it receives a sound and like a uh, certain visual patterns. It can happen that, for instance, for some reason, it thinks the the the, the auditory uh, information currently is more important, and in this case, it might miss the opportunity to look at the visual one. Uh, for, for instance, it, it really depends on the sensory motor contingencies. Like, like if the if the system has learned that that uh, a certain type of sound leads to to food, <laughs> but uh, to a full battery or, or such a that, that, that such a uh, kind of relationship, then it makes sense if if currently the cores are if currently the battery is low, and it would make sense if it then spends more resources on the stimuli than something which is unrelated to whether it can make its battery for or not. Mm -hmm. I have a general question. <clears throat> um, so currently, um, the, the the system wouldn't be active if it's not receiving any inputs. The way it's set up, would it be constantly trying to, um, you know, do zero shot learning essentially, you know, create new knowledge? Is, is that the way it works? And it's it's actually always busy. Or and if it is. Does it eventually top out, or what, what actually happens if you just let it run for, you know, a few days without input? Anyone wants to Peter, you want to take it? Anyone done? Anyone done that? <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. I, I guess it also depends on the implementation. Like, uh, like openness for applications is uh, acts more like. Uh, toilet flush <laughs> in the sense that uh, uh, when it does not receive stimuli for, for a longer time it will it will gradually the, the attention buffer will gradually the items in it decay in priority and uh, so uh, while, while in openness it's really like the way you said it's keeping itself busy and <laughs> and continuing to, is continuing to derive new information so uh, um, uh, uh, uh -huh. so, so, so it's a bit implementation specific uh, uh, as well, or uh, also because in open as for applications, I wanted to make sure that when it receives new stimuli, it will be prepared for it uh, in a sense that uh, it could, <laughs> how to say, in open as it can be that the system reasons about something and then it begins to ignore new inputs and this is something which I did not want to have in the open as for applications implementation. So I went for a simpler attention model there where, where events would certainly decay over or more strongly decay. Let's put it this way. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've always dreamt of having uh, my system, you know, learn and think if I just let it run and actually, you know, learn more stuff. Either whether it's external or internal, and internally it could be generalizing and simplifying things. I mean, it could be you know abstracting things that can be represented more generally or more compactly or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, also, when you would get to a point where diminishing returns or where you know can't optimize it anymore. But I was just wondering if you know you you normally run it this way, or if you have any experience um, with with that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually possible with, with uh, what Pat said with the when it's trying to predict the sensory input. I mean, we actually this means that we could say it's right. Let's let let's have a buffer where it is literally predicting or trying to replay exactly what it would have predicted the environment would be doing if there is a notion of trying to predict what the environment is doing and then re reacting to the environment. It wouldn't have any uh, feedback that would from the environment, because there is no environment, we just simulated memory, but um, I wonder you know, if, if it would actually tune or get anything better by doing that. 
uh, trying to replay the predictions that it assumed the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, uh. Ultimately, an AGI system would should do exactly that. It mm -hmm. should, whether it's dreaming or replaying something, it didn't have enough time to think through properly. And it would then, when it has time, replay that scenario and have more time to think it through mm -hmm. and have some useful conclusions. Yeah, of course. Wasn't that the argument that someone made earlier about self reflection? Mm -hmm. Like the, the session before, where you had that session. Mm -hmm. Oh, there was a really good session about uh, self reflection as necessary for learning. And it was kind of like looking to how it arrives at an explanation and it would make a conclusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in this regard, openness is, is uh, better than openness for applications because uh, first the attention mechanism is not as strict, so it uh, can really keep uh, reasoning about information in the way we just talked about. And, uh, and uh, it also has reflection abilities, which OpenNAS for applications does not have. It has something called mental operators, uh, which allow, allows it to essentially uh, treat, uh, how to say it, to treat the reasoning process itself as a sensory motor thing, in, in a sense, that we, that we can steer our thoughts into a certain direction. And so you could run that that log of what it did during those real interactions, you could replay that log into NARS then. Mm -hmm. It's similar. It's like watching your, your own inference process and maybe even influencing, changing the, the, the direction it's going. And this is something OpenNAS can do, but owner cannot do it. And the reason why I have excluded this capabilities in, in the OpenNAS for applications version is, that it's just not that mature yet, because uh, if it should be used for applications, then relying on a reflection mechanism, which sometimes might catastrophically fail, is maybe not a good idea, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, we... yeah and there are a couple of things I want to add. One is to address Peter's previous uh, comment about the reflection mechanism. Uh, actually, in the current architecture, we are going to uh, try to dynamically uh, allocate the system's resource between its uh, observation activity and its thinking activity. It's kind of like allocate how much time you want to spend uh, on the new input and how much time you want to spend on your old problem. Sometimes you're going to just ignore what is happening in the environment and uh, focus on your thinking. Uh, any fixed uh, allocation, I think, is bad. So it, it clearly, it should be a, a dynamic adjustment. If there's nothing new, nothing urgent, and also you have some important task in your mind, you should focus on thinking. Uh, kind of like the way us, uh, you know, sometimes we just simply ignore our sensory uh, input uh, to a certain degree until you know there is a big noise or something. Very unusual happened then, we are going to uh, turn our attention back uh, to observation. And uh, also we have some new parameter uh, global level uh, evaluation about uh, how the current uh, environment is now uh, by comparing the observation and the anticipation. If everything I can see, uh, uh, all kind of like beyond my expectation, that means I mean a new environment or the environment have been changing a lot. So it better spend more time to see what is going on. Uh, if everything is boring, you know, it's an old business, <clears throat> I better think about what I have in mind. And we haven't tried what Peter uh, mentioned, you know, that is what if we just, uh, no input at all and uh, just continue to run the system. But my guess is at the very beginning, it will be uh, like uh, what Patrick said. Uh, we, we, we had the item for, for a short period of time. Uh, the system will still continue to work on its uh, own uh, task. And actually, it may get become more active in a certain moment. For example, we happen to run into a solution for a long 
perm a talk and then we will be excited and begin to think about what that means. Uh, but uh, for a long time, really long time, I, I don't think that system will keep its mental health uh, just like a human being, right? If you put anyone in a black room for a long time, uh, our mind uh, it, it was not designed for that. I, also, I don't think uh, uh, API will, will work well. But for a certain period of time, it should be fine. And actually, we, we talked about before whether we should have some form of, of sleeping uh, or dreaming, uh, which is related to this. But uh, I don't want to go uh, too far into this. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, clearly uh, something. Uh, so it uh, needs to be further explored. Yeah, it depends on what the purpose of, of dreaming is in humans. Yeah, yeah, that will be a, a long discussion. But another first uh, comment is for uh, what uh, Christian just uh, talked about, uh, this matrix or uh, a real representation of, of image. Uh, according to our current plan, this is just for the raw data. Okay, uh, after uh, initial processing, the internal representation of racial, uh, uh, whatever Python, whatever you call it, it will not be, will not be a matrix. It will be just like uh, some kind of uh, compound structure where uh, what make our plan different uh, is we are going to handle this in the same way as Patrick talked about uh, uh, sensory motor uh, contingency. So it's going to, we are going to take action uh, into the representation of visual image. So basically, we are going to represent a complicated picture. Uh, it's kind of like a scanning path. Uh, if I see this, then I move my eye in that direction, I'm going to see that, that kind of thing. Uh, we use that to represent a uh, complicated pattern. But uh, we are at the very early stage, so we cannot really talk about anything that's meaningful or with concrete action. Any other questions? Is Peter there? Are we uh, toward the end of the, the general discussion already? Uh, what's the what's the plan? I think. I mean, I think the workshop will be over. We just wanted a discussion. So uh, I don't see too many people here in the Zoom and the YouTube participating. Yet. How many are there in the Zoom? Six people. Seven people. Ten. So we are welcome to continue the discussion like for another half hour, but otherwise we are, we are done. I cannot hear you clearly this <laughs> this much. But anyway, it's your decision based on uh, the situation over there. It's uh, your decision whether you uh, we should stop this and uh, leave the discussion for the future email or other opportunities. Or you, you guys will still be there, right? So, so you two can continue to talk with the others. I think the discussion is not moving to the bar, right? <laughs> right. So we, we, we can stop. Okay. okay. Is, is the midnight there, right? Already? Yeah, uh, yes, uh, it's half past two. <laughs> you got a bit now. I didn't see, I didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's time to sleep for me, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> good, good, good to see you. Uh, hope to see you in person. Good to see you as well. I hope next yeah. time I can make it in good person. Good to see you in person, Peter. Next time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.